Hey everyone. Welcome back to the fifth and final part of Small Changes. As always, huge thanks to all of my patrons. I really couldn't make any of these videos without you guys. Anyways, everyone, enjoy the video. Chapter 42, Official Combat. Naruto woke to a small stream of bubbles gently filtering past his face. It only took him a moment to realize he was underwater before he quickly oriented himself and kicked out with his legs to reach the surface. It was times like these he wished he could figure out how to make the Horishin work underwater. He surfaced easily and dragged himself up on top of the water with a slight grumble of annoyance. He hated being wet, it weighed him down and made his hair cling to his face. From there it only took him a second to regain his bearings and take stock of the situation. The sand bee was exactly where he remembered it being, still enclosed by the incomplete web of the ceiling matrix. That meant his Anbu weren't dead, good. Mei was exchanging pre-fight banter with an Akatsuki member, the cloak was a bit of a giveaway. That was fine, the Mizukage could handle herself so there was no need for the damsel in distress antics. The problem was that Akatsuki always worked in Pa. Yep, there was the other one. He almost missed him, thanks to the glare of the sun masking his silhouette. The long blonde hair was notable, but a quick flick through his internal bingo book couldn't put a face to a name. He was likely a recent nuke nin then. The other option was that he was too weak to have been memorable and that seemed unlikely when he was wearing those red clouds. A quick survey of the potential battlefield had Naruto feeling uneasy, this guy either had a summons that let him fly, or a technique that did the same. They were quite far off the coast by now, as had been the plan to slowly lure the Sanbi that way to prevent further destruction. It wasn't like he could place Horishin seals on water, although that was something to think about for the future, as his kunai would be next to useless at the bottom of the sea. That left the Baijuu itself as the only reliable source of stable terrain. Not exactly a comforting thought. He cracked his neck and stood a little straighter, all of these thoughts having passed through his head in a few seconds. The beginnings of the idea that he might have become just a little too reliant on his father's technique crept into the back of his mind before it was trampled down by more pressing concerns. He felt for the kunai still embedded in the sand bee's shell and flashed there, ignoring the shuddering growls of the creature still recovering from his previous attack. He glanced up in time to spot the Akatsuki member suddenly take a dive towards the dog-masked Anbu holding the north position. Instinctively the redhead reached for his tanto only for his hand to close on thin air. With a curse, he realized he must have been separated from it by the explosion. The hard way it was. With aim born through years of rigorous training and refined by two Uchiha teammates he managed to catch the strange white bird right in the underbelly with a kunai. When he appeared in the air next to it, his arm flicked out like a whip to grab a handful of clay? He had been expecting feathers, or maybe skin. The soft, yielding material that he gripped was disconcerting, almost like it would come apart in his hands. He grabbed the kunai instead, nearly pulling it out of the thing, by accident. Ha, huh, Sasori Dana was right, you are made of sterner stuff than I thought. The blonde man was peering over the edge of the bird thing's wing at him, a bemused grin warping his features. That's good to know. Means I can test some of my stronger art, yeah? The man then did one of the most disgusting things Naruto had ever seen, which was saying a lot, by reaching into two pouches on his waist. When he withdrew them it revealed a set of mouths embedded in each of his palms, audibly chewing with grotesque exaggeration. Feel honored Hokage Dana, you're the first cage ever to see my art firsthand. The mouths spat out their wads of clay and with deft movements the man easily molded them into little white hummingbirds. It might have been impressive if the redhead hadn't already seen what those things could do. The name's Datara by the way, you'll want to remember that, yeah? The blonde seemed to rethink his statement as the hummingbirds took to the air. For as long as you have left, anyway. The clay birds immediately zipped towards him with all the speed of their biological counterparts. Acting on instinct alone, Naruto let go of the larger bird. He grabbed his kunai and twisted his body around to send a slash of wind chakra at the first of the mobile bombs. He succeeded in cutting it in half, but that only caused it to explode prematurely. The shockwave battered his body mid-air, making him tumble in a less controlled fashion than he might have liked. He could still spot the other one buzzing towards him. He tried to cut it in half as well but they were apparently smarter than that. It began jinking madly to avoid his repeated slashes. Testing just how smart they were, he threw his kunai downwards as hard as possible and sure enough the hummingbird shot after it. That meant they were anticipating his technique instead of just homing it on him. They were either completely autonomous, which was worrying, or more likely, guided by Datara. Bucking expectation, he did in fact vanish in a flash of red, only to reappear atop the larger clay bird behind the man in question. 
he had made sure to place a marker on the thing when he was holding on before. Before the Akatsuki member could even widen his eyes in surprise a tri-pronged kunai was embedded in his throat. Naruto might have been satisfied by this if the man's skin didn't start turning an alarming shade of white. He tried to pull his weapon back only to find it stuck. He abandoned it in favor of diving from the clay construct just as it exploded in a dizzyingly large blast that once again had him tumbling through the air in an uncontrolled spin. Right towards the Sanbi. He sighed internally, wondering how Mei was getting on. Far from the pitched, frantic battle of the Hokage, Mei and Sasori had yet to move from where they had begun their exchange. The Mizukage may have been slightly disadvantaged, surrounded by water where her lava techniques were less than optimal, but far from defenseless. Even now the thin veil of her boil technique was evaporating, taking with it the melted, useless lumps that were once hundreds of poison kunai. The ones that had breached her acidic mist had been so thoroughly scoured that even if she hadn't moved to avoid them, they would have been no more lethal than their medicinal counterparts. An impressive technique for sure, I look forward to working out its intricacies when you lie still on my workshop table, Sasori mused in his gruff tones, shifting slightly beneath his cloak. May hummed thoughtfully. Akasuna no Sasori, yes I'd heard of your grisly little technique with human puppets. Her smirk was devilish. A shame, I had always somewhat admired the Suna puppet corp, for their discipline if not their predilection for playing with dolls. The hunched man failed to rise to the bait, once again shifting beneath his cloak. It made it difficult to determine exactly what he was doing. Both glanced up briefly as a huge explosion tore through the sky, apparently enough of a distraction for Sasori to suddenly launch himself forward at surprising speeds. Mei wasn't one to be taken off guard so lightly though and easily flipped back, actually stepping off the thin silvery blur that whipped out of Saswar's cloak like some metallic snake. She landed elegantly on the water in a slight crouch, moving with all the fluidity of her country's namesake. Teal eyes peered out from a veil of auburn hair at the new weapon, eyeing it wearily. Some kind of prehensile blade that appeared more like the tail of a scorpion given what had been revealed when Sasori tore through his own cloak. Appropriate, in her mind, given his name. The tail was easily dismissed though, no more dangerous than any other weapon, even with the telltale purple sheen of the virulent poison Sasori favored. No, the disturbing revelations were the clearly segmented joints littering Sasori's body. Now now, don't you know it's rude to keep secrets from a lady? She asked demurely, eyes glancing about to try and spot where Sasori might really be hiding. For a puppeteer of his fame, it could be damn near anywhere. The fact that they were this far off the coast narrowed it down somewhat, but even beneath the water was suspect. And it is ruder still to keep one waiting, so I will endeavor to make this quick so I can go mop up that useless new Hokage for my idiot of a partner. I would recommend not underestimating that one, I've already made the same mistake once. Sasori didn't deign to answer that time, which was good because May, despite appearances, wasn't the type to banter in a fight. Banter was a luxury of victory, the civil war had taught that lesson to all of its survivors. She had already concluded that trying to locate a skilled puppeteer was a fool's errand so settled with smashing all of his toys until he revealed himself. It was more in line with her skill set anyway. With a fingertip just beneath her lips she began spitting out large globules of molten lava like bullets. Each was hot enough to visibly warp the air around them, but not nearly fast enough to catch the puppet unawares. Sasori, or at least his puppet, was easily able to dodge to the side and allow the dangerous projectiles to harmlessly land in the water with hissing gusts. It was only when the steam failed to dissipate after a few volleys of the technique that Sasori caught on to what was going on. By then it was too late. May had expertly hidden her slow application of the hidden mist technique amidst the geysers of steam her lava created, quickly shrouding the immediate area in an impenetrable shroud of fog. She was far from a swordsman of the mist in her use of the silent killing techniques, but against an inanimate puppet? She didn't have to be all that quiet. Sasori cleared his surroundings with some kind of compressed air canister attached to one of his arms just in time for May to descend on him with a punishing axe kick that formed a crescent of lava behind it. The first hit was enough to crack the tough carapace of the puppet, the molten rock that followed finished the job. May jumped back to land on the water's surface even as the puppet began to bubble and hiss, wood and metal alike buckling and scorched under the intense heat of the technique. She did not, however, miss the small form that darted out of the wreckage in time to avoid a similar fate. Sasori brushed a few smoldering embers from his shoulder with a surprisingly neutral expression. That was one of my best puppets. May defaulted to her usual smirk at the comment. I'm sorry, I didn't know it was your favorite toy. Sasori's lip didn't so much as twitch. You will have ample opportunity to replace him when all is said and done. Two boys in a row? 
What kind of woman do you take me for? Young man. She hit her astonishment at Sasari's appearance rather well. For a man supposedly in his late forties he had all the trappings of a teen younger than even Naruto. A bubbling sense of irritation rose in her stomach all the same, some people could wish to age even half as well as that. Some people really did win the gene pool. It won't matter soon enough. The banter was somewhat interrupted by the deafening cry of the Sanbi somewhere off to one side before the world turned white. Naruto was getting sick of dodging. He may have been fast, agile and on most occasions highly maneuverable, but those traits lent themselves towards sharp, aggressive fights. Protracted battles of attrition were not his cup of tea. He could certainly manage them, as the Jinchuriki of the Kubia's chakra wasn't running out any time soon, but he didn't enjoy them. His fights were sprints, and right now this one was turning into a marathon. Even on the limited grounds of the Sanbi's shell, he was able to dodge data of various explosive creations. However, the same thing that prevented the Akatsuki member from ensnaring the redhead, also prevented Naruto from cashing him in return, distance. As long as Datara rode around on his latest beast, a clay dragon of all things, he was nigh untouchable. Throwing Hiraishin Kunai at him was an exercise in futility, the dragon simply coughed up smaller versions of itself that swooped in and ate the damn things. Clearly the blonde was trying to goad him into flashing to one anyway, likely to blow him up in the attempt, as the smaller dragons orbited him instead of homing in for the kill. Naruto had already demonstrated he could move fast enough to avoid them if they tried. So for now, the two of them were at somewhat of a deadlock. They might have stayed that way if it were just the two of them. Fortunately, or unfortunately dependent on perspective, there was a rather notable third player. The Sanbi bucked suddenly, lifting Naruto off his feet almost long enough for Daedara to actually catch him with one of his C2 sculptures. It smacked into an enormous scaled tail instead, reduced to putty in an instant and exploding without leaving so much as a scorch mark against the Baiju's near impenetrable carapace. The blast, while ineffectual, was apparently irritating and the response was the beast's tail suddenly arching up over its body like a scorpion's. Daedara nearly fell off his dragon when the first lance of pressurized water cleaved the air next to his head. A few inches to the right and it would be missing entirely. He was forced to drop his creation into a steep dive as the tight beam of water tracked him, aiming to cut him in half. Naruto wasn't faring much better, forced to roll and weave even more madly as two different streams tried to corral him into bifurcation. They didn't so much as dent the Sanbi's shell, but he didn't want to find out what they would do to human flesh. It was an untenable situation. The water didn't look like it was stopping any time soon and eventually Naruto was forced to dive right off the shell and into the surrounding water. It wasn't much better though as he was immediately caught up in the undertow of the beast's enormous body. Before he could be sent tumbling deeper underwater he used a simple water bullet jutsu to launch him in the opposite direction. He pulled himself back onto the surface nearby to one of his onbu, once again irritatingly wet. From there he had a wonderful view of the sanbi turning its full attention on Daedara. He watched at the three deadly streams slowly converged on the man's position, despite his attempts to disrupt them with explosions of various size. Outside of the frantic melee Naruto could appreciate the faint rainbow in the air caused by the showering mist of the streams bursting apart only to tighten again to continue bearing down on the blonde. The Akatsuki member appeared to be growing desperate, especially when the three separate streams converged into one enormous deluge that was likely to leave little of him left if it struck. Finally, he was forced to sacrifice his mount in a titanic explosion that disrupted the Sanbi's technique long enough for him to create a replica of his earlier clay bird, quickly climbing upwards and almost out of earshot. Almost. Naruto could still just about make out his near hysterical screams directed at the glowering beast below. Think you can finish me with such pathetic spirit, yeah? How about you chew on my latest creation? Naruto felt a pit grow in his stomach following the announcement as an odd sort of pressure settled over the battlefield. The sandbee had craned its neck up, its tail stretching almost improbably to point at its mouth where humming balls of pure chakra were beginning to congeal into a larger, darker sphere Naruto only knew of through second-hand accounts. Anbu, brace yourselves. Naruto didn't know just how much of an understatement his declaration was as the hyper-dense sphere of chakra was sent careening up through the air to meet the comparatively tiny sculpture Daedara had dropped. This moment would be the future reminder to the young Hokage not to estimate a jutsu's potency by its size. To describe the meeting of those two techniques as catastrophic wouldn't have done it justice. For a moment, the entire sky was wreathed in a halo of white and all sound seemed to have been sucked from creation. If Naruto hadn't forcibly pulled his eyes down at the last moment he may have been seriously blinded. As it was, that likely stopped him from being so awed by the scale of the explosion that he forgot to move. 
He jumped in front of his Anbu just in time to pull up as large a water wall as he was able just as the first wave of superheated air rushed past them. Even with the chakra pumping through his technique the wall of dense water was threatening to evaporate on the spot. The ocean beneath their feet recoiled sharply as a wave of pressure tried to crush everything beneath it into a crater, only to rush back in the opposite direction in time to meet the wall of pure noise. It took a few seconds for the world to settle itself. Mist rose in sheets as the superheated water was swept away by the pressure wave, replaced by cooler, deeper waters. All Naruto could hear was a tinny whine that he prayed wasn't permanent damage. For one, he'd never hear the end of it from Tsunade. A quick glance told him that, thankfully, the Kirion Bu's training had prevailed and they had the wherewithal to copy him, shielding his own subordinates from the worst of the blast. The San B on the other hand wasn't so lucky. Its shell was visibly glowing from the heat and the fleshy parts of its body were smoking. Right now, it just floated lazily atop the water, unconscious, but Naruto wasn't sure how long that would last. He turned to his nearest Anbu to check on him, finding the man, miraculously, still holding on to the ceiling technique. It looked almost ready. He tried to ask how the man was, but his voice sounded like it had been muffled by several layers of carpet. The Anbu tilted his head at him so he signed the same message. He got a slightly shaky nod, but right now he would take that. He glanced back at the Baijuu, now would be the best time to seal it, but he still didn't know where their Aaron Akatsuki bomber had ended up. Although, he found it unlikely the man had come out of that unscathed. May swiftly dispelled the sphere of water she had hidden within, moisture that might have clung to her clothes and hair included. The explosion had been tremendous, but it seemed all of her Anbu had reacted in time to save themselves and their Konoha counterparts. They had been trained in a crucible after all and knew very well how devastating a Baiju Dama could be. Although, this one seemed a tad more spectacular, than usual. She put that up to the Hokaye's opponent. And speaking of opponents, she eyed the faintly glowing orb of metal that had appeared seemingly out of nowhere to enshroud and protect Sasori. Near the bottom, where it touched the water, she could see it was composed of thousands of metal filings. The same could not be said for the top, that part was melted together into glowing red lump. A moment later it cracked off and sank into the water with a hiss, the still usable metal dust beneath buzzing agitatedly as it dispersed. This time Sasori didn't mask the displeasure in his voice, even if his features remained as neutral as ever. That fool, I warned him not to use anything so extravagant. While he was muttering to himself May took the lull in combat to examine his latest puppet. She didn't recognize the face, but the technique was distinctive enough. I didn't realize I would have the pleasure of making the acquaintance of two foreign cage when I woke up this morning, she called. I'm afraid he's long past the point of political banter, as am I, came the curt response. I'm continually having to clean up that idiot's messes and that's my time wasted. I can't stand having my time wasted. May's eyebrow quirked elegantly at the unwanted insight. Don't we all? She mused sardonically. She wasted no time in flashing through hand seals, once again bringing a hand up as though she were blowing smoke from her fingertips. A deep violet mist spread from her lips in a stream towards the puppeteer and his puppet, although Saucery seemed unconcerned. Your acidic mist is an interesting technique, I grant, but you'll find my puppets are well treated against such degradation. He raised a hand, hidden beneath his voluminous robe, and the third Kazekage lurched forward. A good chunk of the iron particles hanging in the air swarmed around it, forming two wicked blades extending from its forearms. May smirked in a manner that, to any Kiri Shinobi, should have been warning enough. The funny thing about my skilled mist, is that everyone assumes it's simply acidic. She raised a hand and gently clicked her fingers, sending a single spark flickering through the air. The moment it touched the mist, the entire vicinity was engulfed in a roaring blaze that flared white for a few seconds before vanishing as fast as it appeared. There was a loud splash as the Kazekage puppet, unable to protect itself completely, fell uselessly into the water. Sasori had only survived because he had diverted the rest of the iron dust to act as a shield for himself. His cloak hadn't fared quite so well, falling apart in scorched tatters to reveal the monstrosity of his body beneath. May hit her revulsion expertly. I knew it wasn't possible to look so good at your age without having a bit of work done, but that seems a bit much. Sasori ignored the taunt, allowing the prehensile cable coiled in his abdomen unwind as the blade-like propellers on his back unfurled. When I kill you, and transform you into a puppet, you will be the same as me, free from the ravages of age, a perfect marriage of art and immortality. Though you certainly aren't as valuable as the ones you have destroyed, it is a start. I will take immense pleasure in it. During his little speech, 
he missed the increasingly dark look May was giving him as her face slowly lowered, hair falling forward to shadow her eyes. Ravaged by age, imperfect marriage, have no value, can't offer pleasure? I'm going to kill you, she whispered almost soft enough for Sasari to miss. He glanced back at her in confusion only to see her lunging towards him, breathing out a thick crescent of lava. His hand immediately came up, a small tube emerging from his palm. As if emulating the sand bee, a stream of water burst out, immediately cooling the lava down into useless rocks that splashed into the water at his feet. He moved his hand in an almost lazy arc. The palm tube turned as the pressure of the water increased from a thick spray, to a stream thinner than a Rio coin that could cut through solid rock. It split the rushing Mizukage in half with almost negligible ease. Too much ease. Sasori turned, and if his eyes could still widen they would have as he found the cruel gaze of the Mizukage inches from his face. You're clearly inexperienced with women, otherwise you would know better. She leaned forward lightning quick and almost tenderly caught the puppeteer's wooden lips with her own. It soon became obvious that this was no ordinary kiss though as, one by one, glowing orange veins spread across the Akatsuki member's body. He tried to gut her with his poison cable, but she had already danced back, looking on with a quite sort of satisfaction. He grasped his neck, body starting to fail him as more and more of his internal workings were rendered useless by the streams of lava coursing through his body. He was luckier than most, had he still been flesh and blood the technique would have been excruciating. As it was, he only had to contend with the sense of panic as his body was melted away from the inside. In a last-ditch effort, the tiny part of him that was still organic detached from his torso, launching itself in the direction the Kazekage had sunk. It was a desperate attempt though and May caught the pulsing little thing with a disgusted grimace, watching it writhe and paw at her with pathetically weak chakra strings. You should have learned to grow old with some dignity, she said, feeling little sympathy for the monster she held. A final breath of acidic mist put the Suna nuke nin out of his misery and without much care she tossed the bubbling lump into the water. She took a single moment to commemorate an opponent that had put up a decent fight and, under different circumstances, may have seriously given her a run for her money, before turning her attention to more pressing matters. Such as where the young Hokage had gotten himself to. With no direct line of sight on the wayward bomber, Naruto did the next best thing and did the rounds with his Anbu, keeping a wary eye on the unconscious Sanbi all the while. He also made sure to thank the Kiri Shinobi he came across, which apparently was both unprecedented and surprising to them. However, these men and women had put their lives on the line to protect his subordinates, he wasn't going to let something like national borders hold back his gratitude. May and Sasori's battle had moved away before the blast so by the time he reached Komachi she was alone again, still holding up the ceiling matrix with the admirable perseverance that made Konoha such a menace on the battlefield. It was the moment he stepped away from her to more thoroughly search the area that he felt the first tingle of that oh-so-important sixth sense all surviving shinobi gained at some point or another. A sudden dive to the left saved his arm as a hummingbird burst out of the water below him and exploded without warning. It was not alone. He was swarmed an instant, only his prodigious speed keeping him ahead of the legion of small explosions that herded him towards the Baiju's slumbering form. When they tried to surround him, trapping him neatly in a swirling vortex of the buzzing, faux creatures, he flashed to his only Horatian marker on the Sanbi's back. That was a mistake. Daedara had clearly used the redhead's concern over his troops to strategize, realizing that, if cornered, there was only one place Naruto could go. The Daedara that was already lying in wait atop the beast sprang immediately, wrapping Naruto in a bear hug even as his skin began to pale and his form lost consistency. The gloopy clone swiftly locked down Naruto's mobility, congealing until the redhead was completely captive in the clay. It was only then that Daedara revealed himself, hopping down off one of his birds to land in front of the redhead. His hair was singed badly and it looked like one of his arms was broken, but he was still grinning madly. I knew it, not so tough after all. Although, to survive the magnificence of my C3 was impressive, I'll give you that, yeah? His hand was perpetually held in a half-ram seal, a warning that if Naruto tried anything he'd detonate the clay. But look at you, a Hokage at the mercy of my art. This is how things should be. Soon all of the world's leaders will understand, that true art. Is an explosion. He gestured grandly, sweeping his arms wide, crying, Katsu. Only to falter slightly when nothing happened. His eyes grew panicked when Naruto began chuckling. You forgot something about leaders. He strained a moment and managed to break apart the now brittle clay, dusting himself off as he stood back up to full height. They're rarely ever alone. Daedara tried to flee only to find his feet rooted firmly in place, literally. 
When he looked down he saw tree roots growing up from the cracks in the sand bee's shell, securing to the spot. He scowled, free hand reaching into his pack of clay and molding a bird with astonishing speed. However, the moment he let the little thing loose a senbone skewered it right out of the air, still crackling with Raten chakra. A moment later and two swords were crossed against his throat, slowly forcing him down into a kneeling position. He could only glance at the four Anbu that had suddenly appeared with disbelief. But that's. When he strained his eyes over to where one of the operatives had been standing, they were still there. A moment later though and the henge dispelled, revealing a clone of a certain redhead waving at him congenially. Naruto could have had his clones perform the sealing from the start, but they were so much more fragile than Anbu and even one being dispelled by accident could have screwed up the entire process. Once the matrix was set though? The Anbu were more useful in other ways, as he was demonstrating. He strode forward, cutting an impressive figure in his new Hauri, face set into the epitome of the cold leader. When he came to a stop in front of the Iwa Nuk Nin, the man was trembling with poorly suppressed rage. Your art is derivative and uninspired. Datara had only a fraction of a second to look offended before Naruto slugged him, instantly knocking him unconscious. There was a moment of silence before Komachi sighed. Hokage-sama, that was just. Awful. Chapter 43, Official Rounds. After what felt like hours atop the constantly shifting waters, although it was probably closer to about 15 minutes, the small pebbly beach was more than welcome. Naruto didn't even attempt decorum as he flopped down happily on the loose stones. He stared up at the sky for a moment, taking in a long, and in his opinion, well-earned, breath, before bouncing back to his feet. He was by no means revitalized, he still ached from dodging so many explosions at close range, but he felt a little refreshed. Well that was eventful, he mused aloud as May, far more demurely, walked up to him. Both had sent their respective Anbu to help out in the fishing village. A few shinobi could make a startling difference in repairing buildings and helping with injuries, especially when one had Makuten. Tenzo would be grouchy, but he could do the work of weeks in less than an hour. The village would probably be in a better condition than before the attack by the time they left. Quite, May said. I understand you even managed to take yours captive. Naruto waved his hand noncommittally. I'll find out if it was the right call when we get back to the village. It'll be nice to finally put a pin in the Akatsuki though. May chuckled as the two leaders watched the ongoing reconstruction from a distance. Village folk tended to be slightly intimidated, by such well-known and infamous shinobi. That I can understand most vehemently. Sasori wasn't amenable to capture then? May shrugged, although her eyes reflected something more vindictive. I wasn't in the most merciful mood, and Akatsuki has somewhat of a reputation, in our country. Besides, I doubt we could get anything useful from whatever that man had turned himself into. Better just to be rid of him. Her glance turned sideways as she gave the redhead a thoughtful expression. Perhaps the terms of our negotiation could be altered somewhat. An exchange of information perhaps? In the interest of international security. A smirk pulled at Naruto's lips as he watched a house slowly grow from the ground like some well-organized plant. It would certainly be useful not have to constantly reinvent the wheel, I'm sure we can work something out. His features immediately darkened as he shifted the large scroll he was carrying under one arm. And on the note of renegotiation, there's the small matter of the sand bee to address. May almost visibly tensed and her words dropped the honeyed tint that was so integral to her seductive nature. Tread lightly Hokage Dono. Naruto turned to her and she was surprised to find no hint of the stoic, sometimes amused Hokage that she had talked with in her office. Instead she found a tired young man. However, with the pretense stripped away, his warm violet eyes were replaced by something much harder and colder. I'm going to drop the charade with you May. I want to walk away from here with the sand bee. To her credit, May took this on with all the poise she had accumulated over her storied career. That's a tall order Naruto. And I feel I should remind you that we are currently within my borders and I'm less than amiable to threats today. Some hint of the playful Naruto returned with the weary smile that tugged at his lips. I'm not threatening May, I'm actually willing to make it quite profitable to you. A Jinchuriki is worth no amount of money, they're a somewhat limited commodity if you hadn't noticed. That managed to pull a dry chuckle from the man. Yes. You could say I'm pretty familiar with the idea. May had the decency to look abashed. Naruto's status was hardly a secret to the upper echelons of the hidden village's various organizations. It was just not thought about too often as the boy, well, she had to amend that to man after the events of the day, never use the power of the beast sealed within him. 
it was so easy to see him as the return of the yellow flash, and forget the far more dangerous detail of his heritage. My point stands. I wasn't offering money. How much does your village really need a Jinchuriki May? He set the large scroll down, keeping a hand on one end. Especially this one, after your recent difficulties. He couldn't decipher her expression so pressed on. What you need is aid. Not in the charitable sense, I wouldn't presume that much on you. But favorable trade agreements? Cooperation? Exchange of information? That's all in my power. He was throwing away his negotiating stance and she knew it, but as she had said, the Baijiu were one-time deals. Konoha could recover from a few unfavorable deals, despite their own recent troubles, the village was at its most profitable in decades. The question was just how much Kiri had suffered during its civil war. Even from the relatively little he had seen of the village proper, Naruto was confident of the answer. That's a lot of political capital to throw away so early into your office, May warned, in the tone of somebody who hadn't decided and was simply stretching the conversation for time. I've been told I'm quite charismatic, I'd hope I could weather this. You're really serious about the cooperation between our village then? Something tells me this isn't some sham front designed to simply keep each other away from the other's throats. The redhead let out a deep breath, feeling that the conversation had crested some metaphorical hill. Where it went from here was determined by pure momentum. My father believed that the entire world could experience peace someday, a layover from his own teacher. Upon catching May's bemused expression he gave a wry grin. I like to think myself a bit more pragmatic, but it's still a nice future to imagine. So here I am, finally in a position to start, just maybe, forging events in that direction. Why not take it? He felt the next few seconds were crucial in a way that he would never truly understand, before May rolled her eyes. You know, against my better judgment, I find myself believing you. He was strangely glad to see that sultry smile return as she leaned in closer. You do realize this won't stop me from clawing every concession you could imagine from these future negotiations, right? I don't doubt it, Naruto said, chuckling. So, considering your intensity on the matter, I assume you have a Jinchuriki in mind for when you get back home? She was somewhat surprised by how quickly Naruto's face lost its mirth. If I have my way, the sand bee will stay exactly where it is, in this scroll. Forever if need be. There was another long pause where May seemed to size him up as if for the first time, before her usual expression returned. You are truly the strangest man I have ever met Naruto Namikaze. The redhead grinned. I try. He glanced back towards the reconstruction, noting it was significantly further ahead than before. There was something to be said for witnessing Kiri and Konoha Shinobi working side by side to help people. So, allies then? May put a hand to her chest in faux astonishment as the two began walking towards the village. Now Hokage-sama. When did I ever say anything about an alliance? Naruto's smile didn't waver an inch, falling right back into the persona, this time with genuine enthusiasm. I believe somewhere between me agreeing to take on a baiju for you, and our little heartfelt chat just now. Why I'm sure I have no idea what you're talking about. Of course, of course. Naruto walked out of the council chamber unable to hide his disgust. The large scroll containing the sanbi was still slung over his lower back, but just barely. Many of the clan leaders, bar a few that had mostly just stayed quiet through the proceedings, were outraged by his refusal to create a new Jinchuriki. They considered it an enormous waste of an asset, considering the likely tremendous bargaining position May would have in the upcoming talks to properly smooth out their new relationship. It was a blessing that only a few people in the village had both the expertise and the position within the village's hierarchy to even attempt a ceiling, namely, himself, Jiraiya and Donzo. It was the only positive of the exchange that the assembled clan leaders hadn't been delusional enough to believe handing Donzo of all people a Jinchuriki would be a good idea. The man might have been good at concealing his darker nature in the open, but there was still an air about him that didn't lend itself to trust. Ultimately, when it came down to his motivations for refusing the village such an asset, he had simply asked a single question. Are any of you offering your own children? Even Hyashi Hayuga wasn't cold or detached enough to say anything to that. Although mercifully he had been one of the quieter in the room, the man had always had a secret soft spot for family, even if the way he acted told a different story. If he was honest with himself, if any of them had actually said yes, Naruto wasn't sure if he could have stopped himself killing them on the spot. His child hadn't even been born yet and he couldn't imagine giving them over to such a burden. He didn't know what that said about his father, and he'd rather not think about it. And speaking of his child. So, what? 
I'm finding out you're back in the village from the Bluster Twins now? He couldn't stop the weary smile spreading his whiskered cheeks. Seeing Anko, even if she was glaring at him, after all the craziness he'd gone through was. Refreshing. Urgent business. Why were you with Izumo and Kotetsu? For the dynamic dolts they are, they get surprisingly good gossip, she admitted, and it's not like I have much else to do now that I'm officially on medical leave. Don't change the subject though, what's so important you can't even stop in to say you're home? Naruto adjusted the scroll on his back. The kind of business that doesn't wait. Anko's eyes turned into saucers as she walked over, or maybe waddled was more appropriate, her belly was starting to become more prominent, and prodded the scroll. Whoa, so it's true you really have a baiju in there? Okay, there's no way Izumo or Kotetsu knew that. How could you possibly? He trailed off when he saw Anko's impish grin you were just speculating and I good as confirmed it for you. He gave a suffering sigh and ran a hand through his hair. One day I won't fall for that stupid trick. The violet grin only brightened. Not with me you won't. But seriously, a baiju in a scroll? Isn't that kind of. Delicate? I had a while to come up with this seal, it's a variation on two different containment seals cross-linked to provide simultaneous negative reinforcement so if one begins to degrade. And I'm basically talking gibberish to you, aren't I? Anko waved her hand back and forth for a moment before smiling sheepishly. It's a really strong seal? The redhead rolled his eyes. I'd like to think it's a bit more nuanced than that. But yes, it's a very strong seal. And carrying it around on your back? At that, Naruto just grinned. Can you think of anywhere safer? When she gave him a level stare he chuckled, dropping the overconfident charade. Plus, I basically engraved a Horatian marker on the thing, I'll always know where it is. You gonna start a collection or something? Naruto put a hand to his chin, rubbing an invisible goatee and an eerie impression of Haruzen. Everyone needs a hobby. But I think that might rankle some feathers in the other villages. This was likely a one-time thing. Anko eyed the thing again before shrugging. Ultimately, she put a lot of faith in Naruto and he had never let her wrong before, if he thought it was safe, she was okay with that. Whatever. It wasn't the normal reaction to having a partner walk around with what amounted to a very powerful bomb on his back, and in the wrong hands it was precisely that, but they were far from normal partners. She backed that point up by pulling him down for a searing kiss. Did I mention you're out of the doghouse? She added with a lidded gaze, only to abort halfway through as she winced, putting a hand to her stomach. Maybe, I might have to get you back for putting a kicker in me. She rubbed her belly in slow circles, as Shizun had instructed her. Oh yeah, our girl's a mover. Our girl? Naruto asked amusedly. Anko shrugged. I got a hunch, call it maternal intuition. Naruto deigned not to comment on that. Speaking of, where's Haya? Playing with your kitties. Naruto winced dramatically and both glanced upward momentarily to pray for his team's sanity. When Haya played, nobody was safe. It made for wonderful training though. And on that note, as you've so helpfully reminded me, there are some people in the village I need to let know I'm back. Anko rolled her eyes in good humor. As long as I'm the one you're saying good night to. Naruto's answer was a quick peck on the lips. Good boy. Oh, and I thought I should let you know that Jiraiya's in the village, wanted to meet when you had a moment. Naruto clicked his tongue, the toad Sanin still wasn't exactly in his good books. Sure, I'll get around to him eventually, his face brightened, but there are a few people a little higher on my list. Alright, see you in A but Naruto had already vanished, leaving her to huff irritably. Show off. He took a great deal of satisfaction in seeing his students try to catch their breath, each in their own way. Emi was unabashedly sprawled out on the ground, airing her chest by pulling at her neckline. Sakura was watching her disapprovingly, too out of breath to properly reproach her as she leant against one of the training posts. Sasuke was standing, although there was a slight hunch to his back, as if he was resisting the temptation to rest on his knees. Their glaring silence was their own way of informing their teacher his surprise checkup was not appreciated. It's nice to see you're all coming along so well, especially with the techniques I suggested. I'm going to start arranging some solo missions for you guys as a team, really get you that on the ground experience, he chuckled when they couldn't decide whether to still be angry at him, or excited at the prospect. What brought? This about? Sensei? Emmy asked, trying and failing to cover up her heavy breathing. It's been. Heavily suggested, that providing too much of a safety net for you guys might stifle your growth. 
I think that's a crock to be honest, but with my recent responsibilities. He absently touched the scroll on his hip and your guy's undeniable growth. He fought down the instinctive cheeky remark at seeing their grins at the praise even I have to admit that having you guys out there on your own can only hone your abilities. That's Naru talk for I'm getting really busy, but you guys are like, super strong now so maybe you don't need me so much. I think, Haya translated happily from on top of his shoulders. Thanks speedster, but we've gotten a pretty good grip on Naru talk ourselves by now, we know what he meant, Emi said, winking at the silver-haired girl. Yes well, unraveling the innate mystery that is me aside, keep at it, I'm proud of you guys, I have other places to be. Yada yada yada, Naruto drawled, turning on a heel to go. Of course, Hokage-sama. Emi couldn't resist calling to his back. Keep up with that lip, and I really will demote you, he shot back over his shoulder. So you keep saying, she replied without hesitation, only getting an airy wave as the redhead vanished into the trees. She only waited a few seconds before glancing to her teammates. Who's up for following him then? Why? Sasuke muttered, finally getting enough wind back to straighten up. I have better things to do than trail sensei around until he gets bored enough to teleport somewhere else. It's an exercise in futility. Didn't stop us when we were younger, Sakura offered with a shrug. Yeah duck butt, where's your sense of adventure? Probably somewhere back in those trees, along with half a pint of my sweat, and don't call me that. 1. You. 2. Come on, you know you're intrigued by that big ass scroll. Of course I am. I'm just pointing out the futility of trying to follow Naruto sensei anywhere. He's got a point, Sakura threw in, but I have to admit that I am curious. I know, right? Emi whined, flopping back down on the grass. What do you guys think's in there? Sakura and Sasuke shared a look, the obvious question going unsaid. I couldn't see anything with my Sharingan, he proffered reluctantly. Bloodline users were always remiss to reveal any flaws in their vaunted techniques. Ooh, so it's super secret then. Or simply so heavily inscribed with seals that the sheer interference negates my vision, it is Naruto sensei. Well, Sakura mused, it's a big scroll. Can't be too many things that it could be. Summoning contract? Emi hazarded, only to have Sasuke shake his head. He's shown no indication of having one before. Why start wearing it now? Besides, summoning contracts are usually held by the summons themselves, unless the summoner requests it. He looked up from his musing to see his teammates staring at him blankly. I may have looked into any contracts the clan may have had before. Well, anyway, you really think Sensei of all people wouldn't boast if he managed to get his hands on a contract? They are quite rare. What do you think he'd get? I'd bet it'd be something really ironic, like turtles or something. Not really pertinent to the conversation. Besides, Guy has the turtle summoning contract. Again, Sasuke looked up to find the other two just staring at him, although this time Sakura broke the tension. Seriously? Why doesn't that come up more often? And how do you even know that? Sasuke shuddered, a feeling that seemed to creep out of the very depths of his soul. His clone, and I refuse to believe that creature is anything but, has some sort of fixation with me. At that Sakura shared his shiver. You're not alone on that front. A mutual sort of understanding seemed to pass between the two before Emi coughed to break it up. So. What then? Something sealed? Probably the most likely answer, Sasuke admitted slowly, he was the type to loathe being proved wrong later. What could be so important that it would need Sensei's constant supervision? A baiju? It was her turn to get double teamed in the stair department. Don't be silly Emi. That's the stupidest thing I've heard all day, Dobi. Seriously, that would mean Naruto sensei was walking around with a bomb on his back, all through practice. Even Tomato Head isn't that reckless. Besides that's a horrid accusation to make, it would mean he was risking war with another village right after we got out of one. Don't be an idiot. Okay. Okay, Emi yelled in defeat, smiling despite the grilling, she knew her teammates weren't being serious. Geez, I was mostly joking anyway. So, what then? Some kind of serious criminal that's so dangerous sensei needs to be their constant warden? Sasuke and Sakura shared another look before shrugging, answering simultaneously. Probably. Want to break into his house again to find out what it is? The Uchiha rolled his eyes. Because that went so well last time. It had taken him ages to get his eyebrows even again after that stunt. Oh come on, we're way better than we were back then. Sakura just snorted. 
back when we were basically allowed to have free reign of the house because it was just for a prank. This goes a little beyond that. And why don't you just ask that psycho anyway? Isn't she your mentor or something? Don't call Anko a psycho, she's just quirky, Ami said defensively only to sag slightly. I'm going too, but if it really is some kind of village secret she won't, she's actually pretty strict about that sort of stuff. No kidding, Sakura mused, disbelief evident on her face. Which brings up the old point that you still refuse to tell us what got you so flustered the last time we did that. Emmy felt her cheeks grow rosy at the memory. It was nothing, just a misunderstanding. She quickly jumped to her feet, suddenly intent on changing the topic. So, who's up for ramen? Sasuke and Sakura shared another one of their looks, honestly if they didn't just get on with it and make out Emmy was going to hurl, and oh look, there was Anko's insidious influence on her poor, innocent mind, before the former shrugged. As long as it's not that cardboard from Chizaro's. No way, Emmy practically breathed in relief, recovering admirably, I'm never taking Kiba's food recommendations again. That guy wouldn't know good food if Kuji was stealing it from him. It's Ichiraku's or nothing for this girl. Fine. Despite his students' beliefs, Naruto didn't simply vanish the moment he was out of sight. He normally would have, if you can teleport. Why wouldn't you? Dash if not for Emmy. She much preferred when he carried her around at high speeds. Apparently travel by Hiraishin was exhilarating, but over too quickly. She preferred her adrenaline highs to be a bit more drawn out. Honestly, Naruto wasn't sure if he should be indulging her in that regard, and probably wouldn't if it didn't seem so built into her DNA. But when it came to the silver-haired speedster he was a soft touch, so ended up running across the village's rooftops at as close to a dead sprint as he felt was safe, for other people anyway. It wasn't as easy as it used to be, Haya was far from the little waif of a girl he had found over a year ago. Still, the way her cheeks turned red from the wind, and her excited screams as he took sharp turns at landscape blurring speeds, drove him to keep doing it. Eventually though he had to deal with the inevitable pout when he wound down to a more human speed outside of the hot springs. He had to get around to Jiraiya eventually, and honestly, where else was he going to find the pervert? Nichan more. Your runs keep getting shorter and shorter. He hefted her off his shoulders and set her down, trying not to grin at the way she crossed her arms petulantly. Burden of the hat I'm afraid, I like to think I make up for it in quality. So stupid hat, she muttered, despite the fact that the day he had come home wearing it for the first time, she had run around the house all evening with it hilariously dwarfing her head. Maybe, Naruto agreed in the noncommittal way that was universal adult language for you are wrong, but I'm not just going to say that. Besides, you're starting to get a bit big for our runs, and soon you won't even need me to go that fast. It wasn't far off from the truth. Haya was a demon at picking up the subtle techniques Naruto used to increase his speed, adding to her already impressive genetics. Naruto really wanted to meet an adult of her clan, they must be a sight to behold. No. He should have expected what came next, with Haya rocketing forward to clamp down like a limpet on his leg. Okay, maybe not that soon. He detached her easily by tickling her under the arms, boy had he been glad to lean that trick. I'll always have time to run with you, even when you're too old for my shoulders. She just buried her face into his chest, mumbling something that sounded like never into his shirt, making him chuckle. Okay, then when I'm too old for you to ride on my shoulders. That earned him an inquisitive look from under a veil of silvery strands. I can't imagine you like Gigi. She squinted hard, like she was mentally trying to force the wrinkles onto his face. Don't try too hard, I like the way I look, he shot back good-naturedly, ruffling her hair as he walked further into the complex. Now come on, I brought you here for something fun. Remember Jiraiya? Froggy pervert, Haya confirmed with the kind of single-minded not only kids could manage. That's him, he's around here somewhere, probably invisible, I want you to find him. When he got another nod, he grinned. Remember what Anko taught you to do when you find a pervert? She looked adorable when she scrunched up her face and thought like that, but eventually she nodded again. Good, go get him. She was off like a little silver streak and he didn't have to wait long for the shriek of surprise, followed by the inevitable splash. Only after the accompanying sounds of vague feminine fury died off did Haya return, looking like the cat that had caught all the canaries. Time like these remind him that Anko was going to make one hell of a mother. It took a few minutes longer for Jiraiya to drag himself over, but at least by the time he did, he had cleaned himself up slightly and wasn't looking any worse for wear. What in the hells are you teaching that girl? He groused, rubbing what looked to be a faint red footprint on one of his cheeks. I didn't build the weapon, I just aim it. 
Jiraiya's lip twitched. You're sounding more and more like the old man with each passing day. How's the hat? Starting to feel like a noose yet? You know, some people actually don't run from all responsibility like it's an angry ex. You should know, you practically helped raise one. Jiraiya waved him off. Yeah, Minato always did have a bit of a martyr complex, nice to see it's genetic. Maybe you'd know more about it if you didn't spend your days crouched in front of a peephole, spying on girls a third your age. The self-proclaimed pervert grinned broadly. Well, I'd go for half my age, but the MILF scene is a bit more niche. He gave the redhead a suggestive eyebrow wiggle. I hear you're trying to break into that genre yourself. Naruto sighed, running a hand slowly through his hair. If that's your own weird way of congratulating me for my kid. Thanks. Otherwise. Well actually I don't really have to threaten you. Anko usually has that base covered. Jiraiya only shivered momentarily. Where is the mother to be, anyway? From what I've heard, probably off getting chummy with your old teammate, they seem to have grown disturbingly close as of late. This time the fear was more pronounced as Jiraiya nodded sagely. That is disturbing news. Although the certainly amusing story of how the hell you managed to get Tsunade back here aside, I did actually want to talk to you for more than just to catch up. I'm not signing the Toad contract, I don't get why you're so persistent about this. Jiraiya waved again. No, not that. You've made your point more than clear, thanks. I actually wanted to let you know that I may have scrounged up a lead about this brat's clan. Haya stuck her tongue out at the older man before the weight of his words actually sunk in, the petulant look becoming wide-eyed in an instant. You found the clan? Maybe, can't say for sure. Like I said, it's a lead. When you told me to keep an ear to the ground I kept getting in reports of a group of silver-haired people that would pass through towns long enough to buy up a bunch of food and supplies before moving on without a trace. There was nothing concrete for a long while, and definitely no pattern to their movements, bloody definition of nomads. Couple of days ago though I got a strange tidbit about a girl staying behind. Not for long though, a week later she was gone. Not much of a lead, Naruto pointed out, a little disappointed. He wanted Haya to find her family, even as attached as he grown to her. Ah but here's the kicker, she didn't go alone. Apparently, she ran off with one of the village's young bachelors, proper love at first sight kind of stuff. It really got the old creative juices flowing. Naruto grimaced at the image. I bet it did. But if they're gone, how does that help? Jiri Ayer rolled his eyes. Kid, these guys are a nightmare to track because they're so fast, right? Understanding quickly dawned on the redhead. But the civilian isn't, he'll leave a more prominent trail. He grunted irritably. But not for long. Damn, it's always just when I get back. He was surprised by the sobering expression on Jiraiya's face as he patted the younger shinobi on the back. If there's a trail, and I'm warning it may just be an if, then it won't go cold that quickly. Certainly not fast enough to warrant missing a night with your family, you'll want to take my word on that. The sincerity in the Sanin's voice was. Unusual. You're right, thanks for the information. I can't believe I'm saying this but I guess I owe you one. He was much happier when Jiraiya immediately reverted back to a more typical, goofy expression. Ho ho? A favor from the new Hokage, now that will be one I'll most certainly remember to cash. Sure whatever, just try not to get beaten to death by a mob of angry women before then. Or do, you should be old enough to lie in your own bed. Emphasis on should. Hasn't happened yet, Jiraiya exclaimed brightly, turning to return to his. Work. The redhead glanced down to find Haya pulling at the edge of her shirt, looking distracted, so quickly swept her up onto his shoulders. He was sure this was a lot to process for the girl. Come on speedster, we better get home, we'll have a busy day tomorrow. Do you really think we'll find the clan? She asked, in an uncharacteristically subdued tone. I, I don't know Haya, but I promised you I would try, and I don't intend to break that any time soon. He bobbed up and down suddenly to break her contemplative gaze and grinned broadly. Come on, I feel like taking the long way home tonight, we can even stop by that ice cream place if you want. For all the weight that had been piled on such a young girl's shoulders, she was still just a child and in many ways, predictable. The one that does sprinkles? You bet the one that does sprinkles. Chapter 44, Official Discoveries Naruto woke with a start, a quick glance out the window telling him it couldn't be later than 3 in the morning. That was unusual. Naruto was, under the best circumstances, a light sleeper, out of sheer professional necessity if nothing else. What he wasn't, was prone to waking up without reason. 
there was a strange itching sensation in the back of his head that he couldn't pin down, his faculties still falling into place. Anko was on the other side of the bed, slumbering quite obliviously and practically wrapped around her pillow. She could probably sleep through an earthquake. The one he was wary of disturbing was Haya, who had cuddled up in between them. She hadn't done that for months, the news about her clan must have really rattled her. All in all, he couldn't spot anything amiss, and that was perhaps the most disturbing thing of all. He carefully slipped out of bed, slipping on some pants and grabbing his howry off the back of the door as he passed. He could technically check the seals from anywhere in the house, but he didn't want to disturb his family if this was all nothing. Softly closing the door behind him, he paused. Seals. He couldn't feel the Horatian marker on the Sanbi scroll. Suppressing his panic with a wave of cold rationale he immediately attempted to flash to it. Anyone watching wouldn't have even been able to see the moment he was gone before he reappeared, clutching his head. It felt as though he had rebounded off a less than proverbial wall. Wary against trying that again, not to mention rattled at the completely alien sensation, he instead focused intently on the seal instead. Usually his various markers were just a dull sensation that he could tune out during the day-to-day. They only intruded on his thoughts if they were recently activated or relatively close, like the ones he used in fights. If he focused though, he could mentally track every single kunai or seal he had ever placed, only growing more difficult the further they were away. This one was. Weird. It didn't feel far away, but at the same time it was muted. It was like trying to listen in on a conversation through thick layers of carpeting. You could tell somebody was speaking, but not make out the words. Now deeply unsettled, he slipped out a window and took to the rooftops, immediately regretting not putting on some sandals. He focused more intently on the marker than he ever had on a single seal before, feet moving where the pull in the back of his mind lead. By the time he came to a stop he thought something must be seriously wrong with him, as it was just a normal intersection, blank, empty streets all around. But the tug was still there, more pressing but still. Off, and that only left one direction. He immediately sank into the ground, employing the very technique he had taught to his students on their first real mission. It worked perfectly, until he hit a layer of reinforced concrete he couldn't pass through. Naruto knew the village like the back of his hand, or he thought he did, and there was definitely not supposed to be an underground passage of any kind down here. Lacking the time to think about other options, a habit he was told would be the death of him one day, his hand lit up with the swirling energies of a Rasengan. Probably not the smartest thing to do surrounded by earth, but it made for one hell of an entrance as he blasted into the dim concrete tunnel below him. It was like a bucket of ice had been poured over his head. The marker he had been so intensely fixated on snapped into focus like a bowstring and it was all Naruto could do not to instantly teleport to it. Instead, he took stock, taking in the barren, utilitarian passageway that stretched off in either direction with a steady curve that saw each end lost in the gloom. It was built in the familiar design of the Anbu compound, standardized for the various complexes they had scattered across the continent. However, this was no Anbu facility that Naruto had ever heard of. It was too deep underground for one thing. Where the hell was he? His mind turned furiously. He was in a complex below the village that he, the Hokage, did not know about. It was modeled on Konoha Anbu structures, likely meaning to is built by somebody with an understanding of their practices. That same person, or organization, had the capabilities to break into his house, steal an object he was keeping personal tabs on and, most worryingly, block the Horatian. Theoretically he knew it was possible, but it required a complex understanding of the technique he didn't think anybody else had. For one thing, while the notes on the original Horatian, created by the Nidime, weren't technically a secret, the version his father had created most certainly was. But then, on second thought, the hypothetical thief technically wouldn't need those notes. The original technique still worked as functional teleportation, but it was clunky, took hand seals and much more concentration. His father had simply made it usable in combat. Well, there was nothing simple about it, but he hadn't changed the fundamentals of the jutsu. If somebody could figure out a way to block the Nidime's technique, or perhaps just any space-time jutsu, then it would work on his too. That was definitely something to think about in the future. For now though, his thoughts led him in a very specific direction. There was only one figure he could imagine with the resources, knowledge, motivation and, perhaps most importantly, the sheer gall to pull something like this. Donzo. The low growl of his voice echoed slightly in the confined passage. He glanced down each end of the passageway again, nobody had come to investigate the noise. He could still feel the gentle pull of the scrolls tag and he was rapidly debating whether or not to just flash there. 
it was usually the height of recklessness to barge into a situation he didn't fully understand. On the other hand, when somebody steals a baiju, they will damn well have a reason too. Chances are, it wasn't anything good. He could spend precious minutes searching this complex, getting held up by who knew what obstacles. Or. He could not. The scene he appeared within was essentially his worst-case scenario. It was a large, vaulted room, bathed in a sickly orange light. The scroll was to one side, linked to a much larger ceiling matrix that, in turn, encompassed the form of what appeared to be a child. He couldn't make out much else due to the dark, figure hiding clothes and the blank white mask that covered their face. He could practically feel their pain though as they writhed within their bindings, back arching as far as the leather straps would allow. Strangely they didn't make so much as a whimper, despite the burning orange chakra suffusing their body. Naruto had only pulled on that virulent well of energy in his darkest moments and he knew the agonizing burn of it all too well. He was unsure of what that meant, and wasn't given much time to mull it over as his presence was immediately noted. There were four other figures in the room, one overseeing the ceiling and three others stationed at strategic points around the room. They all wore the same bland uniform as the unfortunate victim, looking like some twisted, blank parodies of the Anbu in their featureless grey cloaks. Two immediately rushed him, lacking the usual pause of surprise, however slight, that his entrances normally gave people. So, they were expecting him. He wasn't in the mood to indulge Donzo though and disabled them in the time it took a civilian to blink. The first tried to grasp him with an outstretched hand, but even in the strange undulating light the ceiling ritual gave off he could see the slight blue tint to his skin. Not wanting to find out what that was about, he intercepted the blow at the elbow, feeling the joint shatter as he stepped into the man's guard grabbed him by the mask and slammed him into the floor at speeds that would have broken a normal man's neck. His companion didn't even pause at the casual display of brutality, bringing his hands up to flash through the signs of a technique that Naruto recognized as having many of the same seals as many Yamanaka techniques. Knowing what to expect from that he sidestepped the vague ripple in the air without breaking stride and caught the man directly in the solar plexus with a kick that threw him across the room. He paused a moment, staring at the last guard with subtle traces of irritation puling at his features. He couldn't see what the man was thinking due to the mask, but the redhead knew enough about body language to recognize the complete apathy his attacks hadn't even shaken. What was he fighting? Robots? The man reached for something in his cloak. In that moment he broke eye contact, and in the single instant it took to look down, he suddenly found a knee occupying the space just in front of his mask. He slumped against the far wall without making so much as a grunt of discomfort, none of them had. It was disconcerting how quiet they had all been. Once again though, pressed for time he disregarded the strangeness and turned to the one overseeing the ritual itself, grabbing him by the cloak. He nearly flinched away in disgust when his form suddenly went limp, the telltale foam of a poison capsule dribbling out from under the mask. The man was probably dead before he hit the floor. Which left him with a very pressing concern. Damn it. He pushed the dead form of the unidentified operative out of the way and examined the ceiling structure as fast as he could. Damn it. What he saw was not good, the seal itself was damn shoddy work. It looked good at a glance, and would likely hold, but it was unstable. The sealer had attempted to tweak an existing design that would see the Baiju's chakra trickle into the Jinchuriki's system at a steady rate. What they hadn't accounted for was the effect this would have on the vessel's coils. Unused chakra harmonized with the user's body and naturally vented out to prevent damage or strain to the pathways. Foreign chakra on the other hand continued to build up in the system until it became damaging. One of the reasons why medics had to be so damn precise with their healing palm technique. You couldn't just shunt chakra at a wound and hope it healed. What they needed to have done was find a way of converting the Baiju's chakra into a less dangerous form, like desalinating seawater. That was difficult to do even if you were good at fuinjutsu. It relied on a whole bunch of messy variables, including the Jinchuriki candidate themselves. Naruto grimaced as he looked down at the poor soul strapped to the table. He wasn't just going to let them die and trying to revert the procedure now was as good as a death sentence. Damn it. He hoped their silence was a sign of resilience and not because they had already gone hoarse from screaming, because this was going to be. Messy. He worked steadily, with the precision of a surgeon as he carefully began rewriting sections of the ritual, basically working on the fly as painstaking calculations started building an enormous web of increasing complexity in his mind. He forced out concerns like the reasons for all of this, the life relying on his success and the absurd circumstances of all of this. There was nothing but the room, the seal, and his brush. 
His face became almost clinical in the detached way he worked, connecting loose kanji that might have caused instability or backdoors in the creation of the pseudo-dimension that would be holding the mass of sentient energy. There was a moment of genius when he managed to repurpose the original seal on the scroll, transplanting half of the matrix onto the Jinchuriki's stomach, while using the other half to sort of strain, the Baijuu. It drastically reduced the potency of the chakra during the transfer and took the intelligence of the creature itself out of the picture for the moment. It also might have very well saved the Jinchuriki's life. When the final few motes of flickering orange light faded, plunging the room into near darkness, the redhead had to take a moment just to lean against the table, breathing deeply. The only thing left of the ritual was the seal shiki that remained on the original scroll, which could be used to alter the rate at which chakra flowed into the vessel, and the seal itself on the girl's stomach. He wasn't sure when he had realized it was a girl, he knew his mind had taken it into account as a variable at some point, but it had been just another stream of numbers at the time. With a final grunt of effort, he turned his hand slightly, folding the expansive and complex seal down into its compressed form. To an untrained eye it would look something like a squiggly hexagon spiraling in on itself, surrounded on each diagonal corner by a triangle pointed inward. It was nothing he'd have been particularly proud of if he had actually taken time to design it. But it would work. She would live. In a way, it was the first time he had properly acknowledged to himself that he was in fact working with a human life, and the thought nearly made him sick. She was clearly unconscious by now, the ceiling having taken its toll, but the blank eyes of the porcelain mask still seemed to stare at him accusingly. He pulled it off after a moment only to freeze as spiky blonde hair fanned out and a messy corona around her face. His eyes only noted that in passing, drawn as they were to her cheeks. The cheeks that held three distinct whisker marks. Naruto did not get angry. It was a fact for people that knew him, he was by nature forgiving and amenable. He didn't take the world as seriously, in the sense that he could maintain a sense of humor in a bad situation. On an off day he may go a little hard on a sparring opponent, or make a few remarks on the wrong side of sarcasm. He wasn't like the rakage, going around smashing desks at the slightest irritation, or the tsuchikage, who might berate you until your ears fell off, or even the mizukage, who would threaten to kill you over the slightest provocation. Naruto was furious. There was a simmering tension within the Hokaye's office as he stood in front of the window, staring at the pre-dawn sky with his hands clasped behind his back, face completely unreadable. Hiruzen's anger had once been described as a physical weight pressing down on everything in the room. With Naruto, it felt as though somebody kept cranking the heat up, bit by bit. Even Jiri Aya looked visibly uncomfortable, he had no idea how much of this was Naruto, and how much was the fox playing on a rare lapse of emotion. He wasn't sure which answer he would prefer. When the redhead finally spoke his tone was flat, almost emotionless. If anything, it just made it all the more chilling. I'm going to kill him. It wasn't a suggestion, just a deeply unsettling observation. Naruto, you know you can't act rashly, Hiruzen said softly, disguising his own discomfort at the situation. I'm just as furious as you are. He immediately knew that was the wrong thing to say as Naruto turned slightly, enough to train a single eye on the older man. His eyes were flat, the cage's mind elsewhere, it was more like he was staring at a point a few inches behind Hiruzen's head. I doubt that. He didn't raise his voice at all, there was barely an inflection to it. That was inappropriate, I apologize. I didn't mean to make light of the situation. He's trying to tell you not to do something you'll regret later kid, Jiraiya chipped in, although even as he said it he seemed uncertain of his words. Who said I would regret it? People often said rage made people act irrationally, that it impaired their judgment. Naruto thought they couldn't be more wrong. In his anger, everything had crystallized into perfect clarity, as though time had slowed to a crawl. It dragged out seconds into minutes, giving him more than enough time to imagine, one by one, the many, many ways he could end Donzo Shimura's life. It had entered the realm of the purely academical by the time Hiruzen spoke up again. Like, how much of their spine does a human really need to survive? Regardless of the crime, or its undoubted deservedness, caution must be given. As it stands, there is no proof. Proof? Naruto didn't need to raise his voice beyond its current whisper to be heard. The syllable seemed to reverberate around the room. The man kidnapped my sister the day my parents sacrificed everything for this village. Kept her locked away, brainwashed her into one of his ghoulish toy soldiers and was about to make an unstable Jinchuriki out of her. He took a deep, and far from calming breath as he turned. This isn't about proof. As if on cue, the sun chose that moment to peek over the horizon, casting the office in shades of red. 
For an instant Jiraiya thought he saw Naruto's pupils turn slitted, but it could have been a trick of the light and his own paranoia playing up on him. I agree, it saddens and angers me to see just how far my old teammate has fallen, a sentiment I'm sure is perfectly understood in this company. Hiruzen glanced at both Jiraiya and Naruto, but the former was too fixated on his pupil's son to acknowledge the statement. But you must understand how it may appear. You found a secret base below the village, now populated by dead men conducting a sealing on a girl who should have died 15 years ago. Despite where the evidence would appear to point, it is nothing but conjecture. I am the Hokage. It came out almost desperately as the flame behind Naruto's eyes began to falter, it was the first hint of emotion in his voice since he had realized who was beneath that mask. And tyrants rarely sit in comfy chairs for long. I am sorry Naruto, but when it comes to this matter, we must tread carefully. The fury returned in an instant, icing over his moment of weakness as though it never happened. So, what? He gets away with it? All of it? My sister's suffering? That abhorrent organization he built? The other children torn from their families? He knew the significance of those Aburame and Yamanaka techniques being used. When word started getting out, he wouldn't be the only one calling for blood. Before Hiruzen could answer, Komachi burst into the room. She had been one of the first people he had contacted when he left the underground complex, firstly to wake and collect Tsunade, Hiruzen, and Jiraiya, then to get more Anbu and scour the village for Donzo. Tsunade was at the hospital making sure Sukaru was okay. Or as okay as she could be after 15 years with Donzo Shimura. It was probably for the best that she was kept busy with that, from the look on her face she wouldn't have even waited this long to go hunting. I'm sorry Hokage-sama, we've searched the entire village. There's no sign of Shimura-san. Naruto took in the information with a stony silence before nodding once. Rouse the Hayuga and the Inuzuka, tell them I want search parties out immediately. He will be found and captured. Komachi nodded succinctly and immediately went to carry out her orders, leaving the three men alone again. This time though Naruto wore a thin, icy smile as he turned back to the window, watching as his village was roused into action. Innocent men don't run. Fires could only burn for so long and it took all of Naruto's composure to keep stoking the one within him until the door clicked shut behind him. It shattered like so much useless glass the moment he was alone with his sister again. He glanced up at her from where had slumped against the wall, still not quite sure he could believe it. Tsunade had declared her as healthy as could be, physically at least. Her mental situation would be evaluated, in depth, the moment she awoke, which, given the fact she had recently undergone a Jinchuriki ritual at twice the age they were recommended, was currently uncertain. He was almost afraid to approach her, scared that if he did it might all turn out to be a dream, or some sick illusion. Really though, he wasn't sure if deserved to. You were alive, all this time. And I didn't even know. I was supposed to be there for you, protect you, help you grow up. He gave a tremulous smile, blinking his eyes as they became watery. You would have helped me heal, and I would have raised you. We would have been our own little family. Tentatively, like she might melt under his touch, he ran a hand through her hair, spiky and blonde, so much like their father's. But that was stolen from us. You were stolen from me, from the life you were supposed to have. The rational part of his mind knew that there was nothing a seven-year-old could have done at the time, but that part of his mind wasn't behind the wheel. There was a deep, noxious feeling in his gut that this was all his fault. If he had just tried harder, hadn't given up so quickly. For most of his life the girl in front of him had been nothing more than a name on a memorial, the promise of a sister that never came through. What was she to him now? What was he to her? Hey! He had heard Anko enter, but hadn't bothered to look up. When she gently pressed in against his side, wrapping an arm around his shoulders he leant into the contact. She's back, he whispered, refusing to let his voice waver. I know, like a miracle, huh? He could tell Anko didn't know how to react to all of this any more than he did. But he was thankful at least for the support. Just having her next to him kept him short up. What's going on Ni-chan? Haya piped up, grabbing his other hand on reflex. He nearly choked at the name. I thought we were going on a trip today? He had completely forgotten about Haya's clan. That lead. It could be the difference of ever seeing her family again. But. His sister. He couldn't just leave her. He could never leave her again. He squeezed her hand lightly. Hey speedster, you. He very nearly choked on his words, but forced it down you like Anko and me, right? The girl furrowed her brow, any other day he would have found that adorable, now it was just heartbreaking. I love you and Nei-chan, 
She said it with such sincerity. He couldn't believe he was even asking her this. You like it here, in Konoha, right? She nodded gently, still confused. So, if you had to stay here for a while longer. She picked up the inference after a moment and nodded happily, the simple innocence clashing terribly with the atmosphere in the small hospital room. I would live here forever, you're my family. Naruto could only nod slowly, unable to trust his words. He was deeply grateful when Anko squeezed him gently, that little current of affection going a long way in propping up his resolve. Then that trip might have too. Wait a while? Okay? Haya nodded uncertainly, and to prevent her thinking about it too much he quickly swept her up into her arms. There's someone I want you to meet, okay? He hefted her until she had a good view at the sleeping girl. This is my little sister, Sukaru. Her previous disappointment vanished as she stared wide-eyed at the new Jinchuriki. She's so pretty. The redhead choked back a sob, hiding it behind a trembling smile. Yeah, she is. She. She's been gone, for a long time, and she's not well, so we need to be there for her, alright? Haya stopped her hand short of stroking Sukaru's whiskers. Me too? MHMM, he hummed, she's going to need a little sister to teach her all sorts of things. When she wakes up she might not. No, some stuff, and it might take some patience, so I'll need you to be strong, okay? At that Haya just bobbed happily. She wasn't blind, even children could be sensitive to the mood of the room, she was just excited about the prospect of another older sister like Ami to play with. I can do that. Naruto could only hug her tighter, planting a kiss in her silvery hair. Thanks speedster, I can always count on you, can't I? Speaking of which, Anko cut on softly, I think we should give Naruto some time alone with his sister, okay? Haya looked upset by that, but one look at Anko had her nodding in resignation, quickly allowing herself to be lead from the room. Anko herself paused in the doorway, turning and offering a small smile to her fiancé full of enough warmth to lift some of the ice constricting his chest. Remember, no matter what, this is a good thing. He gave what he hoped was a reassuring look back, but was almost certain it didn't reach his eyes. When she closed the door behind her he felt numb again, uncertain of everything. Uncertain of what would happen when she finally woke up. Uncertain of what he could do for her, or what she would need from him. Uncertain that he could even give it to her. He hadn't felt this lost since that horrific night so many years ago. Slowly, and without really realizing it, his hands began working through a long sequence of hand seals. There was something he had been saving for a very long time, for a very specific moment in his life. He never thought he would use it this soon, and yet he couldn't think of a time when he had needed it more. When his hands came to a stop, the chakra ready at the point of no return, he had to take a deep breath to steady his resolve. The room seemed to glow for a moment as ink swirled on his palm, forming intricate shapes that steadily wound down the length of his arm. When it was complete, he placed his hand against the seal on his stomach. And twisted. The inside of the seal hadn't improved at all since the one and only other time he had entered it. It had been in a fit of childish bravery, when he had felt the need to confront the beast that had torn his world apart so thoroughly. He had come out of that interaction with nothing but disappointment. The fox was an asshole, simple as that. When an angry little human had entered its prison, it had simply taken to mocking the teen, correctly assuming that silence was the best way to irritate him. It didn't seem to have changed its doctrine, only lifting its head slightly from behind the massive bars at the unexpected intrusion. The QB was just as staggeringly large as he remembered, which was intimidating in its own right, but he had grown up a lot from that brash moment. The seal itself kept the majority of its chakra, and therefore its noxious, unbearable presence, safely locked up. There was less to fear from the creature than an ordinary fox. The QB wasn't what he was here for though. Instead he focused on the seal Shiki inscribed on his arm, gently modifying it with careful thoughts. He wasn't really here, this was all a mental interface representing more abstract concepts. A few tweaks to the Shiki tricked the seal into assuming that certain conditions had been met, without actually triggering them. Specifically, the seal currently believed that an excess of the fox's chakra was uncontrollably leaking into his system, and the internal barrier separating the QB's spiritual manifestation had been unlocked. He felt them appear before he saw them, feeling tears well up in his eyes as the achingly familiar presence of their chakra. He almost couldn't bear to turn, the idea that they might not really be their torturous. Slowly though, he did, trying for a small smile that ended up being a bit more tremulous than he would have preferred. It nearly broke down entirely when he finally caught sight of them. Hi mom. Hi dad. Chapter 45. Official Recovery. 
Naruto was not expecting the flying tackle, and was subsequently bowled over by the red blur that took him in the chest. All he saw for a few moments was a veil of red hair before glistening violet eyes leaned back, although not far enough back to stop squeezing the life out of him. My little Naru-chan, Kushina murmured as she finally let him go, somewhat awkwardly straddling him as she held his face between her hands. Her brow crinkled slightly as she turned him this way and that, the novelty of the situation managing to keep Naruto quiet during all of this. Well, not so little now. Her gaze softened as she leaned back in, wrapping her arms around him and just holding him there. I missed you growing up. Hi to you too mom, he finally managed, glancing past her to where his father looked on, smiling at the scene. Hey dad. The Yondaime nodded, looking somewhat awkward as he shuffled in place, as though worried about approaching any further. Son. The monosyllable seemed to trigger something in Kushina as the woman suddenly sat bolt upright, glaring at the man. Is that any way to greet our Naruto after all this time, you big damn flake? Minato wavered in place, looking far from the fearsome Hokage the world remembered him as. Naruto was okay with that though, this was the father he remembered. Well, I don't know how he feels about me. After what I did. He gave a weak, sheepish smile. I don't want to get punched or some. The breath was taken out of him as his wife suddenly launched backwards, burying her fist into his stomach and doubling him over, hair splayed out around her like the fox she had once housed. In an all-too-sweet voice, that Naruto found disconcertingly familiar, she whispered, there, problem solved. Now man up and come greet our son, Dada Bane. A significantly more winded Minato lurched over just as Naruto was picking himself up off the ground, smiling fondly at the tableau right out of his memories. For the record, I probably wouldn't have hit you. I've sort of gotten over it by now. Minato smiled, stepping forward to wrap his son in a hug, only to grunt again as another fist lodged itself in his stomach. Sort of. I, deserve that, the older man gasped, only to find his voice muffled as Naruto suddenly pulled him up, wrapping the man in a hug. I missed you dad. When they both heard a distinctive throat clear, Naruto simply opened one of his arms, admitting Kushina into the hug. I missed you both, so much. He wasn't sure how long they all stayed in that embrace, but it was Minato who eventually pulled away. I have to ask son, how did you know about? Well, us? Naruto put on a bit of a tired smile at that, he hadn't forgotten why he was here, but he couldn't help but feel a small swell of pride. I didn't drop my studies after you guys were. You know. Seals have been my life for the last 12 years, and I've had a lot of time to examine this one. He motioned to his stomach. So it was only a matter of time before I figured out what you had done. Minato's brow creased. But to mess with your own Jinchuriki seal, even for this, seems a bit. Dangerous? The redhead preempted. Probably, but trust me, I know my own seal inside out. I've even made a few modifications to prevent too much of the fox's chakra leaking into my system. Still not completely sure why you did that by the way. The blonde rubbed the back of his head, purposefully avoiding the pointed stare from his wife. I was hoping you would use that power to become stronger, clearly you, ah, didn't need it. Naruto shrugged. Can't say it didn't come in handy a few times. I've never lacked for energy. At that Kushina gained an expression he would have thought more appropriate on Jiraiya. I imagine any lady friends you might have had certainly wouldn't have complained. She only allowed the awkward pause that followed to languish for a few seconds before busting out laughing at the identical red expressions on her husband and son's face. Oh, you two are just too alike. Both only realized that they were rubbing the back of their head in identical movements when they caught each other doing it. It really was strange, Naruto was almost 20, so his parents, as they looked here, were only a few years older than him. He and Minato could be brothers. So people tell me, he admitted, his blush not quite dying down as he reached into one of his pockets and threw a Horaishan kunai at his father. The man caught it deftly, barely giving it a glance before smiling proudly at the younger Namikaze. In more ways than one it seems. Naruto felt another upsurge of pride, before something darker settled in his stomach. You guys had no idea how long I've waited for this moment, ever since the first time I realized exactly what you had done with the seal. I, I was saving it, knowing this could only happen once. His parents quickly mirrored his melancholy. I wasn't going to use it so soon, I wanted to wait and make sure I could tell you everything. I could have told you about my wedding, let you know the name of your grandchild. Or grandchildren. I wanted to make sure I had done everything that I could have to make you proud. He nearly flinched as he felt Kushina's smaller hand slip into his own, glancing up into eyes almost identical to his own. 
Naruto. My Naruto, I don't care what you do. I don't care who you chose to love, I don't even care if you didn't become a shinobi. I would always be proud of you. Whether it was today, or decades from now you would still be my little Sochi, and I would cherish this moment just as much. He felt something shift deep inside of him as he griped her hand tightly. I, I don't know how much I deserve that. I came here for a reason, I've never felt so lost in my life and I just didn't know where else to turn. Still, even though he felt exactly that way, one look into his mother's face seemed to put all of that aside for a moment. It was an expression that had lost nothing from nostalgia, it was just the way he remembered, so full of warmth and unconditional love. She gently pulled him to the floor, he hadn't noticed but at some point their surroundings had shifted from the dank room in front of the QB's cage, to a strange, glittering void of floating lights, and, still holding his hand, sat across from him with his father. Tell us about it. So he did. He explained everything he could, from the sealing of the Sanbi, to the theft of the scroll, to the discovery of his sister and the impromptu Jinchuriki ritual. He explained how he thought Tsukaru had been dead this whole time, something that seemed to trouble them deeply, and shared his uncertainty with how to move forward. His parents seemed impressed by his various exploits, but respectfully held their silence until he began to wind down, having vented quite thoroughly. It's just. I've had a whole life to learn everything I need. A lifetime of being a shinobi, with guidance from the right people at the right time. A lifetime coming to terms with the woman I love, and how to go about showing her that. I've even been eased into having a team, learning how to deal with subordinates from Anbu, and children from memories of my own Janan days. Everything came at the proper time. He hung his head slightly. But. I don't know how to be a brother, I feel like that opportunity was stolen from me, and from her. He paused, taking in the thoughtful looks of his parents, at least until his father smiled suddenly and without warning. Naruto. Life just isn't like that. Before the redhead could argue, he carried on in that soft, attention-grabbing tone that had always seen him as the center of any room he was in. I remember when Kushina first told me I was going to be a father. We were both still so young. I was thinking about my career, about where I stood in the world. The war was just winding down and Hiruzen had begun to take personal interest in me, Jiraiya-sensei was hardly subtle with his hinting that I was being groomed for the hat. The blonde leaned back on his hands, staring up at the featureless sky with a strange expression. Then you came along, a little bundle of chaos that seemed purpose-built to throw my life as off-kilter as possible. He glanced down, still smiling. Don't get me wrong, I was thrilled. I had never really had anything like a family before, you know your grandparents passed when I was very young. But that didn't change the fact I felt wholly unprepared for anything like. Well, you. He sighed. What you've told us about Tsukaru. I thought she had died too, but don't let the unexpected situation distract you from the fact that, yes, while an opportunity was taken from you, that doesn't mean the one you have been presented is any less significant. You have your sister back, our daughter is still alive, and while the circumstances aren't ideal. Kushina nodded emphatically. If I wasn't just a chakra imprint, I'd be out there strangling that old one-eyed bastard myself. Minato allowed himself a bemused smile before continuing you can't treat this as anything less than it is. An opportunity to reclaim something you thought you would never have. He shuffled until he was in front of his son, quickly wrapping Naruto in a hug. From everything you've told us so far, I have no doubts you'll handle this as splendidly as you have everything else. He leaned back, propping both hands on Naruto's shoulders. Have faith in yourself Naruto, because we certainly do. When he leaned back he could see he had left the redhead a lot to consider. It's going to be really difficult, isn't it? She'll be like a stranger, with who knows what put in her head about me. I think. I think I'm most afraid that she'll wake up and hate me. I'm not sure if I could deal with that. You will, Kushina reassured him, sharing a nod with her husband. And besides, when has anything worth doing been easy? You think raising a rambunctious kid like you was a walk in the park? That at least earned a chuckle from all three of them. Naruto, she's your sister. There's a connection there no matter how buried it might be. She glanced up briefly and thought. I'll tell you something Mito Bazin once told me. She said, Uzumaki is more than just a name, it's more than just our red hair, or our ability with seals, or our longevity. It's an understanding, that family means more than blood, that it's a connection. She told me that as long as another Uzumaki lived, I would never be alone in anything I did. It got me through a really rough time in my life. I think you told me that story when I was a kid, Naruto mused, almost ponderously. He had forgotten about it, it was so long ago. I, understand, I think. 
it's just so hard sometimes without you guys, there were so many times in my life that I could have used advice like this, and the knowledge that this will really be the last time I see you. He nearly jumped when Kushina put her hands on his. Not the last time. He expression shifted quickly to one of rebuke. But I certainly don't want to see you again any time soon, I want my baby to have a long, happy life so you have so many more stories to tell us when we see you again. She was glad for the weak smile that earned as her voice turned soft again. But in that vein, let's not waste the time we have now. I want to hear everything. She sat back, making a big show of making herself comfy despite the ground having no discernible features. Now, you mentioned grandchildren? Time didn't seem to work properly in whatever pseudo-space they inhabited. His senses told him he had been here for barely a few minutes, and yet they had spent hours now just talking. It still wasn't nearly enough. He had made it through what he considered the most important moments in his life, Anko, Itachi, Shisui, Anbu, his Janan, the war, Haya, his child, becoming Hokage, the various enemies he had made, faced and defeated, and even a brief recap of the situation in Mizu with more emphasis on his worries as the Hokage. In return his parents told him some of the stories they had never managed while they were around, including their individual perspectives on that fateful night. By now he was just regaling his parents with as many anecdotes as he could, training with his first team, moments spent with Anko, particularly noteworthy missions, messing with his students, those rare moments of clarity with Hiruzen. And none of it seemed to be enough. He wanted to tell them everything, to assuage that little voice that told him this was it, this was all the time they had to learn what they could about their son. But the march of time was as inevitable as it was unstoppable. It started out as a vague sensation in the back of his head, and even when it became impossible not to notice he pressed on, ignoring it as long as possible. Eventually though, they too had taken note, glancing down at their bodies with worry. This wasn't what they had been left here for, they were supposed to be emergency fail-safes for the seal, used up mostly in one go. Drawing them out like this, minimizing the limited energy they used up, just prolonged the inevitable. His parents were fading away, the chakra they were composed of slowly burning out. Abruptly, Naruto quietened, not even bothering to finish the story about Shisui managing to get them fireworks that nearly ended with them burning down a training ground. His mother had been clearly amused, but by this point Naruto's heart wasn't in it. Minato and Kushina were semi-transparent now, little more than ghosts clinging on to the few precious seconds they had left. I don't want you to go, the redhead said, barely able to get his voice above a whisper. You knew this was coming son, and even this much was more than most get, Minato informed him, no less saddened by the revelation but putting on the stoicism that had made him so fearsome as a leader. I'm so happy with the man you've grown into, I couldn't have asked for any more, or for a better son, Kushina said, not bothering to hide her emotions as tears streamed down her face. Please, tell Anko that she has our blessing, she sounds like a wonderful young woman. And tell Sukaru that. That her mother loves her. Her father too, Minato added, struggling to keep his features straight now. And let Hiruzen and Jiraiya know, I don't blame them. And you better dote on your child doubly for us. Kushina warbled, trying for a smile but failing somewhere in the attempt. More importantly. Minato started, looking worrying down at his hand as it gently faded away. Remember that. Kushina joined in. We love you, they said together. Naruto leaned forward, to pull them into the last hug he might ever have with his parents, only to stumble forward, with nothing there to catch him. He looked up, but they were gone. When he opened his eyes, he was back in the hospital room, although it was more appropriate to say he had never left. It had felt like hours, and the experience had screwed up his internal clock, but a quick glance at a nearby window told him only a few minutes had passed. It was so surreal, like a twisted genjutsu, but the tears he could feel on his cheeks were all too real. He took a moment to recompose himself, slumping bonelessly into a nearby chair to stare up at the ceiling. His eyes raked over the speckled paint for a few seconds before he breathed out a single, long exhale. The constricting vice that had been tightening around his heart since finding his sister was still there, but it had relaxed tremendously. His parents' words had gone a long way in comforting his more personal anxieties. When he finally stood again, his features were neutral and his head clear for the first time all day. Resolute on the path forward he crossed to the bed lighting his hand up in warm, green chakra. He was no med nin, but he knew enough about battlefield first aid to wake someone up from an induced sleep. Tsunade would rant at him endlessly for this, and he was subverting a few protocols by doing this alone but. It was his sister, he needed to do this now, while it was just the two of them. It took a few moments for her to awake, 
a few more to do so visibly. She didn't start, or look around confusedly, she simply sat up and surveyed the room with a clinical detachment before staring at him emotionlessly, face carefully arranged. Having her stare at him so blankly was off-putting and he lost track of what he had planned to say, instead settling on, do you know where you are? It was disturbing how she made no indication of hearing him, but answered all the same. The Konaha Hospital, Private Ward. She glanced at the window, where the early morning sun made streaks of light through the blinders, room 4E. Her voice was toneless, lacking in inflection. The precision too, it was unsettling, as if she had no understanding of the gravitas of her situation and was used to giving nothing but clean, factual reports her entire life. Naruto had to quickly clamp down on a surge of anger that welled up in him directed at a certain old bastard. And do you know who I am? Again, it didn't even seem like she heard him, no tilt of the head, no blink, no physical tells whatsoever. Of course, Hokage-sama. Strained through the emotionless filter of her voice, the title sounded more like an insult. I'm your brother, Sukaru, he said softly, the first hint of earnest emotion beginning to break through as the full weight of what had been done to his little sister finally began to dawn on him. It's me, Naruto. Finally, the girl moved, tilting her head up ever so slightly so her eyes met his. My name is not Sukaru, my most recent designation was K, and my brother is dead. The stark way she said it, as if stating the sky was blue, or kunai are sharp, threw him completely. Your name is Sukaru Namikaze, why do you think your brother is dead? He had been expecting one answer, so he was not prepared when she intoned, because I killed him. From what we were able to gather, it seems she, and agents like her, are committed to quite a monstrous course of training, Inoiki said solemnly, staring at the passive blonde through the one-way mirror that divided the Spartan interrogation room. I would hesitate to put a lead on Boo through the kinds of things I saw being done to kids in her memories. The specific instance she was referring to though. The Yamanaka patriarch grimaced, it seemed to have been somewhat of a graduation ceremony akin to the old bloody mist, although taken to a grisly extreme. Naruto didn't look at him, he just stared resolutely through the mirror. He hated seeing his sister like this, kept like a criminal, but it stood to reason that until they found out exactly what had been done to her, this was the safest path forward. Don't hesitate for my sake. Inoiki nodded. They seemed to be partnered with another operative at a young age, encouraged to be as close as possible, operating in two-man cells for the duration of the training. A failure by one is seen as a failure for both and, well, the punishments are not light. Under different circumstances I would consider it an effective, if not barbaric, method of promoting exquisite teamwork. Shimura-san, apparently thought otherwise. At the end of their training the. They're pitted against one another in a fight to the death. From what I could surmise it is all in an effort to force a traumatic break on the surviving operative, making them more malleable to certain conditioning. So she was brainwashed, Naruto surmised, his face not betraying the roiling anger that sloshed around inside him. In a sense, but not quite. Brainwashing implies conditioning a subject to act in a way they normally wouldn't. What Donzo did. Well, it's more akin to programming from a blank slate. The operative either suffers from a severe breakdown, after which I can only make educated guesses as to what happens, or they repress their emotions as an extreme coping mechanism. There are other aspects of the training that promote this outcome too, which leads me to believe it was the intended effect. Naruto's lips twisted slightly. Hiruzen told me the main point of contention between him and Danzo was emotion in a shinobi. Hiruzen believed it empowered people, allowed them to go beyond what they were normally capable. Danzo believed it inhibited them, constrained them from their true potential as a weapon. Apparently, he decided that a theoretical debate wasn't enough. If I can be candid? Inoiki broached hesitantly, earning a stiff nod. I've never seen anything quite like this, or... If I can fix this. Naruto rounded on him quite suddenly, forcing him to back up against the wall. My sister isn't something to be fixed. He didn't raise his voice. He didn't have to. And I understand that, but... The words nearly caught in his throat from the look the Hokage gave him this isn't simply a case of reversing psychological damage, this is all she knows. Even if we treated the trauma that caused her to repress her emotions, there is still the fact that all she has known, her entire life, is a brutal regime of training, total subservience to a sociopathic tyrant and a complete disregard for typical human morality. A great deal of the fire drained from Naruto's eyes at the frank summation of the situation, leaving him much more delicate than the Yamanaka had ever seen the vibrant young Hokage. Then we do what we can. For now, I'm releasing her into my custody. 
I have to argue against that Hokage-sama, the first few days could be the most crucial in understanding how to. He trailed off at the glare sent his way. I will be bringing her back here every day, so that you can do what you can in helping her. But she is coming home with me, where she belongs. Inoiki hesitated a moment before nodding. Very well, in which case I need to tell you that it is very important to maintain a comfortable, non-hostile environment around her at all times. Too much stimulus could evoke reactions that I'm currently not prepared to diagnose. Naruto nodded. She's my sister, I would give her nothing less. Not to cause any offense Hokage-sama, I was talking about Anko. The redhead managed a humorless smile. Anything else I should know? Actually, there was one thing. From the examination of the other root agents you brought in we were able to identify a particular seal inscribed on the back of their tongues. He brought out a piece of paper that one of the Anbu more versed in Fuenjutsu had copied the seal onto. Naruto only gave it a brief look. Curse seal, based on the location, probably designed as a kill switch if the operative said the wrong thing. I'd have to examine it to know for sure. Inoiki nodded handing the paper over. We presumed as much. The funny thing is, Sukaru doesn't seem to have one, any thoughts why? Naruto sighed, looking back through the glass at his sister, she hadn't moved so much as an inch. Because an Uzumaki is too valuable to waste, we're perfect Jinchuriki hosts. Even saying it left a bitter taste in his mouth, as if you could measure the intrinsic worth of somebody based on such arbitrary characteristics. Inoiki seemed to share his opinion, clearly thinking of the agent that had been revealed as a Yamanaka previously thought dead. We still have a few tests to run, but we should be able to release her to your custody tonight. I'm not sure if you want to. I'll wait, Naruto preempted without hesitation. Well, in that case. Ino-chan. Daddy, the girl whined as she poked her head around the door, I asked you not to call me that while I'm working. Sorry honey, I need you to show the Hokage to the waiting room. Ino started at the realization she was in front of the village's leader, but recovered admirably. Of course, this way Hokage-sama. Despite the circumstances and the matters weighing on his mind, Naruto was who he was and couldn't help but smile at the sight of a father intentionally messing with their kid. He briefly wondered what his own team were doing at the moment as he was lead through the T and I complex. It was a surprisingly nice building for what went on inside, all pastel walls and nicely carpeted floors. Eventually Ino lead him to a pleasant room with a few comfy couches and a counter along one wall that held plates of food and a coffee maker. He only realized the silence had dragged on a little too long when he noticed Ino shuffle awkwardly on the spot. So, you're working here now? He clearly wasn't at his best if that was all he could come up with. He remembered Field promoting the girl to Chunin a few months before and it wasn't uncommon for children to follow their parents' careers once they'd graduated past Janan. Shadowing my dad, yeah, Ino replied brightly, taking the conversation like it was a life preserver. I would prefer to go more into therapy, you know, helping people. But, but the best study for psychology is in T and I, he filled in for her. Right, it's a lot more, uh, hands-on than I thought it would be, but I'm learning a lot. That's good. And Naruto meant it, the genuine enjoyment he could see from Ino when she talked about her work was strangely soothing. It was nice to just have a banal conversation after having his world appended. Seeing a pretty girl smile was a nice bonus, although she was a bit young for his tastes. You know, she started, you're nothing like Sakura describes you, I thought you'd be a lot more. I don't know, intimidating? The redhead gave a weary smile. I try to save that for the people who deserve it. It's nice, she amended quickly, clearly conscious of offending him, I mean, growing up with Sandaime-sama, you start to see the post of Hokage as. Kind of unattainable. He was always the impossibly wise old man that would visit the academy, always knowing just what to say. Seeing somebody so. She was good at hiding her emotions, her father's work no doubt, but she couldn't disguise the faint hint of red that entered her cheeks young, as the Hokage. It's encouraging, like the bar isn't so high, you know? I've never really thought about it, the job sort of snuck up on me. Really? The blonde seemed genuinely taken aback. But you're Naruto Namikaze. Last time I checked, he quipped with a wan smile. Sorry, she quickly backpaddled, visibly abashed, but when you meet somebody so famous, you just don't expect them to be so. So. Human? He offered, thinking back to the first time he had met Jiraiya and how quickly the well of respect for the man's sealing abilities had evaporated. Yeah. She finished a little lamely. At the same time though, I suppose it is kind of intimidating. When the teams were announced. 
she looked up as if just realizing how long ago that was, nearly making him chuckle, she should wait until she was his age I made it a priority to know who everybody's sensei were. The more I found out about you, well, sort of brings your own achievements into question, doesn't it? As her. As the son Daime keeps reminding me, I'm a product of a slightly different time. The more I'm reminded, the more I think you guys are better off. He smiled. He has a way of doing that. Ino mirrored his expression. That's more like what Sakura said you were like. The redhead sank onto one of the couches, motioning for her to sit opposite him. The girl clearly considered the offer, glancing towards the door and weighing up whether she should get back to work. But then, how often does the Hokage invite you for a private chat? Ignoring his outstretched hand, she cheerfully settled in next to him, at a respectable distance, she knew he was engaged after all. Slightly bemused, Naruto wasn't put off at all. So, what do my cute little students say about me? When Inoiki came to get them, nearly an hour later, Naruto was a great deal more relaxed, laughing and talking with Ino easily over aimless little things that had completely put his mind off the pressures mounting on his shoulders. He could definitely see why she wanted to go into therapy. Even when Inoiki cleared his throat, reminding Naruto of what he had to do, his grin only faded into a small, resigned smile. Thanks Ino, it's been very nice talking with you. No problem Naruto-sensei. Oh, when your sister recovers I'd love to come visit some time, help her get acclimatized with some things, you know, girl stuff. The redhead nodded, he had gotten a good feel for the girl over the time they had spent talking and could tell the offer was sincere. I think that would be nice. She waved brightly as Inoiki led him out and back through the complex to a different, smaller waiting room. Each footstep seemed to pull at Naruto's regained good mood until the uncomfortable weight settled in his stomach once again. It only worsened when he rounded the corner and saw his sister sat there, perfectly still with her hands folded over her lap. Come on Sukaru, it's time to go home. Chapter 46, Official Adjustments Sukaru stared at the small, framed photo without so much as a flicker of emotion passing across her features. It was, as far as anybody was aware, the only picture of her that existed. It showed Minato and Kushina smiling brightly at the camera, Naruto peeking up from above their shoulders from where he was perched on his father's back. What she was staring at however, was the lump of Kushina's stomach that was just pronounced enough to be noticeable. I remember that day, Naruto said, voice subdued. It was the day our parents told me that I was going to have a sister. I didn't understand of course, for the longest time I thought you were going to be a fox and we were just getting a pet. I got a lot of mixed signals back then from mom being a Jinchuriki but I remember being really happy with the idea. He screwed up his eyes for a moment, trying to throw his mind back to when he was that young, it was difficult. I remember thinking that it would be a lot of fun to boss you around, he mused, lips quirking up at the edges. I think I was going to teach you some tricks. By the time I figured out what having a sister actually meant. Actually, I don't think my ideas changed all that much. Funny how that works, me being the Hokage and you technically a shinobi under my command. He looked down, but she didn't so much as move through his entire speech. If I understand correctly, you are trying to form some empathetic bond with me, yes? She could see him try to repress the wince, he did that quite often when she spoke. Such poor control of one's reactions would have been harshly punished in root. I'm not trying Sukaru, you're my sister. We're family. That is the part I do not understand. What does us being biologically related have to do with any affectations or special considerations? Our relationship as I understand it is that you are my Hokage, and I am your tool. All of this. She glanced down at the picture again, something uncomfortable rising in the back of her mind all of this, seems unnecessary. You're only saying that because you don't know any better. You are saying I am deficient in some manner? No. Naruto was in front of her in a flash, kneeling and holding her hands, she showed no response to the act, not even trying to pull her hands away. I don't think that at all but what Donzo's done to you? It shouldn't have been this way. You were supposed to grow up with me, make friends, have a family. I was instructed that dwelling on alternative possibilities to unaccountable situations was inefficient and detrimental to subsequent mission success. Naruto sighed as he straightened up, taking the place on the couch next to her and pulling her gently into his side. In a way, you're right. Sukaru wasn't sure what to make of the situation, nothing in her training had ever prepared her for this. However, when that strange fluttering feeling rose in her stomach again, seemingly a reaction to the warmth of the body next to her, she knew to crush it down. That was always the response, feeling was weakness, emotion a distraction. 
her training hadn't been put to such extensive use since she had put a sword through the boy that had truly been her brother. All right Sukaru, we're going to run through a different scenario now. This was the third Yamanaka she had been introduced to, Inoiki only seemed to supervise her sessions, likely doing much of the planning before handing it off to another member of his family. Sukaru didn't see much in the point of it, the questions were always inane. The frustrating part, that was the label they had given the irritating sensation when it cropped up, was that despite her perfectly logical answers they always disagreed with her. That was another one, disappointment. She knew of the emotions and their effects in a purely academic sense, they were important to recognize in others, putting a name to them when she was apparently feeling them though? That was something else. Very well. All right. You're in a shop, buying food and you've noticed the clerk is overcharging you. What do you do? Sukaru kept her face restrained, but could feel the first flutters of irritation. It was like a phantom burn at the back of her mouth, that was how she remembered it. What was the purpose of this? In root rations had always been provided as needed, it was a much more effective system than acquiring the food for oneself. She settled her thoughts and instead pretended she was on a mission, strange occurrences often happened on missions. I presume I do not have the money to afford the overpriced food? She found that offering counter questions often seemed to improve the mood of the interviewer, they called themselves a therapist but she remained unconvinced this wasn't some elaborate form of interrogation. She personally believed Root's methods to be far more succinct and effective. Let's say you have the money. Then I accept the overpricing, as long as I obtain the food then there is little other purpose in holding excess money. There it was, the man often kept his expression schooled into a serene smile, but the slight downward cast of his eyes was indicative of a wrong answer. But what if you wanted to spend the money on something else? Such as? She couldn't think of what else money might acquire her. Although, applying the logic that they expected her to purchase food, it stood to reason all of her equipment would be self-funded. However, she knew for a fact that kunai and standard mission were were provided to regular shinobi based on the mission parameters. By definition anything purchased that is not an amenity would be a luxury and is therefore extraneous. The man didn't sigh, the first one had done that a lot, but they had rotated him out. She knew the signs though, for all they thought her emotionally stunted, she could recognize the subtle shifts in their body language. Let's say you don't have the money then. Anko cursed lightly as she crested the bottom of the stairs, she used to have great fun bounding down them or occasionally sliding down the banisters. Nowadays she was lucky if she could make it down one flight without her ankle swelling up, her back throwing a tantrum and feeling generally nauseous. She was still excited about having a kid, but damn would the little brat have some making up to do for the hell she was going through. One of the few upsides of all this was having a partner that could teleport. Honestly, even she was disgusted by some of the odd cravings she'd been having but having somebody who could effectively go anywhere in the country to pick up whatever she needed was a blessing. Right now, she was desperately hankering for some melon, after basically a lifetime of barely touching the fruit. It was often disconcerting how much her hormones seemed able to influence her decisions. She paused in the living room, observing the thatch of messy blonde hair poking up over the back of the couch. She tried her best to be tolerant of Naruto's little sister, she was as supportive as possible over all this, still able to remember a time when the loss had been a fresh wound to the redhead. She couldn't deny though, that she found the girl's tacit lack of outward emotion more than a little creepy. She sighed, Naruto clearly wanted to be there for his sister as much as possible, but he was still the Hokage and couldn't spend too much time away from the office. That left Sukaru alone much of the day, she mostly pottered around the house aimlessly. Often though, she just sat there on the couch, hands folded over each other as she stared at a wall. It could be mistaken for meditation, but Anko knew what meditation looked like. Sukaru just sat there, doing nothing. Never thought about getting a hobby? She asked, unsurprised when Sukaru didn't seem startled by her presence. The creak of her coming down the stairs was enough of a giveaway. What do you mean? She waddled around the couch, settling into the big plush chair that had increasingly become her happy place over the past few months. You know, something to do during the day when you can't be around other people. I've been prohibited from training until my evaluations are complete. She rolled her eyes, it was difficult to remember that, for all Sukaru had been taught, and her education had been extensive, it was a very directed, education, prone to gaps that others took for granted. Training isn't a hobby. Unless your name was Mike Guy, but she left that part out. Hobbies are. She blinked, actually drawing a blank on the best way to explain. Hobbies are a way to blow off steam when other aspects of your life become too stressful. Operatives are encouraged to engage in physical activity when unduly stressed. 
and you're back to training. You've got the wrong end of the stick kid, hobbies aren't something to do towards any specific goal, it's something you do for the pleasure of doing it. I assume you do not mean the generic satisfaction of completing an assigned task, such as becoming competent in a new technique. No, I mean actual pleasure. For instance, I enjoy a good tea ceremony, and have spent a lot of time learning how to perform many varieties. I do this because it's relaxing, not because I'd get any particular utility out of it. I can think of many useful skills the knowledge of tea ceremonies provides. Anko clicked her tongue irritably. How can I put this in a way you understand? Her fingers drummed a rhythmic beat on the armrest. I assume they made you pretty good with kunai and root? All operatives were required to have adequate skill with a number of different weapons, I personally had exceptional skill and accuracy with shuriken jutsu. See, now if I didn't know you any better, I'd assume that was a hint of pride poking out of your mask. Sukaru said nothing to this, just staring at her blankly. Right, so you can hit a target, that's a useful skill. Do me a favor and grab some of those rubber balls Naruto keeps in his study. I was specifically instructed that the study was off limits, I cannot disobey an order from the Hokage, it breaks the chain of command. Anko grinned, hauling herself off the chair only to plop down next to the girl, wrapping an arm around her shoulders. But you're his little sister, and little sisters always disobey their big brothers, he wants you to be his little sister a lot more than he wants to be your Hokage, right? Sukaru just nodded. He has made that very clear. Good, then go get the balls. The slightest crease appeared in Sukaru's brow, the closest she came to showing anything. After a moment's thought she stood and hurried up the stairs, returning moments later with a box of rubber balls. This feels irregular. That's the spirit. Now, watch me closely. She grunted slightly as she leaned forward to pick three balls out of the box, saying, can you see the utility in this? As she began juggling the balls with adroit skill. Sukaru watched carefully as the balls exchanged hands, moving up and down as Anko played with the throwing height. I can see how the exercise would improve hand-eye coordination and dexterity. You're thinking too mechanically, can you see any inherent use in the act itself? No, it seems to be a pointless display of a debatably useless skill. Good, Anko chirped happily, suddenly redirecting the balls and forcing Sukaru to catch them awkwardly. Now you try. Sukaru stared at her skeptically which was more of an expression than she usually had. And this is a hobby? The woman shrugged. Hobbies are usually extensions of a pre-existing skill or interest that, in of themselves, don't serve any inherent point other than to improve the skill. You're good at throwing kunai, ergo, you should be pretty good with juggling. The blonde looked back down at the balls and tried to copy Anko's movements, only serving to quickly scatter the balls around the room and earn a laugh from the older woman. She wasn't sure what the feeling was that flamed up inside her, but for once she didn't clamp down on it, it felt. Appropriate. Her eyes narrowed imperceptibly as she pulled three more balls from the box, trying it again. This time she managed to catch the balls again, but forgot to continue the maneuver. After a few more attempts she was quite casually juggling all three balls in exactly the manner Anko had shown. A very different feeling resulted from that, a buoyant, bubbly sort of thing. That one's called pride, Anko noted with a small smile. Sukaru hadn't even noticed the tiny smile she now wore as she ably threw and caught the balls in their rhythmic pattern. Is that the purpose of hobbies? To conflate a simplistic, repetitive task with a system of personal reward? Her tone might have been edging on curious. In part, Anko agreed, pulling another ball out of the box with a grin and throwing at the girl, immediately destroying her rhythm. That felt unnecessarily disruptive. If that's your way of saying you find me annoying, you are learning, Anko shot back, motioning for the girl to pick up the balls. Now do it with four. When Naruto came home a few hours later, not a moment later than he could, he found a curious sight waiting for him. Sukaru was stood in the middle of the living room, couches and table pushed towards the walls, surrounded by the rubber balls he used to train the Rasengan. Her face was set into a mask of concentration as she carefully balanced the juggling of five balls at once. Her eyes tracked rapidly in time with her hands until she threw one a little too high and upset the balance. She caught four of them but the Fitch bounced off at brothers and went careening off to the other side of the room. For a brief moment Sukaru's eyes narrowed in the closest approximation of irritation he had seen from her, before she picked up another ball and returned to her task. She didn't even acknowledge his entrance with a clipped Hokage-sama as she normally did. What's going on? He asked, unsure whether to be happy or bemused at the apparent show of normality. I have. A hobby, 
Sukaru stated in her factual tone, careful to keep her attention on the balls. It serves. No purpose. I can see that, he mused. You're very good. Sukaru chose that moment to lose control again, this time not with irritation, but apparent surprise. He could only assume as much from the ever so slight widening of her eyes and separation of her lips before she reschooled her features. Allah, let you keep it at then, he muttered, moving past her towards the kitchen, where Anko stood in the doorway wearing a wry smile. Her good mood could be equally attributed to the bowl of raw cookie dough she was eating. You're doing, I take it? Pfft, those boffins at tea and I may be good at messing with people's heads, but I think they're missing a trick with her. They're trying to rehabilitate something she never had in the first place, she just needs time to discover all of the things she might have had. She looked up and planted a quick, sugary kiss on his lips. Who understands being childish better than me? Can't argue with that, Naruto replied, turning to look back at his sister with a fond smile. He jerked in place a moment later, suddenly rushing towards the stairs. Where are you going? Anko called after him. Are you kidding? I'm getting the camera. Sukaru tried to maintain a light, airy smile as she walked through the village. It didn't match her inward feelings in the slightest, but she had been recommended by her therapist, not that she openly used the term, to try emoting a bit more. In her experience though, people seemed to dislike it when she walked around scowling from her irritation. It really was rather backwards in her opinion, they wanted her to show her emotions, which was the reverse of everything she had been taught growing up, but people clearly didn't like seeing the negative ones. So, a slightly forced smile it was. She was somewhat proud of it. At least, she thought she was. Nailing down the specifics of her feelings when they came at her erratically was still difficult. But she had practiced this smile in the mirror over the past few weeks and she figured she had it down pat. People certainly seemed more accepting of her occasional slips when she smiled at them. Although occasionally it landed her in situations such as this one. Social events still perplexed her, even after three months in her brother's, still a concept she was coming to terms with, care. So, when a few girls her age, apparently all of them familiar with Naruto in some way or another, asked her to come out with them, she wasn't sure what to expect. Shopping for clothes, and all of the banal frivolity that came with it, was not on her list. Oh, she knew it was an expected activity for teenagers, Anko had been providing her with all sorts of books that covered it in detail, she just never expected to engage with it herself. She had a perfectly functional set of clothes, and her brother had provided more whenever she asked. Going out and getting them herself, while also having to pander to the excessively obnoxious whims of the other girls, just seemed pointless. Or perhaps she was just annoyed because they had interrupted her drawing. When he calmed down from his excitement over her juggling, Naruto was beyond enthused to introduce her to a whole swathe of potential hobbies. Few captured her in the way the juggling had, she was now up to nine balls, and nearly that many in kunai, but she found something interesting about sketching. The complex relationship between capturing an object with her eye, and transferring it to the page just appealed to her, somehow. She now had almost an entire sketchbook that seemed to show a sort of condensed time-lapse of a normal artist's career. She already had the excellent hand-eye coordination, so it was more about the various techniques that best translated what she saw, into what she drew. She especially liked birds, they had just an interesting shape and their feathers presented the latest challenge in layering her shading so that. You're doing it again Sukaru, a voice to her right suddenly cut into her thoughts. If you keep spacing out like that, you'll walk into a wall. The blonde didn't bother turning to face the purple-haired girl, easily the most annoying of the trio in her opinion if for no other reason than she talked the most. It's unlikely that I will walk into a wall. It's common root procedure to learn to navigate changing environs with a blindfold. If anything, the manner in which you turn to talk to me will see you falling prey to such an incident. Wow, if you didn't say it in such deadpan, I'd almost take that as a comeback, Emmy said, taking the apparent jibe in good humor. She's right you know, Eno spoke up, wearing a smirk as easily as some might a scarf, I'm surprised you haven't tripped over your own feet or that ridiculous sword already. It's not ridiculous, it's my sister's, she answered defensively, I just haven't quite grown into it yet is all although she was noticeably more conscious of her own feet as the quartet maneuvered through the bustling crowd. You never did say why you switched, Sakura added. I thought your old sword was fine. It was more of a practice sword, too light for the style I use now. Better to adapt to a heavy sword you can grow into, than using a succession of swords that quickly become too light. That is indeed how operatives are encouraged to train en route, Sukaru agreed. She found that if she occasionally added to the conversation, no matter how banal or redundant, 
people harassed her less to engage more deeply. See, she gets it. Well sorry if Sakura and I aren't clued into the mysterious world of Kenjutsu, we have more interesting pursuits than swinging a metal bar around. We'll see how interesting my metal bar is when it's embedded between those precious lumps of yours. As Ino instinctively brought her arms up to her chest, scandalized, Sukaru watched the interaction with mild interest. She had come to the understanding that these three were friends in the operative sense, a concept that had been translated to her in the terms of teammates you have outside of missions. However, between their instigating remarks, vocal disdain of one another and general lack of cohesion that would be fatal on a mission, she could see no truth to this. Their obsession with their appearances was also absurd. They each had the lean, lightly muscled figures born of their profession, modified only by genetic factors such as height and metabolism. In absence of strong differences in that regard it seemed breast size was their preferred method of differentiation. Sukaru herself had taken to the practice of binding her chest when they had grown large enough to start impeding her maneuverability even slightly. On the other hand, she understood the technical advantages to the kind of figure Ino had, that was more reliably attractive in a seduction role. It all seemed so pointless. So Sukaru, have you spotted anything you like yet? Ino asked suddenly enough, that Emi very nearly did trip over her feet at the sudden turn. I still don't quite understand which aspects of the clothing aesthetics I am supposed to prefer. The color seems arbitrary, and when I try to argue for utility I am told those choices are drab for whatever reason. She mimed the quotation marks as she had seen some people do to emphasize points. She was still working on the subtler intonations that were slowly being drilled into her. Ino clicked her tongue and rolled her eyes lazily. It's not about which clothes you're supposed to prefer, you just choose whichever you like, or would look cute. That term seems entirely subjective from the many sources I've gathered. Tell me about it, Sakura chimed in with a purposefully insightful smirk. Have you seen Ino's choice in clothes? As if you could talk forehead, you wear that white circle so much I swear you're trying to create some kind of Haruno crest, the blonde shot back acerbically, suddenly rounding on M.E. And what's wrong with what I wear? Hey, the violet squeaked, don't look at me, I can't exactly comment on the skimpy fishnets aesthetic. Ino simply rounded on her friend victoriously. See? You're outnumbered here Sakura. Oh please, all of Amy's fashion choices were dictated by Sensei's fiancé, that doesn't count. And if you really want to lump yourself in with her, be my guest. Don't insult Anko Shisho. How would you like it if I made fun of the pair of tits that calls itself your boss? I'd damn well like to see you try, I'm curious what color you'd make as a smear on the wall. The bickering girls pulled ahead slightly as Eno watched her careful handiwork in action like a proud, manipulative mother. Why do you play them against one another like that? Sukaru asked, not accusingly, just curious. Because it's funny, Eno replied easily, flicking her hair back over her shoulder with a little playful smile. Of the many people Sukaru had been forced to become acquainted with since the dissolution of Root, Eno was one of the hardest to understand. She controlled her features as well as any Root agent, but used it to display emotion, rather than suppress it. It made for a fascinating case study for how people expected her to act. I thought you were supposed to be friends. The platinum blonde just gave her a bemused little smile. What are you talking about, we are friends. Sakura is my best friend and Emi is always fun to hang out with. Then why purposefully use their insecurities to cause undue friction within the social circle? Ino didn't seem phased by the frank question. Why do friendly shinobi spar with one another? Practice. Friends banner like this because it forces our minds to be quick and it creates a non-hostile environment of competition. When Ino talked like this she sounded a great deal like Sukaru's various Yamanaka counselors, and she suspected this was purely for her benefit. You told me about your hobbies remember? It's kind of the same, we can derive harmless satisfaction from winning at this verbal sparring, with the shared understanding that we don't particularly mean what we say. Although splicing in an element of truth always adds to the fun. She gave the shorter blonde a sly wink. But that's reserved for the advanced players. Sukaru figured that as long as Ino was behaving like a therapist, she could treat her like one. I still don't understand the purpose of these social outings though, if the only purpose is competitive satisfaction, wouldn't your times be better served engaging and practicing a hobby to the same end? Ino nodded patiently. It's not just about that, people naturally fall into friendships out of a shared desire for companionship. Engaging with trusted individuals is extremely important for the psyche as it provides outlets for anxieties against a reliably frank and honest source. It depends on the kind of person you are, but that's somewhat of a heated topic of debate in my family. My dad has a lot of theories about categorizing personality types. 
But then, how can you be certain a person can be trusted? That was something Sukaru had never been prepared for, the very basis of her training was the core idea that nobody could be trusted, not even other root agents. That mutual understanding kept them all in check and as mission efficient as possible. In short, you really can't. But basic social reciprocity creates a sort of safety net. The more good you do for somebody else, so, the kinder you are to people, the more likely it is they will return the favor, on the then assumed basis that you will, in turn, return the favor and continue the cycle. It's one great big, enormously complex goodwill system. A kind of selfish selflessness, in the more cynical manner of looking at things. I'm a bit of realist myself, but I like to think there's some inherent good in most people. Even if certain slackers strain my personal goodwill. Sounds. Difficult. At that at least, Eno allowed the girl a more sympathetic look. Most people don't exactly have your handicap, they learn it instinctively via their upbringing. But that doesn't mean it's impossible to teach, an important anchor for you is your brother. Hell, I don't know the Hokage very well, but I know for a fact that he loves you. Let him, and I think you'll begin to understand what I'm talking about. Sukaru looked down thoughtfully at that. Thank you for being frank with me, others are rarely so candid. Again, Ino gave a careless shrug. It comes with being from a family of mind readers, you pick up the specific methods you need to get through to different people. Her expression expertly transitioned into a sly grin. Consider it a warning, I won't be pulling my punches anymore, so I advise you to learn fast if you want to keep up. Sukaru just nodded, feeling that competitiveness she had first learned with those juggling balls. I think I understand. She looked forward and called out to the bickering girls ahead of them. M.E., your hair is inappropriately long and will inevitably act as a liability in a fight. It is also a silly color. All three of the other girls paused in total silence, each of them turning to stare at Sukaru. She just about managed not to balk under the sudden scrutiny until Ino chimed in, you heard the girl, that mop's going to be some guy's handhold one day. Faced with the more familiar aggressor Emmy reverted to a scowl. Yeah, you'd know all about that, wouldn't you Eno? Well, if you can't handle my hairstyle maybe you should copy your mentor more than you already do and go for the full pineapple. I bet Shikamaru would be happy to induct you into the club, Sakura couldn't resist adding, earning a laugh from all three girls and a perplexed look from Sukaru as the conversation turned to considerably lighter and less inflammatory topics. Ino gave her a little nudge from the side and a conspiratorial smile. You'll get the hang of it eventually. It would only be later, when she was thinking back on the events, that Sukaru would realize she hadn't had to force herself to smile. Naruto scrutinized the papers in front of him with a meticulous eye he usually reserved for experimental seal designs, the kind he couldn't afford to make a mistake with. Whoever was writing up May's trade agreements was a tricky bastard with their wording. Already he had found three potential loopholes to various clauses that he would have to amend to make sure Kiri didn't accidentally gain exclusive rights to the waters around Wave Country. He would be handing over his notes to Hiruzen later all the same, the man could spot legal meandering a mile away, but he still wanted to try this himself first. He couldn't lean on the Sandaime forever. The man was already winding down his role in the running of things, enjoying longer, more relaxing days with his family that he so desperately deserved. The man had even taken up painting, although Naruto was loath to admit that he wasn't terribly good at it. Who was he to fault a man the small comforts in his twilight years? Mostly he was just happy to see the man playing with his grandson, before Konohamaru became a Janan and went through the inevitable stage of being too mature for his Gigi. He glanced up briefly when he heard Sukaru come back from her outing with the girls. He couldn't thank them enough for being so patient with his sister, just another way he could always count on his cute little students. He returned to his work, cursing under his breath when he realized he had lost his place. He had only found the right line again when Sukaru sat down next to him on the couch, stealing his concentration again. Sukaru never sat next to anyone, always preferring her own solace when she could. Hey, you okay? She nodded slowly, and he was a little surprised to see her fidgeting slightly, she usually had more control than that. Before he could wonder what had her so rattled she leant forward rather suddenly and awkwardly put her arms on either side of him. He froze, his next words catching in his throat as, slowly, almost robotically, she gave him a hug. He was too astonished to even return it, just sitting there, wide-eyed. I am. Unsure how long a hug is supposed to last, a slightly muffled voice emerged from his chest, shocking him out of his stupor. Immediately he leaned back against her, shakily, as if the wrong move could scare her away, and returned the gesture. I'll. I'll let you know. Chapter 47. Official Incursions. 
observing the clash of personalities between Haya and Sukaru had quickly become the highlight of Naruto's day. His little sister had been making strides in learning the various social cues necessary to interact with normal people. However, she tended to retreat in on herself when presented with something unfamiliar or uncomfortable. Haya was most certainly one of those things. The silver bundle of pure energy had long put the business of her clan behind her in favor of awe at her new sister figure. The very fact that Tsukaru seemed so withdrawn, in stark contrast to most of the female figures in her life, only seemed to encourage her. Sneaking up on the blonde had turned into her new favorite pastime when the older Namikaze wasn't around, although the first time she did this hadn't been so humorous, as it was a potentially lethal incident. Tsukaru still had some difficulty not equating surprises with ambushes. Still, it was worth all the awkwardness to watch Haya zip around the room, pelting the former root nin with peas launched from a spoon. The look of sheer concentration, occasionally marred by exclamations of childish frustration as Sukaru easily slapped the makeshift projectiles away from her without looking up from her reading, was priceless. Anko had taken to subtly helping the girl, maneuvering Sukaru into situations where her concentration was split before releasing the little demon on her. The house hadn't felt so alive in months. Naruto's hand whipped out, catching a deflected pea just in time to stop it ricocheting of an Anbu's mask. Morning Tora. He couldn't gauge the man's reaction from behind the mask, but the slight clearing of his throat told him enough to make him smile. Sir, the alarms in Tunnel 5 have been triggered. The good humor immediately drained from Naruto's face. Right, get the teams in position as planned. The Anbu touched his chest in silent acknowledgement of the order before vanishing as suddenly as he had arrived. The red-haired Hokage drummed his fingers along his thigh for a moment, catching the look Anko was giving him from across the room. She mouthed Donzo? Questioningly, suppressing a frown when he nodded back. After a moment though she gave a small smile of encouragement, conveying with her eyes alone that she would watch the girls while he was gone. With a final smile of, thanks Naruto mimed her a cheeky kiss before vanishing from the house. Thankfully the girls were too engrossed with their vegetable-themed conflict to notice. Out on the rooftops he could already see the signs of his orders being carried out. The civilians, and even most of the shinobi, wouldn't notice anything different, but there was a certain flow to the movement of the Anbu flitting across the rooftops. The quiet repositioning of key shinobi was supposed to be low-key, it was a dangerous tactician they were dealing with. Still, Naruto couldn't fight back the satisfied smirk as Danzo rose to his bait. The man clearly thought himself above the Hokage, but pride was a vice that Naruto intended to punish the man for. The days following Sukaru's rescue had been an embarrassment for the black ops as the extent of Danzo's operation had been revealed. Miles of underground tunnels and bunkers, rivaling the civilian shelter system itself. The fact that all of this had been happening literally under their noses, for who knew how long, was like a punch in the gut to anybody who presided over the village's safety. The survey of the complex had been thorough, with every nook and cranny scoured for any hint of where Donzo may have gone, and just what he was doing down there. The answers, mostly, were unsatisfying. The old politician had covered his tracks well. However, Naruto knew from experience that no contingency was perfect, and if he left the man an in to finish the job, he was bound to snatch the chance. While the Anbu searched the complex from within, Naruto called in a favor to have the facilities searched from above with the Byakugan. The Dujutsu usually wasn't too good at seeing through a certain thickness of earth, but that could be compensated if the user knew what to look for. A few of the more secretive escape tunnels, and what a security nightmare those were, had been located by the Hayuga, and purposefully ignored by the Anbu. Danzo, or one of his agents, had just strolled right into one of them as if he owned the place, and Naruto was going to let him know just how big of a bear trap he had stepped in. Already Anbu were shifting about, relieving those whose skill sets were more inclined towards capture so they could flood the complex. Really, the man had been so overconfident with his special ward system that could counter the Hiraishin. A better Fuinjutsu user would have known to layer their defenses, instead of trying to weave them into a single, more complex matrix. It was certainly stronger, but far less secure. Once Naruto had access to even a small part of the seal, he had access to all of it. Currently the silent alarms that should have been going off with the intrusion of that many Anbu were deactivated, as were the Hiraishin blockers. As if to prove as much, he suddenly appeared alongside a small group of Anbu headed by Komachi, racing through the tunnels to their designated staging ground. No words had to be spoken and they were completely nonplussed by his appearance, simply carrying on until they were in their designated positions. They waited there, each second seeming to stretch on endlessly, until Naruto received the signal that everyone was in position. He made a simple motion with his hand before straightening, 
taking a moment to set his features into a congenial smile, and walking around the corner. Evening Donzo. The figure sedately making their way through the streets was distinctive in their almost single-minded path towards the center of the village. The Anbu had flagged them quickly, although none could explain or account for where the person had come from. In their simple dark robe and wide-brim sujgasa, their figure and any other discernible features were indistinct. Despite their innocuous appearance, even the surrounding civilians parted for them, feeling the indistinct weight of the figure's movements. Anbu didn't interact with the citizenry as a rule, so it was with curiosity that they watched a nearby Jounin meander his way over. The figure didn't seem inclined to stop for him until he purposefully cleared his throat. Can I help you? He tried to peer under the hat, but the figure's long hair and effeminate features were obscured by the tassels dangling from the edge, he couldn't make out much about their appearance. You will move out of my path. The voice didn't help much either, it was monotone and completely androgynous, if a bit on the deeper side. The Jounin frowned lightly, but tried to keep his face jovial it didn't do to upset the civilians if a situation was brewing. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to step to the side for a moment for a quick chat, all right? The reaction from the root operatives Donzo had brought with him was predictable to the point of banality. Two immediately rushed the threat while one dropped back to cover Donzo's escape back down the tunnel. Naruto didn't even have to move as the first was neatly dispatched by a flurry of electrified senbone, dropping him to a twitching mess on the floor. The second learned nothing from his partner's fate and began rushing through hand seals. The moment his hands came up though, a thin strip of earth whipped out of the ground, wrapping around the operative's wrists before suddenly yanking him back down to the stone floor. His mask was shattered by the impact, revealing the face of an unconscious young teen with mousy hair. The last of the operatives, at least in this room, if the other Anbu had done their jobs, the rest were being systematically captured throughout the rest of the complex, was brought up short when the walls suddenly sprouted wooden limbs, reaching out to tangle him up. Tenzo sprouted out of a thick bough like a flower a moment later, promptly knocking the root nin out before he could activate the seal on his tongue. All of this had happened seamlessly without Naruto having to lift a finger. That's better don't you think? He asked the man who was only no turned around to face him again, features seemingly nonplussed. A bit more conducive to a conversation. It seems you have been more successful than I had estimated in getting young Sukaru to reveal Root's operating procedures, Donzo mused calmly. I assume then, you also know that I can activate every operative suicide seal with a moment's thought? Naruto just grinned. Oh, please go ahead, I'm actually quite curious about which is faster. Your thoughts? He idly flipped a kunai produced from thin air between his hands or my hand? Donzo gave him a disdainful look down his nose, but his silence was telling. So, about that talk? The Anbu on the roof tensed slightly as the figure in the middle of the road continued to remain put. The civilians were beginning to notice the brewing situation, a few subtly moving into side streets, and a circle had begun to open around the stranger and the Jounin. Please, I must insist you step to the side of the street for a moment, you are causing a disturbance. The figure merely glanced about, ignoring the ninja and instead taking in the nervous glances of the people around them. Even here, the people know when they are in a greater presence. There was no visible sign of it, but the stranger seemed to affirm something in their head. This is far enough then. By now the Jounin was visibly tense, hands straying to his kunai pouch as even more citizens got the message and began to stream away from the potential fight. Did you just think you would get away with it? All these kids you've stolen from their families? Naruto's tone was conversational but his eyes were cold as he glared at the man. He had wanted to control himself a bit more, to play this out a bit. Looking at Donzo though, it brought back that surging anger he had felt upon first seeing his sister in full. It was all he could do not to just end the man where he stood. You are such a disappointment, Donzo said slowly, eyeing up the redhead as if he had all the time in the world. Your father, while idealistic and naive, was an apparition to our nation's enemies, a bulwark against the thought of attack. The man grimaced. Face Konoha, and you face the yellow flash. I thought this might lead to a generation of weakened, reliant shinobi, but then came you. You, Itachi and Shisui, such promising talent all too quickly taken under the wing of Hiruzen's damnable ideals. Is this spiel going anywhere or? Donzo ignored him, straightening as though he were giving one of his speeches to the Shinobi Council. I had maintained hope you three would prove me wrong, that, outside of my influence, others might come to understand the necessities of our work. Something that might have passed for wistfulness drifted across the old man's face. The roots, feeding the leaves. But no. When Shisui proved difficult and Itachi too patriotic. Naruto's eyes narrowed a fraction I was left with you. 
I'm quite fond of the arrangement myself, he quipped, more by reflex than anything else. You have your mother's wit, if nobody has ever told you that before, Donzo continued, lip twitching with disdain. Another promising asset so uselessly wasted, but Mito always was a political player of unequaled skill. No, I knew that if I wanted a Uzumaki, there was only one way. I don't believe I was the only one to benefit from the QB attack, but when Shinobi can't make the best out of a crisis, we are hardly fitting of the name. By now Naruto's hand was itching to launch the kunai into the man's throat, cut off his monologuing the old-fashioned way. Those who endure. Again, that strange melancholic expression twisted his features perhaps the only thing Hiruzen and I ever truly agreed on. Really, I'm starting to think this is just the rambling of senility. If you're stalling for time, I feel I should let you know that any and all of your agents are being rounded up as we speak. Donzo's visible I narrowed slightly. I don't doubt, you and your father shared a certain prodigious talent for tactics. Strategy on the other hand, that was always Hiruzen's game. As for stalling? My boy, you haven't the faintest idea. You think me foolish enough to place myself in such a vulnerable position without contingencies? I am so many steps ahead of you it's almost laughable. Why did you think I chose now of all times to return? There was no longer any doubt that this was an incident of some sort. Anbu had actually congregated on the street, and it was always a bad sign when a black ops member touched Konoha soil. The figure still stood there, calmly, even when the Jounin was anything but. Remove your hat and cloak, then lie down on the ground, hands where I can see them. The figure paused a moment, considering the order. Very well, this has gone far enough. They removed their hat, carelessly tossing it to the side. Many of the Anbu watching grimaced at the sight beneath. Konoha shall know pain. I admire the bluster Donzo, I'm sure whatever you've planned is just spectacular, Naruto drawled, motioning for the accompanying Anbu to file into the room and surround the man. Donzo himself seemed unruffled, glancing at each of them in turn as he was slowly surrounded before returning his attention to Naruto. It is unwise for a leader to leave his village unattended for so longer. There are visitors knocking at the door. Naruto only had a moment to furrow his brow at the cryptic statement before the entire room shuddered from some titanic explosion above them. Dust and pieces of the ceiling rained down in showers, forcing Naruto to dive to the side, tackling one of his operatives out of the path of a chunk of falling masonry. By the time he had regained his bearings, Donzo had vanished. Naruto had a sinking feeling he wouldn't show up again, they had secured every exit, but this was Donzo's base at the end of the day. More pressing matters required his attention though, and after a lightning-fast sweep of the room to check on his Anbu guard, he flashed back up to the surface. It was pandemonium. Shinobi flitted this way and that, sometimes carrying civilians away from scenes of carnage as what looked to be enormous summons animals carved messy paths through the village. Other teams of Anbu were struggling to contain the beasts, missing the large chunk of their force Naruto had brought down into the tunnels. It had all the trappings of an invasion, but there was no sign of the opposing force. He managed to flag down a passing Kunoichi, the bright red hat slung over his back was good for that at least, to give him a situation report. It's the Akatsuki. We tried to stop one of them but he. He summoned more, summoned them, like contract animals. They're too powerful, they keep swatting aside people who try and stop them and. Naruto raised a hand, silencing the woman immediately. Calm down. After a few shaky breaths, she managed that. Now, how many are there? where are they and what are they doing? It took her another moment to comport herself, looking a little red in the face after realizing how she had been addressing the Hokage. We think about six of them, Hokage-sama, they scattered as soon as they were summoned and right now it looks like they are trying to cause as much chaos as possible. Naruto processed all of that as quickly as possible. Six Akatsuki? That was a lot of firepower, he hadn't thought they even had that many members left. Still, what did a handful of shinobi, even ones that powerful, hoped to accomplish in the middle of a village. An actual attack was out of the question, which left it likely it was a diversion. The Akatsuki's known goals were the Baijuu, but coming after him in the middle of his own village was either the height of arrogance, or suicide. His eyes narrowed dangerously, he wasn't the only Jinchuriki in the village. Most of the Anbu are underground, start spreading the message to divert the summons animals instead of trying to destroy them, keep them in a contained area until reinforcements can arrive. Continue with the evacuation, anyone not dealing with the animals helps with that, if my village is a battleground I wanted exactly that, as few innocent casualties as possible. And the Akatsuki, Hokage-sama? Leave that too. Actually, a whimsical voice cut in, 
if I could have a moment of your time? Naruto barely had the time to be alarmed before a hand clasped his shoulder. It felt like the world turned to treacle as he felt the unmistakable sensation of a space-time technique take hold. Not wanting to find out what would happen if he let it, he flashed to where he knew a nearby Hiraishan tag was placed, the village was littered with them. When he reoriented, he saw it was another member of the Akatsuki, the cloak was unmistakable. However, the orange mask, swirling to a singular eye hole, chilled his blood. He would recognize that description anywhere. Ah, the man chided playfully, you ruined my little surprise. I had this awesome thing planned out where we'd zip away and I'd get to monologue all villainously and you could be the dashing hero, and everything. The man's entire countenance shifted abruptly, straightening from his childish slouch to bring the kunai he had placed against the kunoichi's neck even closer, drawing a thin red line across her throat. The hard way then? Even his voice had darkened, taking on a deeper, far more serious tone. I think you'll know where to find me, Hokage-sama, he mocked, just as his entire body seemed to warp and twist in their air, spiraling in on itself and taking the kunoichi with him until they vanished with a whisper of displaced air. The redhead cursed, head darting this way and that as he fretted over his options. The village was under attack and he couldn't just abandon in to go chasing after one man. But then, he had some sense of just how dangerous that one man could be, and to abandon that kunoichi to her fate was like a knife in the gut. People at least were reacting to the invasion, there were troops on the ground and Konoha was hardly lacking strong shinobi, but strong enough to fight six Akatsuki members? He took a deep breath to calm himself, Hiruzen's words on trusting in the people under him flashing through his mind. Jiraiya was still in the village, Tsunade was in the village, Kakashi, Gai, the Anbu, his students. All of them were strong. In that moment he resolved himself, the Akatsuki weren't fighting individual shinobi, they were fighting Konoha. He apparently had his own fight, and with that in mind he turned his attention to the top of the monument, where he knew the masked man would be waiting. He would have to make this quick. Pain walked through the village slowly, the streets around him a scene of devastation. His cloak billowed slightly as the concussive force of one of the Asura Path's weapons sent shockwaves through the air. The defense the village was putting up was pathetic, with their vaunted Hokaye's attention diverted they were disorganized and routing. They couldn't even organize enough to contain the animal path summons, let alone stop him. No force, however great, could stand before Go. Dynamic Entry Payne didn't even have the time to finish his thought before the Deva path was caught by a thunderous kick that sent him careening back across the street. A great plume of dust and smoke rose from the crater he had made in a nearby wall, before that too was pushed back by a wall of invisible force. Yosh. The green beast of Konoha is here villain, prepare to be destroyed by the awesome fires of youth. Payne took one look at the ridiculous specimen of a man before ignoring him entirely, directing the Asura path to deal with him. However, before the mechanical body could unleash a barrage of destructive explosives, a crackling blade of lightning burst through its chest. Reikiri, Kakashi muttered dispassionately, tossing the now limp body to the side and turning to eye up the real threat. From his revealed Sharingan, it was clear the copy Nin was already taking this seriously. Ah, eternal rival. That was a most unyouthful sneak attack, you should always announce your presence with fiery zeal. Kakashi blinked lazily, never taking his eye off the Deva path. Sorry guy, did you say something? The spandexed man visibly recoiled in pain, tears suddenly streaming down his cheeks. As hip as ever my friend. But I shall not be outdone. He sobered up again, squaring himself against pain and settling into a deceptively average taijutsu stance. The Akatsuki has befouled my home, and if I am unable to defeat them here, then. His further ranting was cut off when pain grew irritated by the asinine display, lifting a single hand and blasting Guy across the street with much greater force than he had been kicked. Shinra Tensei. Kakashi's eyes narrowed imperceptibly, doing his best to analyze what had just happened, but even his eye drew a blank. The man's chakra was strange, more like a cloud within his body than flowing through the usual pathways. There had been a brief concentration around the eyes when he performed his technique, but as for what he had actually done? The Sharingan simply drew a blank. Fancy name for a simple technique, he hazarded in his usual drawl, when in doubt, stall for backup. Something told him he may be in a little over his head here. With it alone I have the power to level this pitiful village, you have far more immediate concerns however. Kakashi's eyes widened as he heard movement behind him, leaning to the side just in time for a black canister to shoot past his head. Again, Payne raised his hand and the resulting explosion splashed harmlessly against some invisible shield in front of him. 
Kakashi wasn't so lucky as the sheer force of the blast threw him back. He had just enough wherewithal to twist his body out of the way of a silvery blade, landing with grace on the other side of the man he thought he had already killed. So, since when does a hole through the chest not put someone down? He mused nervously, noting that the bald Akatsuki member in front of him looked immaculate, even his robe was undamaged. That just seems unfair. His Sharangan caught another of the figures, a stocky man with the same orange hair and piercings as the apparent leader, retreating back into a side alley. Acting on that intuitive sense that had served him throughout his career, he flashed through a series of hand seals faster than most could blink and sent a large fireball hurtling after him. It was intercepted by a plump man bearing the same hair and markings. As Kakashi watched, his technique dwindled away to nothing before the man's raised hands. At that he could only grimace. Any other broken little tricks I should know about? I am not so easily done away with fiend, Guy bellowed as he broke free of the rubble he had been buried under, glancing around furtively at all the new faces. What is going on here Kakashi? Spotting an opportunity, the silver-haired Jounin motioned after the fleeing figure. That one guy, go after him. Yosh. Guy acted without hesitation, pumping his arms at his sides as he was suddenly enveloped in a green corona. Two of the paths moved to intercept but he shot right past them in an emerald blur, taking off after the fleeing Narika path. Which, of course, left Kakashi standing there, surrounded by the other three. They looked none too happy about the development. Without any outward sign of communication, the tubby one that had intercepted his technique darted off after Guy, while the one Kakashi had already killed once launched himself forward. His hands seemed to fold back like some impossibly complex puppet, revealing two spinning, serrated blades. Kakashi squared himself to redirect the blades with another Reikiri, aware of how much of a dent that would put in his reserves, only to have his vision filled by a mane of white hair. The world was filled with the deafening screech of a Rasengan plowing into metal, before the Asura path had a hole punched through it. Again. The apparently mechanical person stood there a moment, Jiraiya's arm elbow deep in its chest, before weakly swinging at the Sanin only to slump to the side. Kakashi felt like burning the rest of it for good measure. You go after bowl cut, I got this one, Jiraiya muttered softly, his voice lacking any of its usual mirth as the older man turned to face the deva path, face grim. Kakashi oddly noted that Jiraiya could actually be quite commanding when he dropped the kabuki act, before racing after Guy. After all, if Jiraiya couldn't handle this guy, what chance in hell did he have? Jiraiya didn't take his eyes off the orange-haired man as the copy nin raced off, the man seemed likewise intrigued by him. Yahiko, he acknowledged softly. Jiraiya sensei, pain returned, sounding almost bemused. Naruto had no Horishin markers in the small forest atop the Hokage monument, so he arrived in the little clearing in a small whirl of leaves. He stood atop a tree branch, staring down the masked man and wary for any traps he may have set up. The man himself just stood there, the now gagged Kunoichi held up by her hair with the kunai at her throat. She was trying to compose herself, gaining a hopeful smile at seeing her Hokage arrive, but she was still trembling slightly. Hmm, did I get the wrong one? The man asked, once again adopting that childish persona. You're not Shunshine no Shisui, right? Stop messing around, Naruto said, dropping to the ground and walking forward cautiously, a tension split between the mask that set his teeth on edge, and the kunai hovering ponderously like a tiny sword of Damocles. Oh, but messing around is the only fun you can have in this dull, broken world, isn't it? I would have thought you'd learn at least that from your pretty fiancé. Naruto twitched slightly, but refused to rise to the bait. What do you want? The man tutted shaking his head like a disappointed parent. No, no, too soon. We have to draw this out. Really, it's like I'm dealing with an amateur. First, I make my grand, monologuing speech where I lay out my plans along with all the hideously evil atrocities I've committed. Then you make a pithy retort while laying some unseen trap. I make some grand gesture, allowing you to rescue my hostage in the nick of time followed by our amazing and climactic battle, determining the fate of the village and all the lives in it. He finished with a sweeping gesture of both hands, momentarily bringing the kunai away from the woman's throat. Naruto just grit his teeth, eyes darting about the clearing for any hint of an advantage. If you insist. The man's voice lost all its playfulness in an instant. Well, now I'm not in the mood anymore. His hand fell like a pendulum and time seemed to slow to a crawl as Naruto rocketed forward pulling every ounce of speed out of his legs as physically possible. It took him two strides to streak across the open ground, leaving tiny craters where his feet met the ground. 
Just before the man could slice the Kunoichi's throat he tackled her backwards, the kunai leaving a neat scar across the Hokage hat instead. When he rolled to a stop, cradling the woman in his arms he knew something was off when the man refused to press his attack. He almost missed the faint hissing from the blood pounding in his ears, but he caught it in time to rip off the Kunoichi's headband and fling it towards the man, sheltering her with his body. It exploded a moment later, pelting him with dirt and little clumps of earth and leaving an incessant ringing in his ears. The man strolled out of the smoke cloud without so much as a hair out of place, Naruto could almost feel the grin beneath the mask. That's more like it. A heroic rescue, quick thinking and a devious trap reversal. Now I know I picked the right guy. The Hokage bit back a snarl, using his opponent's flair for the dramatic to give the Kunoichi a quick once-over. She seemed alright, if a bit frightened. Without flourish he pulled out one of his kunai, stuck it in the ground and vanished in a flash of red, depositing the woman amongst the surprised gasps of one of the civilian bunkers before flashing away again. The man hadn't moved in the brief moment he was gone except to mime looking at a watch. What took you? Oh, don't worry, Naruto said, doing his best to keep his voice even you have my full attention now. He launched forward again, a large Rasengan swirling into place over his palm as he moved. The distance between them might as well not have existed for all the time it took for him to cross it, driving the grinding ball of chakra right into the man's chest. Only for it to pass right through. Oh no, it appears that. The man started, only to trail off when he realized the Namikaze hadn't overbalanced and fallen through his body like most did. Instead he stood there, holding the screeching ball of chakra right inside his chest cavity, a small grin starting to spread his whiskered cheeks. The redhead met his masked opponent right in the eye and allowed himself a small, vindictive smile. You're not the only one who's done their homework. Chapter 48, Official Invasions The hum of the Rasengan seemed to wash out all the usual sounds of the forest. It was that mix of deep, tremulous drone, and grating, high-pitched whine that made it sound as dangerous as it was for all the good it did when it couldn't connect with a target. If he was honest with himself, Naruto actually had no idea how long he could hold one, he'd never had much impetus to learn. While it was admittedly harder to form than it was to maintain, it still took consistent effort to keep spinning. Well, this is new, the mask man said, looking down at the arm emerging from his chest. He took an experimental backward step only to have Naruto follow him precisely. He leapt to the side with almost flamboyant exaggeration and Naruto followed him to a T. If I run off the mountain, are you going to follow me? Your mother would tell you not to of course but. Oh, wait. He leaned forward and Naruto didn't need to see under the mask to know he was goading him. Upon the redhead's continued silence the man sighed, straightening back up. Still, very weird. Occasionally people work out a few aspects of my ability while we fight. Having somebody already know? Well, that feels a bit cheaty, don't you think? He leaned in conspiratorially, stage whispering, who clued you in? Come on, I won't tell. Was it old man Tucci over at the ramen stand? He leaned back and threw his hands up in the air. I knew I shouldn't have told him my deepest darkest secrets, but that ramen was too delicious. Naruto thought he actually heard a cicada chirp over the constant buzz of the Rasengan. The man slumped pathetically, only to suddenly leap back in an attempt to take the Hokage of guard. Naruto followed him all the same. Come on. How boring of a fight is this? Us, just standing here, waiting for one of our techniques to time out? Where's your sense of drama? Where's the panache? Why aren't you saying anything? He flailed his arms childishly, phasing right through Naruto instead of landing any blows. Seriously, you're not even setting me up for the awesome moment where I reveal I've had my ally sneaking up on you this whole time. Naruto pivoted so fast that the Rasengan sliced a blue crescent through the air as he turned. He hadn't sensed the thing creeping up on him until the man had announced its presence, and was almost too late to stop it latching onto him. The increasingly dense ball of chakra slammed into its head with all the force of a wrecking ball, splattering pieces of goopy white flesh in every direction. Where they landed, little saplings sprouted from the earth. He had no idea what it was. Without a head, it just had the body of an androgynous human with small bud-like protrusions across its body. Its skin was porcelain white and looked like it had the texture of a shaved tree. The most disconcerting thing though was that until it had appeared behind him, it was basically a black spot on his senses, completely invisible. Ooh, that was fast, the man exclaimed with childish awe. But, ah, uh, what are you going to do about the other ones? Naruto glanced up to find a small army of the things emerging from the trees around them. For a moment he cursed his luck, 
before sighing and reaching into his kunai pouch. Silence reigned as teacher and student stared across at one another. I thought you were dead, all three of you, Jiraiya said, uncertain of how to feel. To find out that the dangerous mercenary group he had been hunting for the past few years was headed by a former student. It was a good thing he was the master of his emotions. Yahiko is dead, I am pain. Some of the sadness must have slipped through the cracks in his mask as the Devapath's features hardened. What happened to Nagato, why do you have his eyes Yahiko? The orange-haired man remained impassive, but there was a slight tightening about his eyes. I told you, Yahiko is dead. He raised his hand ponderously. You will soon learn the feeling, Sensei. The wall of sheer force was as powerful as it was unannounced. Jiraiya's hair immediately hardened into a protective spiky shell that anchored him to the ground, but even so, he still dug a small trench on his way backwards. When the pressure finally relented he released his technique, but pain was already there. He kicked the older man hard enough to crater the wall behind him and didn't relent, immediately charging in again. When Jiraiya launched an enormous fireball at him he simply raised a hand and charged right though, the invisible shield diverting the attack around him. It was a smoke screen though, he emerged on the other side to find Jiraiya staring down at him from a rooftop, his features grim. Whatever happened to you three, whatever your motivations for all of. This. You made a mistake in attacking Konoha. We are only doing as you taught us, Jiraiya-sensei. A softer voice cut in. Thin sheets seemed to peel themselves off the surrounding buildings, fluttering into the air in a technique Jiraiya remembered all too well. They swirled artfully for a moment before coalescing to the form of a bored-looking blue-haired woman, with the addition of enormous papery wings stretching from her back. You've grown into a beautiful young woman Konan, Jiraiya offered with a sad smile. Is Nagato going to join us too? This is turning into a veritable reunion. His normally joking tone was tempered by a wistful edge. Nagato is dead, there is only pain, came the predictable response, only this time the Deva path didn't press his attack, simply crossing his arms imperiously. It was Conan who moved forward, sheets of paper peeling away from her form and folding as if by invisible hands into innocuous looking shuriken. They certainly didn't act like paper though, when she sent a cloud of them at Jiraiya they dug into the stonework just as well as metal. He whipped his hair and batted most of them away, his vision blocked just long enough that the three enormous paper shuriken caught him a little off guard. His look of shock only lasted until one buried itself in his chest, it quickly morphed into a smirk as he vanished in a puff of smoke, a bifurcated log clattering to the ground in his place. Find him, Payne ordered, earning a nod from his lieutenant before she took to the air for a better view. Guy thundered around a corner with reckless abandon, the cloud of rapidly evaporating sweat around his body turning him into a green comet. His quarry was wily, making good use of the sharp turns in the street to neutralize Guy's speed. But then, Guy was very fast with three gates open. He bounded off a wall, almost running with his body parallel to the ground from his sheer momentum, and twisted his body into a bone-breaking spinning kick. The tall man he had been told to chase ducked with almost prescient timing letting the green beast sail overhead and turning on a dime to head back the way he came. By the time Guy touched the ground and could correct his trajectory, causing bits of the aforementioned ground to go flying off in the other direction, he had already vanished into the maze of streets. Not one to be deterred easily, or at all, Guy took the opportunity to jump directly up, leaping into the sky like a hysterical rabbit. After that it was all too easy to spot his quarry and begin the chase anew. He caught up with the stocky man meeting up with another of the orange-haired invaders, this one with long hair styled like a Yamanaka. Both of them seemed to be carrying the remains of a third, the one his eternal rival had so unyouthfully dispatched. How they had managed to bring his body all the way here in such a short amount of time didn't even pass through the man's mind. That, and the oddity that they seemed to be feeding it to some grotesque creature that quite literally sprouted from the ground, wreathed in sickly purple flames that physically hurt to look at. He powered through the wrongness of the scene and cheerfully announced his presence once again. Konoha Whirlwind The animal path caught sight of him first, the Narika path whirling half a second later. That was enough time for Guy to skid into the space between them, sweeping low with his legs to knock out the animal path's base before fluidly continuing the motion to lash out with an anatomically improbable kick to the Narika path's chin. The technique was completed when he came full circle and caught the still airborne animal path with a brutal punch to the midsection. For a moment, the Akatsuki member seemed to fold around his arm before flying back into a nearby building. The energetic Taijutsu master was about to turn around and finish the Narika path, as he had been directed, when one he hadn't seen before, a portly one with slicked back hair, was suddenly between them. This one caught his blow easily, 
redirecting it and nearly causing Guy to unbalance. Instead of leaving himself open to a counterattack, the spandexed man rolled with the motion, catching himself with one hand and using the new leverage to spin into an inverted helicopter kick. The bigger man leaned back, shifting to press his attack, only to be forced at the last minute to turn, putting his hands forward to absorb a crackling dog made of lightning that had charged him from behind. If you hadn't noticed, I was fighting this one guy, he drawled, giving a pointed look at the Akatsuki member in question. Of course, my hip companion. But, just this once, I feel it may be better to defeat these villains together. Kakashi considered the scene as the Naraka path was hauled to his feet by the newly revitalized Asura path. Kakashi was already sick of seeing that one die. Okay fine, but don't tell anyone. He dropped his weight slightly, eyes narrowing at the orange-haired invaders. I have a mystique to maintain. Enormous wooden stakes burst from the street, twisting unnaturally in an attempt to ensnare and impale the enormous rhino summons rampaging through the village. While Tenzo was dealing with that, his attention was also on the concerted effort to redirect an even larger centipede, something he didn't even know he never wanted to see, towards a trap being lain by an Anbu squad. He cursed the utility of his Keke Genkai for what felt like the hundredth time, and threw in a small curse at Orochimaru, Hashirama Senju, and a few others for good measure. He wasn't used to this kind of endurance with his ability, he was no first Hokage, and the constant expectations that he should be were starting to wear on him. He was already ragged just from the effort of dealing with all of these summons, and they hadn't even managed to kill one yet. His concentration was split in too many directions, and that was with the help of four wood clones backing up various squads. He was running on fumes at this point. Another curse left his lips as, instead of backing off from the curved wooden wall he had created to divert the centipede, the thing simply dived into the ground, burrowing right into the earth. He ignored it, hoping another team would pick that up and turn back to the rhino. With more mental focus on his stakes he managed to tangle up the beast's legs. There was a brief moment of regret as the thing's momentum took it right through one of his favorite restaurants. It was quickly replaced by cool pragmatism as he directed the stakes to impale the creature and send it back wherever it came from. He was too focused just keeping it pinned to note the strange rumbling beneath his feet. He noticed too late to fully avoid the centipede bursting from the earth, crying out as one of its razor-sharp mandibles clipped his shoulder, sending him spinning to the side. The overlarge arthropod wasted no time in turning to finish the job, rearing up on its segmented body and clicking at him threateningly. He shifted to move out of the way, only to have his arm collapse under him, leaving him sprawled on the ground. Sensing its opportunity, the summons immediately lunged. M.E., now. Both Predator and Prey turned in time to see Sasuke leaping off of the flat of Amy's blade like a springboard. It looked like he was holding daggers of pure fire, and put them to good use when he slammed into the side of the summon's head. It let out a horrendous squeal as white-hot flame sliced through its carapace like butter. Sasuke stabbed it in one of its bulbous eyes for good measure before diving backwards. With an angered cry the centipede made to bifurcate the Uchiha while he was in the air, and likely would have if, at that moment, Emi didn't suddenly substitute with him. For a moment it seemed like the Violette had simply traded her life for his, but, and Tenzo wasn't quite sure he believed what he saw, she proceeded to step off the air, neatly dodging the creature's mandibles like she was skirting around another swordsman. Using leverage that simply didn't exist, the girl stepped forward as surely as if she was on solid ground, driving her wind-sheathed blade into the summon's neck, before allowing gravity to reclaim her. The sight of her blade shearing effortlessly through the creature's chitin as she fell, leaving an enormous gash down the length of its body, was one Tenzo wouldn't soon forget. Though, it was arguable that was the smell of its guts falling out. Where are you injured? Sakura asked in the brusque tone of every paramedic Tenzo had ever known. Her attention shifted to his shoulder, hands glowing, before he could even answer. The Mukutan user was initially confused as to why she wasn't with the other medics at the various emergency centers that had no doubt been set up at strategic points around the village. Sakura. On your right. The casual, unconcerned way Sasuke called out was sharply contrasted by what Tenzo saw when he craned his neck to look over his medic. The rhino summon was shaking its way out of its wooden bonds, snorting great gusts of air as it struggled to its feet. Tenzo shifted to deal with it only to be gently, but forcefully, pushed back down by Sakura. She gave him a stern look before standing to face the beast. Don't move, doctor's orders. It was just getting to its feet, turning awkwardly to face the group, as Sakura squared herself between it and her patient. She flashed through a quick chain of hand seals, and it was only because of Tenzo's innate grasp of earth techniques that he knew she had surreptitiously hardened the ground beneath her, with two wedges of rock tilting her feet forward slightly. 
The rhino seemed enraged by her refusal to move, grunting a challenge before charging down the street at a dead sprint. Tenzo very nearly moved anyway, only to freeze in astonishment as Sakura met the charge head-on, waiting until the last moment before suddenly slamming it with an earth-shattering overhead blow. She caught the beast right on the edge of its nose and suddenly all of the forward momentum was driven straight down. The ground cratered. Notably, the earth in a two-foot radius of Sakura only shuddered, but outside of that it was as though someone had dropped a small meteor on the street. The rhino itself was probably out cold before its face stopped digging into the street. Sakura had already turned her attention back to her patient. The swiftness with which she returned to treating his wound left him speechless for the entire 30 seconds it actually took her to finish up. All right, you should be fine, but if you get another one like that you'll have to go to one of the rally points for more thorough healing, she said. You'll also need a soldier pill, you're dangerously low on chakra. Come on Sakura, we need to move on, Sasuke says he's got a way to take down that weird drill-beaked bird. Okay, one moment, the pinkette called over her shoulder before giving Tenzo one last once-over. Satisfied, she gave him a professional nod and a decidedly less professional smile. Stay safe. With that she immediately took off after her teammates, the three of them quickly rounding a corner in a textbook Anbu formation that could have only come from their teacher. It was around that point that Tenzo remembered to blink. Monsters, training monsters. The human path observed the quiet little house. It was tucked away towards the outskirts of the village, in the quiet district between the markets and some of the larger clan compounds. It would have been innocuous enough to normal eyes, but through his rinnegan it glowed brilliantly. The sheer number and variety of seals was impressive enough, but the way they threaded together around and throughout the property weaved a beautiful tapestry of light. The path regarded it all dispassionately, a thin black rod sliding out of his sleeve which he quickly impaled into the ground. Immediately he saw the grand tapestry waver as parts of the matrix were disrupted. He felt no satisfaction as, one by one, various seals overloaded or failed, the chakra leaking out and dispersing into the air. He was about to step forward, only to pause as different, previously inactive seals suddenly flared to life, fueled by the released chakra of their counterparts. As one, the entire matrix suddenly flared back to full strength. Without his eyes, he would have walked right into that trap. Interesting. You've been working on your Shikigami techniques I see, Jiraiya remarked, suddenly running alongside where Conan was gliding through the streets. If she was surprised by the sudden appearance she didn't show it. You always told us that complacency was death for Shinobi, she replied, whipping her arm out and sending a barrage of razor-sharp sheets at her former mentor. The Sanin dodged them with a grace that belied his age, keeping a jovial smile as they kept pace with one another. I always did try to make my students take the important lessons to heart. His expression sobered a moment later. What is all of this Conan? What happened to you three? The starving little orphans I remember could never be capable of all of this. You were never capable of this. Life happened Jiraiya Sensei. Life, and pain and war. We all make sacrifices for it, as you know better than anybody else. You should be proud of us, soon we will have created a world of peace. Her hand shot out again and this time a small army of paper cranes folded itself into existence, speeding after the toad sage like self-correcting kunai. He pivoted mid-stride, suddenly running backwards as he held up a tiger seal. The stream of fire he breathed out was concentrated enough to turn white, melting the rooftals nearby. The origami birds, even empowered by Conan's chakra, stood no chance and were incinerated. That isn't what I taught you. No Jiraiya sensei, that was a lesson taught to us the hard way, Conan intoned softly, the first hint of emotion he had seen on her face. He hated that it was sadness. Then I know not to treat you lightly, Jiraiya said with a sigh. On the contrary sensei, you still underestimate us. When Jiraiya touched down on the next rooftop it seemed to come alive, hundreds of exploding tags suddenly rising up to latch onto any part of him they could until he looked like some strangely patterned mummy. Goodbye sensei, Conan whispered as the tags all ignited simultaneously. Her own wings immediately arched in front of her to shield her from the resulting blast. The building itself was flattened, but even with the air almost unbearably scorched Conan hazarded a look. Her eyes narrowed a hair when she spotted the faint wisps of white smoke from within the cloud of dust and ash. They widened again when the implication hit her. Nagato. The novelty of the self-sustaining ward system had worn off very quickly. The human path had taken to judiciously spearing the various seals with the disruptive rods. Whatever they were supposed to do, or were trying to do, the injection of his own chakra appeared enough to destroy or weaken them that they became a negligible afterthought once he reached the door. 
aside from the defunct seals on it, it was also locked in the more traditional sense. This was swiftly corrected by a thunderous kick that had the door, as well as a large chunk of the wall where the lock had been installed, fly off its hinges. The lights within were all off and for a moment he wondered if the occupants had fled to the shelters in the mountain. The memories of the people he had killed indicated the woman was the proud type, unlikely to go running in the face of invasion. As if to prove him right, the next step he took tripped some kind of wire trap that had a flurry of senbone fill the air in front of him. He deflected most of them, but a few managed to nick his arms and legs. Despite the slight sheen he could see coating the deadly little implements, he remained unconcerned. Poison could no longer affect these bodies. Blunt force trauma on the other hand. He caught the first spiked ball easily, also coated in that same sticky liquid. It proved enough of a distraction that the second one caught him in the back of the head. It didn't damage him too much, but was irritating. Shelving his emotional response, the fact that the traps had triggered without him taking a step was telling. If they were seal-based his eyes would have warned him. Somebody was operating them. With his quarry now in sight he moved on into the house. They could trap every inch, it still wouldn't stop God. The sight of a deserted market square in the middle of a busy village like Konoha might have been disconcerting to some. Payne ignored it, he had purposefully diverted the bulk of the shinobi away from his position, dealing with the summoned animals and evacuating the positions his Asura path was strategically bombing. This left him a straight path to the Yamanaka grounds, where memories the human path had assimilated told him he would find the Nanabi Jinchuriki. Having already been thwarted twice in that regard, he didn't intend to fail a third time. His eyes warned of a sudden influx of chakra into the ground beneath him, but it happened too fast for him to disrupt. The ground was reduced to a swampy quagmire in less than a second, trapping his feet and securing him in place. Far from panicking, the orange-haired man simply turned his gaze to where Jiraiya had alighted on a nearby rooftop. This has gone far enough Yahiko. When will you learn sensei? The Rinnegan user intoned, loud enough that his voice echoed around the square. Yahiko is dead. He extended his hands to either side, eyes pulsing with chakra. There is only pain. The swampy earth recoiled from the invisible bubble or pure force her projected. Only to snap back into place like elastic, closing over his feet again. Well now pain is stuck in a swamp, Jiraiya mocked, slamming his hands on the ground. Kushios no jutsu. The deva path was briefly buffeted by displaced air as something big was forcefully brought into the world. When the smoke cleared it revealed an enormous toad, the size of a baijuu. The pipe and howry at war, like some Rio novel Yakuza boss, might have been amusing under different circumstances. The enormous, scaled-up Tonto at its side, most certainly was not. What are you doing summoning me in the middle of the village Drea, you pickle-brained Ajit? You know how hard it is for me to move without wrecking stuff. The toad grumbled, his voice booming across the village. Around them the various scenes of destruction and rampaging summons paused, taking in the odd sight. Not the time Bunta, just hit that guy already. Jiraiya called out in exasperation as the moment passed and the invasion continued. Summoning me out the middle of my poker game, for one little guy? Game Abunta grumbled, but complied all the same. He drew his tanto in a deceptively fluid movement, immediately bringing it overhead to slam the deva path into oblivion. Shinra Tensei. The blade stopped abruptly, shuddering in the air as it fought back the titanic force pain had so causally summoned. Gamabunta grunted, bringing his other hand to bear and pushing down even harder. Slowly, inch by muscle straining inch the sword descended. After five seconds though, when the blade was scant centimeters from the Devapath's head, his eyes pulsed again and the blade suddenly lurched back into the air, ripped right out of Gamabunta's hands. Pain wasted no time, black rods sliding out of his sleeves which he quickly planted in the swampy ground. With the technique destabilized he was able to pull his feet out of the muck. Now thoroughly irritated, he pointed a hand at the still reeling boss summons. Banshu Tenen. Under normal circumstances, the recipient of the technique would have flown uncontrollably towards him. With the enormous weight disparity between them, the reverse happened, with pain suddenly flying forward towards the enormous toad. He slammed into Game Abunta's stomach with the impact of a small meteor, toppling the giant before proceeding to walk calmly along his length. When he reached the middle of the day's toad he wasted no time in pointing his hand down. Shinra Tensei. Game Abunta cried out, a booming noise that rattled nearby windows. The ground splinted beneath him as the force was dissipated through his body, but he didn't dispel. Pain kept his hand where it was, leveling a pointed look over to where Jiraiya was watching, immobile. Your efforts are futile Jiraiya Sensei. Call all the help you like, you only condemn them to the same fate. 
he turned his attention back to the toad beneath him, flexing his hand slightly. Shinra 10. Haya. The sword slammed into his side without warning, the enormous blade acting more like a titanic bludgeon than a cutting instrument. The sheer force of it must have been enough to momentarily disrupt the connection as, the next thing he knew, he was lying in a pile of rubble, looking at the vaguely human-shaped holes he had made on his flight through three different buildings. At the other end was the slug Sanin, holding up Gamabunta's sword like an ant holding up a tree branch. Payne let out a deep exhale, picking himself up and brushing the dust from his robe. This was starting to irritate him. Little unnatural shrubs now decorated the clearing, wherever these things bled, plant life sprung right up. Naruto breathed heavily in the middle of it all, killing armies was the Hiraishin's specialty, but there were a lot of these things, and they just kept coming. Well, the masked man announced, he had been rambling all through the melee, even introducing himself as Toby at one point, although Naruto didn't believe that name for a second. As entertaining as it is to see you flash around the place, this clearly isn't getting us anywhere, he snapped his fingers and the plant people stopped coming, the last one dropping, headless, as Naruto finished driving a Rasengan through its skull. You mean it's not getting you anywhere, the Hokage shot back with a wicked grin. I've just finished getting warmed up. Yes, yes, Toby drawled, waving his hand airily. Witty banter, sarcastic rejoinder, pithy retort etc., etc. A large gun by suddenly appeared in his hand in a puff of smoke, the chain attached to its handle snaking up his sleeve. I think I've just about gotten to the point where I decide to um. What was it again? His voice darkened in that abrupt manner of his. Oh right, deal with you myself. Well, a new and all too familiar voice cut in from the edge of the clearing that clenched at Naruto's heart painfully. I feel unwelcome now. Itachi, my boy, Toby exclaimed brightly, waving his gun by enthusiastically at the Uchiha prodigy. Just in time to join the climactic battle against your old teammate, I couldn't write the poetry better if I orchestrated all of this. The man paused, putting a finger to his chin. Oh right, I did. If we could skip the charade, Madara, Itachi intoned blandly, turning to face the Hokage and bringing the redhead up short with the revelation. Uck, that's no fun. Toby, or Madara, huffed, before sighing theatrically. But then, I never could say no to family. Both Uchiha turned to face Naruto, who by this point had regained his breath and was glancing at them both warily, eyes never straying above Itachi's chest. Itachi. Naruto. Congratulations on the promotion. Thanks, I've got to admit the hat's growing on me. The Howry is new. A present from Anko. Ah, and she's well? Pregnant with our first child actually. I never thought her the motherly type. It was a bit of a surprise to everyone really. I can imagine. Toby coughed into his hand, bringing the attention back to him. I'm sorry, am I interrupting? Itachi gave him a flat look. Yes, as a matter of fact. But if you insist on dealing with this matter quickly. His form suddenly broke apart into a murder of crows, their cawing echoing around the clearing far louder than would have been natural. Naruto cursed, never noticing he had been placed under a genjutsu. Itachi must have woven it while hidden in the tree line. His eyes darted about, trying to keep every single crow in his eye line while simultaneously fluctuating his chakra to break free. He kept his guard up even as the world shattered around him, the crows fading away and Itachi phasing back into existence. The Uchiha stood there, firm, I set in hard gaze with the Sharon gone spinning languidly. Toby looked down at the sword protruding from his chest and blinked once. Ha! Huh. Chapter 49, Official Ultimatums. You know, I feel like I should have seen this coming, Toby mused idly, taking a step forward. As he did so the blade slid cleanly out of his chest, revealing it hadn't so much as nicked his robes. Of course, the betrayal I saw a mile away, it was simply a matter of when. I had thought it would be when you were more desperate. In fact, I was planning a whole situation with your brother to force your hand. Guess I don't need to now. Maybe just for fun? I will never forgive you for what you did to the Uchiha, or my village, Itachi responded coolly. Toby clapped loudly, says the man who murdered them everybody. The Uchiha prodigy's eyes narrowed. I stopped a rebellion that would have torn my village apart. You murdered women and children, innocents. The masked man gave a dramatic sigh. Well, I just hate to see a job half finished. He straightened up, sending a sideways glance towards Naruto. I note our resident Hokage seems less than confused about this plot thickening turn of affairs. Sometimes, people do trust me to actually think situations out and not just react on emotion. 
Naruto shifted his shoulders and sent an apologetic look at his old teammate. Some things, the Hokage needs to know. Hiruzen informed you of my request then? Itachi asked, eyes softening at the lack of hostility from his oldest friend. And I'll honor it, you can be sure of that. Uck, Toby cut in, somebody saved me from the diabetes already. Could we, maybe, get back to the killy stabby stuff? If you insist, Itachi said, sheathing his tanto in a smooth motion and looking across at Naruto. I assume you have been developing a plan to deal with this one? The redhead mimed weighing something in his hand. Gears are turning. Then you won't mind if I go first? Oh, by all means. Sounds like you've wanted to kill this guy a lot longer than I have. Itachi simply turned to stare murderously at that taunting orange mask. You have no idea. The tension of the standoff seemed to lock everybody's feet in place. It shattered when both the Asura path and animal path bolted in opposite directions. Kakashi immediately tried to head off the Asura path, knowing that, with his explosives, he could cause some serious damage to the village. He didn't know what the other one could do, or if it was worse, but he would always take the known variable. Thankfully Guy seemed inclined to think the opposite and made off after the animal path. The other two paths didn't seem too enamored with this idea and Kakashi was forced to backpedal away from the Preta path. He didn't know if the man could absorb chakra from people as well as techniques and didn't want to find out, he wasn't much of an endurance fighter as it was and the Sharingan was already eating into his reserves. Likewise, Guy suddenly found himself engrossed in a fight with the Naraka path, the pierced man using his improbable strength to power through the green beast's skill. They were fast. Kakashi's Sharingan spun wildly as it tried to track the beefy man's movements. In Taijutsu alone they seemed evenly matched. Of course, if Kakashi's bag of tricks was as shallow as hand to hand, he would have died years ago. He diverted a punch to the side and, using the same hand, suddenly speared his arm forward. It took a lot out of him to get his Reikiri going that fast, and it showed. He was too slow. The orange-haired man leaned back, letting the deadly technique slice through his robes. He retaliated by reaching out to grab Kakashi's outstretched hand. Thankfully he was fast enough to dodge that, skipping back a few steps to take stock again. This was going nowhere, Kakashi was all about his jutsu, using them to change the environment and force his opponent into a disadvantageous position to be finished off. This guy's ability to absorb chakra was throwing a wrench into his normal style. So, time to do something he'd normally never do. Guy, a little help? The reaction was instantaneous. The air was filled with the roar of unrestrained energy as Guy suddenly cranked it up to 11, unlocking the next three gates in less time than it took most shinobi to go through a string of hand seals. Yosh. Kimon, Kai. Now wreathed in an intense blue aura that caused dust to swirl around him chaotically, Guy leapt backwards into the air. His fists became blurs as he pounded the air over and over again. Morning Peacock. For a moment, it looked like the entire Uchiha clan had returned to rain fire from the sky as an uncountable number of fireballs ripped through the air at the Preta path. Kakashi smiled grimly as the man fell for the trap, immediately stepping forward to absorb the technique. His rippled eyes widened in shock as the fireballs, the result of pure friction as opposed to any jutsu, tore right through whatever bubble was absorbing the chakra and slammed him into the ground. Guy just kept at it, the momentum of his punches actually keeping him in the air as he rained fiery doom down on the stocky man. Also as Kakashi predicted, the Naraka path attempted to use the Taijutsu master's moment of distraction to attack. A black rod slid from his sleeve, but just as he was about to hurl it at Guy it warped and twisted. The distortion in the air spread to the rest of the man's arm and before he knew it, it vanished with a sick ripping noise. Kamui, Kakashi muttered, voice wavering slightly as he felt his body begin to give out. He'd used too much chakra and the Mangekyo Sharingan had pushed him over the edge. Luckily, Guy had finished up. Nothing was left of the Preta path but a few smoking strands of fabric. He didn't even have to touch the ground to target the Naraka path, kicking off the air with a small sonic boom and slamming right into the remaining path with the force of a wrecking ball. Leaf Cutting Square Kakashi tracked his flight through a few buildings before losing sight of him. His eyes went blurry and he could already feel his consciousness slipping. He didn't hit the ground though. Instead, he found Guy, looking just as harried as him from using six of the gates, lowering him gently to the street. A most youthful fight my friend, teamwork won us the day and now we must trust our comrades to finish the rest of them. Kakashi found just enough energy to lower his headband back down over his eye. Sorry guy, did you say something? Pain frowned when his connection with the Naraka path cut out abruptly. 
he no longer had the ability to revive his bodies, and the predipath was gone too. He couldn't afford to let this drag on for too much longer, his bodies were weaker alone than as a unit. Refocusing on the current situation, he sent a mental command to the Asura path and began walking back through the buildings he had crashed through a moment ago. Tsunade of the Sanin, I had not expected you to interfere. No matter, you will die just as easily as your teammate. The blonde sneered at him, hefting the enormous sword on her shoulder with absurd ease. I never thought I would agree with Orochimaru on anything, but maybe we should have left you brats to die where we found you. Payne's eyes narrowed at the memory. Yes, you probably should have. Tsunade looked up suddenly as a faint whistling began to grow louder. Black shapes fell from the sky around her, smashing into the ground with cratering force before exploding violently. That proved too much for Gameabunta and the abused toad finally returned to Mayaboku to recover. Incidentally, Tsunade suddenly found herself unarmed as the boss's Tonto vanished with him. Suddenly pain was in front of her, those steely, rippled eyes completely emotionless as he made to impale her with one of those black rods. She stepped back and tried to backhand him but he weaved out of the blow's path with almost contemptuous ease. You are slow, slug Sanin. Retirement has done you no favors. Tsunade snarled and lunged at the man, but once again he easily moved out of the path of the deadly blow. This time though she pivoted with far more grace, sweeping low to break the Devapath's legs. Instead, she met an impenetrable wall of force before she was thrown back into a building. She was back up and charging again without hesitation, leaping forward with a battle cry and foregoing the blows altogether. If she could just grapple pain, then she could break his back effortlessly. She got a black rod through the arm for her troubles, immediately throwing her chakra system out of balance. She ripped the thing out a moment later, placing a glowing green hand over the wound and closing it with an afterthought. Your control over your chakra lives up to its reputation, Pain commented offhandedly. Most would be unable to perform jutsu for a while after being scratched by my chakra rods. Barely a bee sting, the slug Sanin growled, bringing her hands together in a ram seal. The weight of her chakra immediately began to press on the surroundings, her body visibly glowing with golden light. The small blue diamond on her forehead began to grow outward in artful, twisting lines. Yin seal, rel. A hand was suddenly laid across hers, making her pause in the yin seal to retreat back to its innocuous form. That's enough Tsunade, get back to the medical area, they need you more there. Tsunade smiled sadly, running a finger down the red lines on Jiraiya's cheek. You hate using this technique. Of course I do, the man announced with his usual bluster. What am I without my rugged good looks? Tsunade gave him a lingering look before nodding and running off back to the main medical checkpoint, leaving the transformed Jiraiya alone again to square off with his former pupil. I thought you had taught us everything sensei, this is new, pain intoned, taking in the white-haired man's newly bulbous nose, tiny eyes and elongated face tattoos. Well, a good teacher has to have some secrets, Jiraiya announced grandly, before coughing into his hand. Plus, I really hate how this technique makes me look. Well that's because you never finished the training a dumb tadpole, the elderly looking toad on his right shoulder complained, whacking him upside the head with a scaled down walking stick. Right, the man also had two elderly toads protruding from his shoulders. And whatcha talking about Jiriaya boy? I think you look plenty handsome like this, you humans got eyes too big for ya, the other toad, that looked grandmotherly for lack of a better term, said. Okay, okay, I know where this argument goes, Jiraiya interrupted before the grandfather toad could retort. Can we just focus on the guy trying to destroy my village? Well why didn't you say so Jiraiya boy, you know how Ma likes to yap on. What was that pa? Um, nothing dear, let's get on with this then. Payne had been watching the surreal interaction with stoicism. He knew that no matter how goofy Jiraiya acted he was no less attentive to his surroundings. He was also taking the opportunity to get a feel for the man's new form. The sheer power he felt radiation off the toad sage was incredible, he would have to put more attention into this than he previously thought. Right, better put this ugly mug to use then, Jiraiya said as the chatter from the peanut gallery died down. I think there's a lesson I'm long overdue in teaching you, Yahiko. The human path had been led on quite the chase, discovering that most every trappable inch of the house had been rigged with something. If it hadn't it was because there used to be a seal there, if he didn't have the Rinnegan, those would have been more dangerous. Currently he'd had Senbone, Kunai and Shuriken launched at him from a variety of creative angles, all poison of course. Three separate flashbangs had gone off, which had been irritatingly effective in leading him into further traps. 
a smoke bomb had been rigged with an aerosol poison as well as some manner of irritant that, if not for a judicial application of chakra, might have seriously damaged his eyes. There had also been a number of oddly precise fire traps. It was only after enduring five minutes of this controlled chaos did he realize that the woman was using traps that wouldn't damage the house or the possessions within. He had determined if he couldn't find her, he'd draw her out. The response was. Unpredictable. The moment he had smashed one of the many pictures lining a nearby table, an innocuous little canister was thrown at him. He tried to kick it away, but touching it only set it off. After the fact, ears ringing and front severely burned, he theorized the canister had contained a number of rolled up explosive tags. There wasn't much left of the room he'd been occupying. The message was clear, she would destroy the house before being drawn out. The human path's face twisted into a grimace. If she wanted to play that way, he was more than happy to comply. A mental command was all it took to have the Asura path rain explosive ordinance on the house, obliterating the roof and filling the building with a noxious smoke. One of the walls behind him gave a shuddering groan before giving out and collapsing inwards. The path gave it an idle look before picking his way through the debris to find his target. Tears of blood ran down Itachi's cheek as he stood at the center of the clearing. Black flames littered the grass, burning intensely, but never spreading. He had always hated the unnatural feeling of Amaterasu, the pretentious name didn't help. He had always preferred subtlety in his work, the irony of his Mangekyo's power was not lost on him. You doing all right there, Itachi-kun? Madara called out. To Itachi's eyes he was a fuzzy black figure with an orange blob for a head like some indistinct scarecrow, the comedy of the image did nothing to lessen the threat he felt from the man. Madara, even if it wasn't the Uchiha patriarch, was a dangerous individual, capable of manipulating even the absolute power that was pain. If for nothing else, that made him a priority target. The Uchiha didn't answer, mind working tirelessly to examine every angle of the man for weakness. He had long enough to examine him while in the Akatsuki, but despite knowing that his technique had a five-minute clock, he had found no way of forcing him past it. Naruto's idea had been good, but Itachi knew Madara had essentially an endless supply of Zetsu clones at his disposal. The gunbai was new, able to redirect improbable amounts of force and what looked to be most jutsu, including the black flames of the Mangekyo. How is that plan coming on? He asked Naruto. The redhead had been oddly quiet during the exchange, his expression a mask of focus. Had he known any better he might have assumed the Hokage was trying to enter sage mode, but Naruto had never received senjutsu training. I need about half a minute, Naruto announced, his hands coming up and running through seals Itachi actually recognized. He was surprised he still remembered them, it had been a long time since had seen Naruto actually use the hand seals for the Horishin, he couldn't imagine what his former teammate hoped to accomplish. But if there was anybody he trusted more. Then I believe I have one last thing to try. Itachi already regretted this course of action, but it may be the only thing that would work on Madara's space-time technique. It started slow, a swirl of visible red chakra around his feet, but that was enough to tip the older Uchiha off apparently. Finally pulling out all the stops Itachi? It's about time. The chakra grew, congealing and solidifying into an enormous figure around the Uchiha prodigy. Muscle wrapped around bone, sprouting armor to complete the gruesome visage of his Susano. The sword of Tatsuka blazed to life in his right hand, and it was his hand, the Susano was as much an extension of his body as his eyes were. But will it be enough? Itachi took a step forward and the sword fell leaving a fiery arc in its wake as it sliced through the air towards the masked man. Madara stood his ground, slamming his hand down and calling up a blazing orange barrier around his body. Uchiha flame formation. The barrier only stretched a few feet above the man, but it encircled him completely. It was clearly strong enough to stop his Susano though, just. The blade pressed in on the barrier, straining it but not breaking it. Itachi knew that if this came to a contest of stamina he would not win, Already he felt the ache using the ultimate technique of the Mangekyo put on him. Instead, the Yada mirror swirled into being on his Susano's left arm, which he immediately used to bash the flaming barrier. The reflecting mirror lived up to its name, shattering the jutsu and dissipating the chakra so thoroughly that Madara reeled back. Itachi used the opportunity to lunge forward again. This time he managed to spear the man on the ethereal blade. For a moment hope swelled in him, that the strain on his eyes, those precious hours taken from his life, hadn't been in vain. Madara's body began to blur, warping as it was pulled along the sword towards the glowing gourd at its base. If he could just seal the man in the bottle this would all be over. It was too much to hope for though and as soon as Madara realized what happened his body swirled in on itself, 
appearing across the clearing in the same manner, unharmed. Wow, that nearly worked, the man mused, not sounding all that concerned with his near brush with defeat. Scary. I'm sorry, Itachi said, the Susano fading around him as he staggered backwards. It would take him a few minutes to recover before he would be useful in this fight again. Don't apologize, Naruto replied with a grim smile. That one moment where he was forced to teleport was all I needed, just one moment of tangibility. Itachi was uncertain of what his teammate meant until he noticed the redhead had finished his chain of hand seals. For a moment Itachi felt the world. Change. There was no other way to put it. It was akin to the feeling of being trapped in a genjutsu where everything was exactly the same, but he knew that wasn't the case. If his eyes weren't lying, Naruto had managed to split his chakra into its yin and yang components. The yang was channeled harmlessly out of his body, the grass visibly growing beneath his feet. The yin on the other hand. Okay, this seems unfair, Madara muttered, foregoing the childish voice as he looked down at the Horatian marker that had not been on his chest a moment ago. Anko groaned as she staggered out of the ruins that used to be her bedroom, coughing into her hand. Her eyes were watering from the dust, but, thankfully she wasn't injured. A hand instinctively strayed to her stomach, panic rising up her spine before it was relieved by the faintest of kicks. That's my girl, she whispered, glancing around to take stock of the situation. She barely managed to turn before a hand wrapped around her throat, lifting her off her feet with ease before casually slamming her into the wall. The breath was knocked out of her, and with the strength of the grip on her neck, it stayed out. A pair of steely ringed eyes bored into her own. Where is the Sanbi Jinchuriki? The hand loosened enough for her to draw a breath and answer, which she used to gratefully gulp in a lungful of air and promptly spit in his face. Same place you can go fuck yourself. The hand promptly tightened again, cutting off her airway. The human path didn't bother to ask again, simply holding her there as she struggled for air. Finally, when her face had begun to lose its color and she could see darkness creeping into her vision, he said, I don't need to ask. I do so out of respect for the innocent life within you. Where is the Sanbi Jinchuriki? Again, his hand loosened, Anko's gasping was a lot less graceful this time. My fiancé. Is going to. Destroy you. This time she thought he might have crushed her windpipe when he tightened his grip again. She flailed against him, even manging to stab him with a senbone. It might as well have been a light breeze for all the damage it did him. I will only ask once more. God's patience only extends so far. If Anko retained the control to roll her eyes she would have, as it was she was only semi-conscious at this point and the hyperventilation when he relaxed his grip was more reflexive than a choice. I change my. Mind. I'm going to. Kill she was cut off when Payne's patience reached its limit. Very well. With that ultimatum, he placed a hand atop her head, almost tenderly. In the next moment he. Pulled. There was a sickening ripping noise as something pale and translucent was drawn up out of Anko's body. She felt an odd lifting sensation, as well as a terrible coldness that seemed to suffuse her entire being. Then, like an elastic band, the world snapped back into place. She hadn't realized how utterly wrong all of that felt until it was over and she could draw in long, sweet lungfuls of blessed, real, air. The human path had staggered back, blinking in confusion as he raised a hand up to his cheek. He jerked back again and this time Anko could catch the silver blur that raced across her vision. Don't. A silver streak and pain reeled hurt. He was forced to knee as something fast took him in the side of the knee my. A crack echoed in the house as pain was hit in the face again, nearly flooring him nay chan. This time Haya stopped in front of him, using her full momentum to drive her shoulder into Payne's face, sending him flying across the debris-ridden floor. She was like a wild animal, hair flying about her like a mane as she jumped onto his chest, hitting him over and over until her fists made little blurs in the air. Anko looked on with a weak smile, staggering to her feet. It transformed into a mask of horror as Haya was suddenly flung back, backhanded across the room with the same ease as somebody swatting a fly. When the human path got back to his feet it was thoroughly disheveled and far less stoic. The orange-haired man was now scowling as he stalked across the room towards the silver-haired girl. My patience is gone. I will have the answers I came for. Anko could only croak despairingly as the man picked up the shaking little girl, moving to place his hand atop her head. Only he couldn't. He looked down at the arm but it simply hung limp at his side. In the next moment he felt the strength leave his fingers, allowing Haya to drop to the floor to scurry back to Anko. His vision blurred and eventually his legs gave in, leaving him prostrate on the floor, 
helpless as Anko stalked over, grabbing one of Naruto's old tantos out of a nearby bile of rubble. What did you? Poison should have no effect on me. The purple-haired woman wore a pained smile as she awkwardly made her way over, clutching her stomach protectively. It wasn't a poison, it was a paralytic, a damn strong one, and you took enough to down a boss summons. Pain merely scowled up at her, before control of his facial muscles slipped him too. This is not Oer, Nobuthy Cab Den Goth. He slurred. Anko allowed herself a small amused smile before her face became cold. And nobody fucks with my family, she snarled, before embedding the sword right through his chest. The first thing Pain noted was that Jiraiya was absurdly strong in this form. The first blow he had tried to block nearly broke his arm which, with three of his other paths taken out and the other three similarly empowered, was nearly unthinkable. The black rods had come out quickly by that point, a necessity for redirecting the incredible power Jiraiya possessed. The old Sanin suddenly jumped, hand raised to the sky like he was trying to grasp the sun. In the next moment it looked as though he had succeeded, a titanic Rasengan swirling into existence above his palm. The noise of the thing was deafening, even before Jiraiya pointed it down and allowed it to drop like a bright blue meteor. There was no room to dodge, the spiraling sphere would encompass the entire marketplace. He raised a hand and summoned his eye's power for a similarly grandiose display of power, stopping the attack in its tracks. A quick mental command had the Asura path turn its attention away from its systematic destruction of key targets in favor of suddenly launching itself at Jiraiya's back. He should have known those two toads were more than simply decorative. The swiveled on the old shinobi's shoulders, one of them spitting out a spray of what looked to be oil, which the other swiftly ignited. The Asura path didn't stand a chance and Pain had already abandoned it before he felt the connection sever. He used the sudden influx of chakra to destabilize his own technique, similarly distorting the gravity around the Rasengan until the chaotic energies within suddenly found release. Despite Jiraiya's newfound control, it was the only explanation for how he was able to sustain such an enormous mass of chakra that far from his own body, even he was unable to corral the unstable jutsu. The explosion could be seen across the entire village. It was too soon for another Shinra Tensei, so Pain was left to defend against the blast the old-fashioned way. He was no worse for the wear, but his cloak was in tatters. It was as he was shrugging it off, so that it wouldn't restrict his mobility, that Jiraiya burst out of the dust cloud. Immediately one of his black rods was in hand, aimed to impale the man on his own momentum. Jiraiya dodged the first with almost precognitive reflexes but was too close to avoid the one that slid out of Pain's other sleeve. He put his hand in the way, and against a lesser weapon his skin might have been enough to stop it, whatever else this form gave him, he seemed far more durable, but Pain's chakra rods were no mere sticks. They speared right through the man's palm, to the clear surprise of the toads on his shoulders. Jiraiya ignored their surprised exclamations. The moment the rod has pierced his skin his head paused, a tear suddenly rolling down his cheek. He stood there, staring at the deva path with those beady frog-like eyes. Nagato. What have you done? Pain's eyes merely narrowed. That form is truly impressive sensei, for you to glean so much. However, he brought his other hand up to impale his old teacher only for the man to easily swat it aside now that he wasn't dealing with the sharp end I already told you that there is only pain. He kicked forward and despite an impressive showing of flexibility from Jiraiya, there was only so much you could move when one of your hands was speared in place. The toad sage went skidding back, hardly looking phased by the blow as he casually pulled the rod out of his palm and threw it aside. I will stop you Nagato, and finally get a straight answer out of you, for all of this. Pain nodded slowly. I know you will try, sensei. Well, Toby drawled, pulling at the front of his robes where the Horatian marker refused to fade away, as interested as I am to know how you accomplish this particular feat of impossibility. An application of pure yin chakra, Itachi said, sounding impressed despite himself. A ninjutsu variation on the Kurama clan's Keke Genkai in order to place an illusionary Horatian marker and force it into a modicum of reality. Fascinating. When Naruto gave him a sideways look he shrugged. I was given special dispensation to train under one of their genjutsu masters when I was younger, being the heir to one of the most powerful clans in the village had its allowances. He glanced back at the redhead. Does it function as a normal marker? And where did you even get the idea? I had the pleasure of meeting the Kurama heir, Yakumo. Lovely girl, she had reason to be. Grateful, after our meeting. She was more than happy to help with a little project of mine. Itachi nodded slowly. Slow to apply but if refined. The thought of such a technique was mind-boggling. 
the placement of Horatian markers without the need for physical contact. He wasn't sure of a force that could withstand Naruto, if the Namikaze could master it. They were interrupted by Toby clapping slowly. Wonderful. A marvel of our age. Truly you are the next. Well, me, he deadpanned. Still doesn't quite solve the problem that you can't hit me. The man paused when Naruto's smile turned vicious. Oh, but you gave me plenty of time to think on that. It's the funniest thing actually, before all of this I happened to be chasing down a certain rogue root leader, Donzo, maybe you know him. Based on the slight shift in Toby's posture, he did. It seems he'd been planning for a while on how to deal with me, or more specifically my father's, and by extension the Nidimes technique. He was in the unique position of both being the Nidime student, with access to many of his notes, and a few Injutsu user of no small skill. Turns out that he had managed to cobble together a type of barrier seal that disrupts space-time techniques, all of them in fact, the very same seal that my clone should have finished placing around this clearing just. About. The smile had taken on a predatory aspect, which Toby could see all too clearly now that Naruto had flashed right in front of him, the Tonto he had swiped off Itachi's back reared back to strike. Now, Chapter 50, Official Endings Toby brought the gun by up on pure reflex, just diverting the sword from a lethal blow to his heart. In the next second it was brought around again, leaving a keening sound in the air as it split the space between them. Throat, lungs, kidneys, femoral artery, brachial artery. Naruto wasn't pulling his blows, he was going for the kill right from the start. Each swing, lunge and parry came closer and closer to meeting its mark as Toby backpedaled wildly. He couldn't even use his gun by his ability as Naruto wasn't using any jutsu, just pure unadulterated speed and kenjutsu technique. It became too much when the chain connecting the weapon to his person was suddenly severed. He looked down to find the severed links burning with black fire, some of it spreading to his cloak. He immediately tore it off, and the distraction cost him as Naruto caught the handle with his blade and flicked it out of his hands, wheeling around to strike at his visible eye. The entire clearing seemed to still for a moment when the mask cracked, splitting down the middle and falling in two separate pieces to either side. Naruto took the moment to observe his adversary. Only to find him wholly unremarkable. There looked to be some strange scarring across the right side of his face, but other than that he looked like any other Uchiha, Sharingan included. Unremarkable, until one considers that he should have been standing next to one of the three remaining living Uchiha. Itachi? Naruto asked, keeping his blade trained on the man with confirmation that he was an Uchiha he didn't want to lower his guard for an instant. He seems familiar. Toby sneered, much of his mystique having vanished with the mask. Now he was just another shinobi, angry at the world, he summarily discarded his childish persona. I would only be familiar, wouldn't I, Itachi-kun? Even as a child you were an arrogant brat, too absorbed in the praise being lauded on you to notice anything below your nose. He turned to Naruto, meeting the redhead's eye with a piercing stare and I'm disappointed in you Naruto-kun, or should I call you Hokage-sama? You know I once changed your diapers? Look what you grew into, perpetuating the same broken cycle that destroyed your entire family. Naruto's eyes hardened. Not all of it. I healed, made a new family, accepted my loss and moved on. If you knew me as a child then. Realization dawned on him suddenly, a friendly face in big orange goggles that he used to think were so cool, a sullen boy with a shock of silver hair and big brown eyes framed by silly blue marks. Obito? Toby scowled. Oh no, Obito Uchi had died a long time ago, crushed under a rock and left for dead by the people he thought were his friends. He died again when his friend shoved his arm through the woman he loved. He died for the last time when the village he respected forgot all about him, just another name on a shiny black rock. I am a legacy, decades in the making, and I will bring this entire, corrupt, broken world down on its head. You're even more insane than I believed, Itachi intoned softly, staring at the man with a mix of pity and a calm alertness. Maybe, Obito granted with a lopsided smile, but you two aren't the only ones that can stall for time. Naruto felt at first, the subtle tug in the back of his mind that connected him to his Horatian tags. He shouldn't have felt those as long as the barrier seal was up, which meant somehow Obito had managed to the plant things, he must have had them destroying the seal. He hadn't known because none of his clones had dispersed, he didn't have time to wonder how he had managed that. Acting on instinct he immediately flashed to the one he had placed on Obito, only to appear a few feet away, where the man had discarded his cloak. There was something else though, itching at the edge of his awareness. You see, I'm so many steps ahead of you it's almost dull watching you dance about like puppets on strings. 
the redhead's foot twisted at the same moment the tree behind Obito burst into black flame, the Amaterasu harmlessly passing through his body just as Naruto's Rasengan did. And now we're back to this tired old game. Well, it was fun boys. Even as the man talked and Naruto squared his stance, there was still that feeling, like something just out of sight, gears that refused to mesh. I gave Pain the task of locating the Jinchuriki, but I should know better than to delegate. I think I'll handle this personally, perhaps starting with your sister. His body began to twist and distort, twisting in on itself. And it clicked, the presence was deeply familiar but. Old. It was something Naruto hadn't felt in a long time, something he likely didn't even realize he was feeling at the time. The distinct sensation of one of his father's old markers, reactivated when the suppression field went down. On Obito's back. It was over in a blink. One moment Obito was swirling away, the next his body snapped back into normal reality, a sword impaled clean through his heart. Sharingan eyes went wide as a hand came up to grasp impotently at the red stained blade. B but the marker, I I. That's. Naruto leaned in, no satisfaction in his voice as he whispered in the lost Uchiha's ear. A gift from my father. A strange sort of look pulled at Obito's face for a moment as he reached forward, eyes unfocused. For just a moment he smiled wistfully. So many steps ahead, as always, sensei. Then he fell forward, dead. Naruto took just a moment to breathe, not quite enjoying the moment, but relieved that this at least, was over. Did you know him well? Itachi asked, moving up beside him. Sort of? He was part of my dad's old Janan team. He grimaced. Kakashi's the only one left, I thought the other two died when I was really young. But yeah, I sort of remember them coming over to the house occasionally. He squatted next to the dead Uchiha, turning him over so that the scarred half of his face was concealed. I remember Obito being so bright and cheerful, always goofing off. I can't imagine what happened to him to turn him into. This. Sometimes. A new voice called out, as a figure walked out of the tree line, hauling something big over their shoulder all it takes at time. Immediately Itachi and Naruto tensed, eyeing the newcomer warily. They had shaggy black hair and wore a shapeless, well-worn cloak. However, the most prominent feature was the demonic mask they wore, with a single eye hole. Whoa, whoa. He called, letting the bundle, which turned out to be a person, drop to the ground unceremoniously. He put his hands up, slowly moving to take it off. Naruto and Itachi didn't relax for a second. I'm gone for all these years. He slowly removed the mask, surprising both of his old teammates with the face beneath. And this is the welcome I get? Payne couldn't make sense of what he was seeing. His eyes tracked Jiraiya perfectly, he dodged every titanic blow the man dealt out, and somehow the hit still managed to land. It was like some invisible, unpredictable force was dogging the man's body, half a second out of sync with him. He raised a hand to blast the man back and Jiraiya simply jumped over the wall of force, leaping into the air like his Senjutsu's namesake. The Sanin breathed in, chest expanding to ridiculous proportions, before spitting out a tidal wave of viscous oil. It was swiftly followed by twin gouts of flame, to ignite it, and wind, to fan those flames into an unbearable inferno. The conflagration quickly swallowed the ground, incinerating everything in its path. The only avenue left to the Deva path was to take to the roofs, where he was immediately met by Jiraiya bringing down a smaller, but no less enormous Rasengan. Again, Payne caught the spiraling sphere with a wall of force, only to get slammed in the side by another huge toad, this one holding a shield and a sasamata. He corrected his ungraceful flight through the village, only to get blindsided by Jiraiya in the middle of the village's main avenue. Again, he dodged the man's vicious haymaker, only to get caught by that invisible force that followed his fist. All the while, his old mentor wore a grim visage as he mercilessly tore into pain without any of his prior restraint. And pain had grown tired off it. The next time Jiraiya charged forward he didn't simply level a Shinra Tensei at him, he forced everything back. The ground, the nearby buildings and even the Toad Sage, were pushed outward from him, leaving a neat crater almost ten feet deep at its center. This has gone far enough. Nobody else shall stand in the path of God. I will make the world realize that without pain, there is no understanding. Without pain, there can be no peace. His eyes narrowed dangerously. I will make the world no pain. Conan's normally implacable calm had been thoroughly trodden on. In her mad dash to get back to pain she had been completely blindsided by a trio of nightmarish pests. They were relentless. Clearly, she had been marked as some kind of high-priority target to have monsters like these after her. 
the skills she could attribute to skilled Anbu operatives, but these were just kids. She wouldn't be surprised if they were still a Jinan team. She had thought the Uchiha to be the main threat, Itachi's little brother if she wasn't mistaken. That alone would have been grounds to be cautious around the team, despite appearances, Itachi Uchiha unnerved her, but he seemed to be the one tasked with keeping track of her. The Sharingan was an adept tool for that, as well as predicting where she would go and directing his teammates accordingly. The pink-haired one, and how she regretted thinking that was a ridiculous look for Akunoichi, seemed to be tasked with hemming her in. Whether this involved changing the landscape into tactically placed walls, or simply collapsing buildings on her, with jutsu or sometimes just brute force, was apparently up to her discretion. She was irritating, but would have been manageable if she wasn't so damn resilient. Conan had trapped one of the streets with explosive tags and the girl had simply charged right through, healing her burns on the fly. Then there was the sword girl. If it was the Uchiha's job to direct her, and the medic's job to distract her, this was the one clearly meant to finish her. The fact that she could follow Conan into the air by stepping off it had caught her so by surprise that the girl's lethally wind-shrouded blade nearly managed to find its mark. That wasn't the extent of it either, the girl could also use it at range, sending nearly invisible blades of wind at her with strokes of the blade. It was all Conan could do to avoid the little monsters. She swooped low, diving into an alleyway. The sheets of paper that currently composed the outside of her body peeled away, forming a perfect, if hollow, clone that continued on in her place. The Uchiha had already seen through this trick once by tracking her chakra signature, so she dispersed into individual sheets of paper that immediately plastered themselves along the alley, adopting the colors underneath in a perfect camouflage. Even sensors couldn't find her when she was like this, her chakra was too diffuse. Sure enough, the purple-haired girl streaked past after her clone. Instead of setting up a trap for her she allowed the girl to pass, she would find a nasty surprise if she managed to destroy her clone. The inside of it was entirely lined with explosive tags that could encircle and obliterate just about anybody. Just to be sure she sent a flock of her homing cranes after the Uchiha to make sure he was distracted. She reformed a moment later, when the trio had moved on, for now at least, they were relentless beyond all belief. Having trouble? Conan nearly jumped, it was only her years of similar experiences with pain appearing out of nowhere that allowed her to simply turn with a raised eyebrow. They are merely children. The animal path observed her for a moment from within the mouth of his chameleon summons, that explained how he was able to sneak up on her. So were we, once. Were we really? Pain didn't humor her moment of introspection, his eyes tracking the trio of Chonin. The Kyubi Jinchuriki has trained his students well. There are many powerful individuals in this village. Too many? Conan questioned with what approach disbelief, she had never seen anything that was a match for Nagato. Nobody can defeat God, pain shot back almost reflexively. But it is time to end this. Searching out the individual Jinchuriki has become untenable, if need be we shall deal with the beasts in person. You mean but it was already too late. The animal path slammed his hand into the ground and they disappeared in puff of smoke. They reappeared on the very outskirts of the village, well outside the wall. Conan could only watch on as way off in the distance a lone figure began rising up over the village, body silhouetted against the sun. This world shall know pain, Nagato said, before the animal path slumped over, inert. I'm going to default to you on this one, Naruto muttered, glancing across at Itachi without taking his eyes off the ghost in front of him. This is a genjutsu, right? That hurts, Shisui shouted indignantly, poking his chest, right here. The Uchiha air seemed just as stunned, even throughout the reunion with Naruto he hadn't displayed this much emotion. If it is, whoever cast it knows Shisui as well as we did. Naruto took a moment, staring at the supposed dead man before shrugging. Good enough for me. He was across the clearing in a flash, picking his old teammate up and spinning him around. Shisui. He put him back down, grinning broadly. Right before he slugged the man right in the face. Ah. What the hell? The Uchiha complained, clutching his face and glaring up at the redhead with his one good eye. We should be asking you that, you ass. Where the hell have you been all this time? We thought you were dead. We saw you die. I'm more curious why you chose now to return, Itachi said, walking up to the pair a little more sedately and leaning forward almost tentatively to hug his friend. Well, long story about that. And yeah, for all intents and purposes you did see me die. Koto Amatsukami? Itachi ventured, looking thoughtful. Yeah, actually. But why the charade? Didn't you trust us? Naruto asked, sounding genuinely betrayed. 
At that, Shisui scowled. You can thank him for that. He kicked the bundle at his feet, flipping it over and revealing Donzo bound on the ground, blood leaking from the end of the bandages across his right eye. Oh good, I worried he'd get away in all this mess, Naruto mused tonelessly, glaring at Donzo like a particularly bloody piece of meat. Yeah well, that's me, Shisui muttered, clearing up your guy's messes since time immemorial. When he received two flat stares he wilted sheepishly, coughing into his hand. But, yeah. Explanations. He sobered slightly, meeting Naruto's eyes. I assume, that since you became Hokage you know all about the mess with the Uchiha? Naruto nodded grimly, glancing across at Itachi who refused to meet his gaze. Well we were both caught up right in the middle of that. The old man wanted to settle everything peacefully, but Fugaku wasn't having it. Danzo on the other hand. He gave the older man a kick for good measure saw a different way of settling everything, namely, my eyes. I refused, something like that wouldn't actually help anything. It'd be like putting a plaster over a stab wound, a temporary fix at best. Itachi put it together first, how they had found Shisui that night by the river, the state of Danzo's face now. He tried to take your eyes by force. Shisui nodded solemnly. He blindsided me and managed to get one before I could get away, I couldn't let him get the other. So you faked your death, Naruto summed up. With the only credible witnesses that had political protection from Danzo's schemes. He looked down with a scowl. And we had to believe it was real, because if Danzo had access to that technique. We wouldn't even know what we might tell him. For what it's worth, I really am sorry. But what have you been doing all this time? Itachi asked. Waiting, he said, some of his old humor returning. I'd gotten really good at the whole hermit shtick too. But then somebody. He sent a sidelong glance at Naruto had to get embroiled in a war. I figured I'd put myself to use and clean up before you could really put your foot in it. The Hokage put a finger to his temple and shook his head with a wry grin. I never was able to work out why all those Iwa troops pulled out of Kuza without explanation. Shisui nodded. Then I got word down the grapevine that something big had gone down in Konoha, only to find out Danzo was public enemy number one. I've been camped out on the border ever since, waiting for my chance to catch the bastard. He reached into the satchel at his waist and pulled out a small jar containing green liquid. A Sharingan I floated innocuously in the solution. Don't suppose you guys know a good eye doctor? The redhead grinned. At least three actually, I'll put in a word when all of this is over with and you can finally come back home. He was brought up short by Shisui's serious look. Naruto, I, I don't think I can come back just yet. I've just finally started to realize what a difference I can make out there. It's amazing how much you can do when everyone thinks you're dead. He let a small smile slip back onto his features. Besides, I've really caught something of a traveler's bug. Don't get me wrong, I'll definitely come back one day, can't leave cousin Sasuke to rebuild a clan all on his lonesome, just. Not yet. Naruto paused a moment before nodded, letting out a breath he didn't realize he was holding. I, think I understand. I'm afraid the situation is a bit more cut and dry for me, Itachi added. Like Shisui, my work isn't done. The disease isn't debilitating yet, and there is a lot I would still like to do, a few members of the Akatsuki left to hunt. Do you know how long you have? Naruto asked. Two, maybe three years if I don't exert myself. All three of them shared a wry smile, Itachi Uchiha did nothing but exert himself. But I have time enough. Again, Naruto nodded, unsure how to feel when faced with the prospect of losing his two best friends for the second time. Just remember to ask for help when you need it. Of course, the Uchiha replied with one of his mysterious little smiles, that's what teammates are for, are they not? So, I suppose the only thing left to do is deal with this clown, Shisui muttered, prodding the bound Danzo with his foot. Might be harder than you think, Naruto groused, feeling a deep temptation to simply kill the man here and now where there were no witnesses that would care. Even despite his actions recently he still has a great deal of political clout across the village, and pinning something on him specifically will be a nightmare for. What? He trailed off at the sight of Shisui grinning. I shouldn't worry about all that too much, just tell the interrogators to take a look at his right arm, I think they'll find it sufficient evidence for whatever they need. And on that note, Itachi cut in, gazing out over the mountain to where a single figure could be seen rising up over the village. I believe there are events that demand the Hokaye's attention. Oh, I never did get to congratulate. And he's gone, Shisui sighed, turning to Itachi. He's gotten all precocious without us around, hasn't he? Itachi didn't answer, 
simply staring out over the panorama of the village, somewhat battered and harried as it was, with a small smile. Payne had a magnificent view as he rose higher over the village, one fit for a god looking down on his dominion. In a moment, all of this would be gone, obliterated under his singular power. The Jinchuriki would likely die, or not, it made no difference to him. Either way they would be far easier to capture. The Baiju were brutes, mindless and slaves to their baser instinct. It would be child's play to subjugate them and feed their energy to the ghetto Mazo. This will be the start of a world at peace, the first major step in securing a world that has true understanding. They will know fear, they will know sorrow. And most importantly, Konoha will be the first to know pain. Shin. Funny. Pain never even saw it coming, one moment he felt the power building up inside him, rippling under his skin at the chance to be unleashed. The next he felt something smash into his back without mercy, sending him hurtling towards the ground. Naruto bounced once on his bastardized version of Fu's technique, watching Pain's body crash back into the village in a large cloud of dust, then he let himself fall. I was thinking something similar. He vanished in a flash of red, reappearing right above the recovering Deva path with a large Rasengan already primed to deepen the small crater his body had made. He used the momentum of the technique to flip back onto his feet, watching the orange-haired man slowly regain his feet. We've met once before, but as a guest of the village, I feel I should give you a proper welcome. Pain raised his hand but Naruto was already gone, the wall of force hitting nothing but the building behind him. He reappeared next to the man, teleporting to the Horishin marker he had placed all those months ago when he had first met the Akatsuki leader. Welcome to Konoha, I'm Naruto Namikaze, the god I'm Hokage, and here's the tour. He grabbed the shaky man by the cloak and suddenly vanished. Only the birds could follow what happened from there as Naruto appeared and disappeared hundreds of times across the village in a few seconds, turning the streets red from his after images. Every single instance of his techniques use was met by a brutal kick or punch, channeling the full momentum of his instantaneous travel and directing it right at the punching bag in his arms. On. Knee to the gut B. Slammed into a wall half. Elbow to the temple of. Slammed into the ground my. Kick to the knee vil. Punch to the throat age. Kick to the stomach eye. Roundhouse to the ribs ask. Punch to the face that. Thrown through a wall you. Knee to the spine kind. Elbow to the chest Lee. The reappeared back where they started. Pain hadn't even finished folding in on himself from the brutal blow to his torso, still in mid-air. Naruto now stood beside him, Rasengan swirling to life in his palm and a hard set to his eyes. Piss off. The ball of pure chakra came down like a comet, slamming the puppet body into the ground and carried on, drilling right through without mercy. What little glass had managed to cling to the nearby window frames finally gave up and shattered leaving a light tinkling noise to go with Naruto's heavy breathing. He was suddenly very tired, the day's events finally catching up with him. It was rare he performed quite that many teleports in such a short amount of time and it was trying. Geez kid, overkill much? Jiraiya commented as he walked over, still bearing the marks and physical changes of his sage mode. Yeah, well, when I come from my own fight to find somebody had managed to cling on this long. In the middle of my damn village, I'm not going to treat them with a light touch. Jiraiya just nodded grimly, moving forward to gently close Yahiko's eyes. Probably for the best, I'm not sure there is such a thing as overkill for this one. You knew him? The older man sighed. I thought I did, a long time ago. But it's not ever yet, these were just puppets. I still have to deal with their true leader. Need some help? I still have some energy left in the tank. The Sanin gave him a sideways smile. Thanks kid, but some things a teacher needs to do himself, you know? The redhead nodded, watching Jiraiya take one of Payne's many piercings out. Yeah, I can understand that. He winced slightly when the man proceeded to stab himself with a sharp rod, immediately looking off to a specific direction outside of the city. So, being a sage makes you some kind of censor? The toad Sanin gave the Hokage a tired grin. Oh, now you're curious about Senjutsu? Naruto shrugged, but Jiraiya had already moved on, sprinting off in the direction his senses informed him, leaving the young Hokage to his own devices. Lacking anything better to do in the sudden lull, he took to a nearby rooftop to survey the damage. It wasn't as bad as he feared, although a lot of Janan teams would be pulling D ranks over the coming weeks. He smiled lightly at the sudden calm that descended as Shinobi began to flit about, getting a better read on the situation. Konoha had survived worse. There was still a great deal left to do though, and his job was far from done.
It would be almost idyllic if he could wrap everything up with a good fight, but he was a warrior second, a leader first. The thought of the paperwork that would accompany this mess was nearly enough to put a downer on his mood, but right now he had a family to go find. He wasn't worried on that front, Anko, even pregnant, could take care of herself. Yeah, Konoha would be just fine, and so would they. Itachi hunted in silence, tracking the oh-so-subtle traces left by the Zetsu clones. They were extremely hard to track, but his Sharingan hadn't deteriorated quite that far. It had been a mostly fruitless chase up until now, just the ordinary clone variety that would have died in a few days without direction. This one though, this one was dangerous. He found it limping away, having the misfortune to have latched on to one of the injured clones. It was an ugly thing, half black and half white, almost perfectly down the middle. A gruesome smile stretched across half its otherwise featureless face. Zetsu, Itachi announced greeted almost casually, catching the creature unawares, it must have been quite panicked to be so out of sorts. To its credit, the thing managed to compose itself, turning with dignity despite its limp. Itachi, how strange to meet you all the way out here. It took a step forward as if to raise its arms placatingly, only to suddenly lurched forward, the arms extending into long, thick roots that grasped at the Uchiha Saiyan. Itachi stood still and allowed himself to be enveloped, which should have been the first warning sign. It was also the only warning sign as, without fanfare, the Uchiha's clone exploded, taking much of the roots with it. Zetsu reeled back, hissing with pain and turned to flee, only to come face to face with another Itachi, this one with a tanto raised. Zetsu was prepared this time though and roots burst from the ground with sharpened points, impaling the Uchiha. The unnatural creature grinned as he saw real blood drip from Itachi's mouth, assured of his victory. Meanwhile, Itachi watched on stoically from the other side of the creature as it laughed at its illusionary victory. He pondered for a moment the best way to do this and settled on something that felt poetically appropriate. This creature had been a factor in the destruction of the Uchiha, so Itachi in turn decided on a very Uchiha-like solution. There was barely even ash left when Itachi was through incinerating Zetsu, the thing hadn't even escaped the Genjutsu before it died. Even Uchiha had mercy. Shisui stood atop the mountain, watching the sunset with both eyes for the first time in too many years. It had been simple to henge into an Anbu and drop off Donzo with T and I, they were too busy with the cleanup to scrutinize him too closely. Then it was just a matter of getting his eye fixed. Sneaking into one of the medical camps had been easy enough, although he stayed as far from Tsunade as he could. He still had his old Hitai 8, and was fairly certain nobody would remember his old mug, so didn't feel the need to risk a henge. A nice pink-haired girl had healed him up, not even asking why he was holding his own eye in hand, simply giving him the treatment before moving on to her next patient. A bit clinical, but he couldn't fault her handiwork. Experimentally he cycled through the stages of his Sharingan before reverting to his normal dark eyes. Just being able to blink normally again was heavenly. Sometimes it was the little things. With a last, longing look at his village, wreathed in the light of the rising sun, he turned and strode off. Konoha had a long road of recovery ahead of it, but he was certain Naruto could handle it. If he couldn't, well, he had him and Itachi working in the background. And now that he had both eyes back, there was a lot of work to do. Chapter 51, Epilogue He had hoped it would be a small ceremony, something personal with close friends. Apparently, that wasn't much of an option for a sitting Hokage. The village needed something uplifting after the recent attack, so he had compromised. There was a medium sort of affair out in one of the training fields, prettied up with decorations and flowers provided by the Yamanaka clan, but for the rest of the village a pseudo-festival had been called. Right now, stalls were providing games and exotic foods while people walked about in their best yukatas. They were far from that, surrounded by their friends, close acquaintances and a few important dignitaries the Hokage could hardly have refused. Well, he could have refused them, but the hassle involved with that wasn't worth a few simpering nobles to put up with. It had been a short, heartfelt affair with the Sandaime acting as their judiciary, although Naruto had almost been convinced to do it himself. It wasn't everything they had hoped, but Naruto had forgotten all that standing in front of the woman he loved. Anko hadn't minded too much either, as she kept reminding him in increasingly sultry and inappropriate tones throughout the ceremony, that the real fun came after the wedding. He stole a glance over at Anko Namikaze, he loved just repeating that in his head, as his wife, which was equally intoxicating to think, chatted with her bridal entourage. Emi and Sakura looked lovely in their pastel dresses, but Kurenai was sort of stealing the show nearby, Asuma looked distinctly uncomfortable in his formal attire. None of them held a candle to Anko. With her hair let down, 
a rarity for her in public when she had spent so long fostering the hard-ass reputation, and some artful touches of makeup to highlight her lips and eyes. Naruto had nearly choked when he first saw her at the ceremony itself. Her dress was, unorthodox, rather more risque than was traditional, but after months of waddling about with a protruding stomach she had felt the need to reassert her image in the most breathtaking manner possible. He couldn't argue with the results. Currently, she was lavishing in the attention from their various guests. A few were sincerer than others, but Anko was having a wonderful time messing the vacuous sycophants about with elaborate word games. Nobody turned insulting the oblivious into an art form quite like his wife. There was that pleasant thought again. Yes, I'll have a think about it, he muttered absently to the man in front of him. Some noble from the capital he hadn't bothered to remember the name of, there were a few lurking about trying to curry favor with the Hokage. The man didn't bother to mask his annoyance at being fobbed off, but the groom didn't care. He could have rationalized that he saw somebody important he needed to talk to, but it was his wedding and he didn't want to talk to this man, that was enough reason for him. He passed a few people generally enjoying the lively atmosphere, most of them already naturally falling into their groups. There was his team's graduating class looking very out of place in their nice clothes, save for Ino who was drinking in the attention. The other Jounin and Sensei in their group of friends, mostly enjoying the alcohol and recounting various stories about the bride and groom without any heed paid to the usual decorum of the occasion, he blamed Kakashi for that. Then there was the older crowd, the clan heads and parents, people who had been friendly with Minato and Kushina. They were treating this like any other social function, a chance to scheme and snipe at each other good-naturedly. Naruto skirted around them all, offering pleasantries as he passed but with his eyes reserved for one individual alone. Hello there, Mrs. Namikaze, he mumbled into her neck, wrapping his arms around her waist and drawing gushing looks from the heavily female crowd. Anko practically purred at the attention. Hello yourself, Mr. Namikaze. Okay, I gotta get a picture of this, Emi said, pulling out a camera before thinking better of it. Wait, something's missing. Suko chan Sukaru walked over, looking almost as uncomfortable as Asuma in her dress. Although that may have been because of the little bundle in her arms. Fuzzy red hair peeked out of the cloth-wrapped package she gratefully handed it over to the mother. Anko took her daughter with a warm smile. Are you having fun at the party Kaziana? Yes you are. Yes you are. Naruto forgave his wife the cooing, he indulged in it himself when away from prying eyes. It was hard not to, his daughter was adorable with her chocolate eyes and two little whisker marks on each cheek. Anko had been nearly insufferable when she had been proved right. Come on, scooch in together, Emi called, squaring up the frame to capture the new family together. The result was an adorable picture of the three of them in an intimate embrace. Not yet, Naruto called out as she was putting the camera down. I want a group shot. He ushered everybody in. And completely underestimated who exactly comprised everybody, resulting in the most awkward mishmash of guests imaginable. Naruto and Anko stood at the center, looking every inch the Hokage and his wife, with their newborn daughter between them. Sukaru smiled at Naruto's side, the expression looking a bit too put on to be truly genuine, but she was getting better. Next to her stood Sasuke, looking quite happy for once, with an easy smile. Sakura and Emi made up their other side, Sakura graciously allowing Emi to stand next to her mentor. Naturally Haya nestled herself right between her adoptive siblings, but not before making sure to give Kaziana a jealous look. It was only when Jiraiya, previously schmoozing as many female guests as he could manage, realized a picture was being taken did things get hectic. He naturally dragged Tsunade and Shizun with him, which caught Kakashi's attention, who inevitably drew a long guy and Lee, who in turn pulled in the rest of their graduating class and an embarrassed-looking Kurenai. Komachi felt left out and barged into the front, bringing along Yugao and Tenzo. Hiruzen stood in front of his students, wearing a proud smile, and a few of the clan heads Naruto had grown familiar with over the past few months piled in for good measure, acting decades younger as they jostled to stand near their kids. Even Ansui had shown up, from his, in his own opinion, well-deserved retirement, for the benefit of his one remaining student. By the end of it all Naruto and Anko looked distinctly squished together, but both were beaming brilliantly. Why the hell am I taking the picture? Asuma grumbled from in front of them all because we want to see people in the photo, not just a cloud of smoke, Anko called back, earning grins and laughter from the entire group. That was how they were captured, happy, together, enjoying the time they had despite the recent attacks. A village, and a family, that endured.